So hey guys. This is your favorite fanfic universe. So in this video. We will see. What if Naruto was become the Omniverse Ninja. Here is short summary. Naruto learns of a conspiracy against him after the retrieval mission. As he runs away he is picked up by a mysterious scientist, who opens up Naruto's eyes to so much more than just his world. But before we start, be sure to subscribe and like this video because we the give the quality content videos. Now let's start. Naruto groaned in pain as he woke up. He felt a familiar pain in his shoulder as he slowly managed to open his eyes. He looked around for a few minutes before he began to recognize the familiar sterilized white walls and ceiling of the hospital. Naruto groaned in annoyance as he fell backwards onto the bed, wincing slightly as he remembered the familiar technique that had injured him. Naruto laid down and just stared up at the ceiling. The only noise he heard was the sound of his own breathing and the heart monitor that had been hooked up to him. With nothing else to do the blonde began to think back on his life. He frowned as he remembered his early life. Naruto's unwillingly being made to be the jail of the nine-tailed fox, or the Kayubi as they called it. His early years being ignored by the matron of the orphanage and his fellow orphans on her words. He remembered being kicked out when he turned eight, and being given an old apartment in the red light district. He remembered how he learned all the nooks and crannies, all the good places to hide in case certain villagers got crazy. A small smile came to the blonde's face as he remembered the drunks, prostitutes, and other members of the red light district who didn't see him as a monster, but someone who had just been given a seriously bad hand, like many of them had. He remembered how they would help hide him, when people were hunting him. He remembered his later years in the ninja academy, how he was purposely left out of certain lessons, or given bad advice from teachers and how everyone would laugh and mock him for his lack of skill, or even just for being lesser than them. How he adopted the mask of an idiot to hide his pain, to keep some people off his back. He remembered his first ninja team, Team 7, consisting of him, the Rookie of the Year, Sasuke Uchiha, the Kunoichi of the Year, Sakura Haruno, and Kakashi Hitaki. Another frown came to his face as he remembered how Sasuke and Sakura would mock him, and how Kakashi would turn a blind eye. He remembered how the D-ranked customers would make it harder for him, while singing Haruno and Uchiha's praises. He scowled angrily as he remembered how Kakashi would always go against his own words and train Sasuke privately, leaving him and Sakura alone. He remembered his first real mission, where he gained his first real friend in Haku, who had a similar past to his own, hated for something that wasn't in his control. How he died to save a man who gave him a purpose to live. He remembered the Chunin exams where he would blow away everyone's expectations of him failing in the first round. How he met with the old perverted sage, Jiraiya. The whiskered blonde let out a small laugh as he remembered how he knocked out Ebisu, the closet pervert, with one move, and how easy it was get him to agree to train him. He smirked as he remembered the sense of pride he felt when he learned the Rasengan and earned the right to summon the toads. The sense of pride grew as he remembered how he defeated Gara, the holder of the one-tailed beast, and Neji, the former rookie of the year, and prodigy of the Hyuga clan. His smile was replaced with a scowl as he remembered how Sasuke, the village golden boy, had run away from the village, the mission almost resulting in the death of Neji, Choji, Kiba, and Akamaru. How Kakashi and Sakura looked at him with disappointment when they learned the mission failed, as if the whole thing was all his fault. He remembered the feeling of joy he felt, when Jiraiya took Naruto out of the village to train him. He remembered the anger he felt when Jiraiya told him of his parentage, that his father was the fourth Hokage and that he was his godfather. He also remembered the shock and outrage on Jiraiya's face when he told the Toad Sage of his life. Apparently, the Sandame wasn't as good as he thought he was. He told Jiraiya lies of how Naruto was adopted and under the care of a loving family. He remembered the blood, sweat, and tears that went into the following three years that followed. How he learned Taijutsu, Ninjutsu, the various variant version of the Rasengan, picking up on his stealth skills, and learning to become a better ninja. He remembered running into retired ninja who he met and gained the trust of, learning things from them that he couldn't learn from Jiraiya, specifically elemental affinities and a sensor ability. He also remembered the day a slug, sent by Tsunade, dropped off a scroll detailing a specific chakra exercise that allowed him access to copy her super strength. He remembered how he returned to Konoha and how so many people seemed to have changed. He also remembered the disgust he felt for some of the people there. Then he remembered how he managed to get in this position. Team 7, reunited after Naruto's training trip, 
were sent out on a mission of their own to one of Orochimaru's bases to find Sasuke, after leaving the village in pursuit of the power he believed was necessary for killing his elder brother and avenging his clan. After arriving at the base Naruto, Sakura, their new teammate Sai, and Kakashi were separated. Naruto found himself facing off against Sasuke alone. Sasuke, full of himself, mocked Naruto, saying that he could have been a training instead of wasting his time attempting to bring him back to Konoha. Naruto's response was to get into a stance. The two were matched were evenly matched, Naruto's personalized frog Keita, going toe to toe with Sasuke's family interceptor style. As for Jutsu, Naruto managed to match any fire and lightning Jutsu Sasuke used with a mix of wind and water style respectively. It all came to head, when Sasuke activated his curse seal and went into the second state. The boy then proceeded to mock and gloat, going on and on about how with this, he was far superior to anyone from Konoha and that he would finally fulfill his ambition. It was during that time, that Naruto began to tap into the Kyuubi's chakra to even the playing field. The brawl continued for a little bit and then ended again in a similar way to their clash at the Valley of the End. Sasuke, in the middle of their initial attack, took out a lightning chakra infused sword and stabbed the blonde in the shoulder. This time, however, Naruto's Kyuubi enhanced Rasengan plowed through Sasuke's and slammed him in the chest. The technique cracked some ribs and sent the Uchiha flying into the opposite wall and straight into the realm of unconsciousness. Naruto smiled to himself as he remembered the look of shock on Sasuke's face when he was taken down. Finally, he had beaten Sasuke and proven himself no longer the dead last of his generation. Naruto was drawn from his memories, and feeling of victory, by a familiar rumble getting his attention. He glanced down at his stomach and mentally cursed his large appetite and where he was. Naruto had always hated hospital food. With little thought, Naruto formed a shadow clone and then sent him out to Ichiruka's to get some ramen. Naruto quickly laid back down and began to relax. Little did the boy know, his entire life was about to change. A few moments later Ichiruka ramen stand, Naruto's clone grinned as he paid for his ramen and immediately began make his way back to the hospital. As he moved all around him, he heard various whispers around him. It's him. What's he doing out of the hospital? Did he heal that quickly? Should have just put him out of our misery is what we should have done. I heard that he nearly killed the Uchiha heir. We should take him down now, before he tries to kill someone else. The clone ignored the whispers of the bigots. Wanting to get the ramen to the boss faster, he jumped up and started to run across the rooftops for the hospital. After a few minutes, the clone had the hospital in sight when he noticed something off. Looking down he saw a familiar trio of people. He immediately recognized the three as Danzo, Homura, and Kaharu, the three advisors to the Hokage, in this case Tsunade. Naruto's clone immediately felt alarm bells go off in his head. He barely saw the three together unless they meant business. Given the fact that they were currently speaking to each other outside of the cage tower, meant that something big was going down. Naruto didn't know what was going on, but he immediately ran down to keep an eye on them, leaving the wrapped ramen hidden, in case they managed to catch a whiff of it. The three advisors walked down the street and arrived at a small house. Upon seeing them enter, Naruto's clone quickly went to a window a floor above them, and then quickly entered, before anyone could notice him. Pulling pranks on Jonin and Anbu really had its advantages. The clone then entered the home and quickly began to navigate the home. He stepped lightly to avoid stepping on any loose boards and making any unnecessary noise. Naruto soon found a flight of stairs going downstairs. He quickly stopped near the base of the stairs. He saw the trio of advisors sitting at the table with a familiar man. The man had familiar pink hair done up in a star style with a mustache and, despite his darker skin tone, he could easily tell that this man was related to his teammate, Sakura Haruno. Kazashi, if what he heard was right. So, is everything ready? Kazashi asked the trio. Yes, Kaharu answered, nodding her head, the report is already on its way to the daimyo. What about everything on your end? Kazashi smirked and said, Being on the council has its advantages. The mission reports have been corrected and the medical reports have all been placed. All we have to do now is sit back and wait for everything to hit the fan. Homura nodded and said, You have done well, Kazashi. Kazashi nodded and said, Thank you, now is for what I was promised. Kaharu sighed and said, The engagement between your daughter and Sasuke will go through. Your family will have full access to the Uchiha bank accounts, and the political power that will come with it. 
Kazashi smiled and said, Good. My daughter will get her dream boy, I'll be rich, and the demon brat will be sent away. I must ask though, what happens to the boy afterwards? He is supposed to be the village's weapon after all. Danzo nodded and said, My men will intercept him as he is taken away. After that, all it will take is a little nudge in the right direction and the boy will be our tool like he should have been years ago. Damn, Serutobi and his bleeding heart. Naruto's clone gritted his teeth as he heard this. The blonde then slipped back out of the house, undetected and quickly grabbed the ramen and proceeded to rush towards the hospital. The boss was going to be pissed. Danzo glanced towards the corner and could have sworn that he saw a glance of orange, but immediately dismissed the idea. Maybe he should pay a visit to the eye doctor later. The future Hokage couldn't have his eyes failing. At the hospital a few minutes later, Naruto turned towards the window as his clone returned from his ramen run. Thanks man, he said with a smile, you're a lifesaver. Naruto downed the ramen rather lowly, as opposed to his normal eating pace, that being wolf as much down as you can in a few minutes. As he slurped down the last of the broth in his bowl, Naruto let out a sigh of satisfaction, having been able to enjoy his favorite food. Naruto set his bowl to the side and leaned back in bed, ready to take another nap, but stopped when he saw that his clone hadn't dispersed yet. The blonde's gut immediately told him that something bad was going on. Did something happen? He asked. The clone simply sighed before exploding into a puff of white smoke. Immediately, Naruto's mind was assaulted by the clone's memories. This included being on the receiving end of a lot of glares from civilians, being greeted by old man Tuichi and his daughter, paying for his ramen, seeing Danzo and the old fossils, and the ensuring meeting between them and Kazashi. As the memories faded, Naruto let out a growl. He always knew that the council and their like had it out for him. He should have known that they would pull something like this would happen after he got the village prince back. He knew that if it was Tsunade in charge, she would see the prick punished for abandonment. These guys however, apparently were invested in the Uchiha's Sharingan and repopulating it. After a few moments, the blonde began to calm down and think. The mention of changed medical reports and mission reports had the blonde worried. If the council had changed those, most likely they would portray him as a nuisance and hindrance while praising his team. Another thing that got his attention was the mention of the daimyo. The Hokage title was the most prestigious title in the village, but the daimyo was someone even granny would have to listen to. If he knew the villagers, they would jump at the chance to have him thrown out of the village and out of their hair. Naruto let out a sigh as he got up from the bed. It looked like he was going to have to head out of Konoha after all. He would have to make sure to get a message to the old pervert when he got to a safe place. Naruto quickly made his way to a small stack of clothes, threw them on, leaving behind his headband, and swiftly made his way out of the hospital. Naruto, as quickly and stealthily as possible, made his way to his apartment. The blonde ninja, soon to be former, quickly went through his items. He grabbed the basics, being a change of clothes, a sleeping bag, a medical kit, and some special food pills. He also made sure to empty out the jar of money he had saved up from various missions he had saved up. He called it the, get the hell out of dodge fund, jokingly of course, but now it seemed a lot more appropriate. As far as equipment, he grabbed his old green goggles, some spare kanai and shuriken, and a roll of ninja wire. He also managed to grab a few explosive notes, flash bombs, smoke bombs, and a small pack of caltrops. Naruto quickly sealed all his tools and equipment in various small scrolls that he could hide under his jacket. Naruto was about to leave when he noticed something. He remembered it as a box of some of his old pranking supplies. There were stink bombs, paint bombs, fake vomit, real vomit, don't ask, fake dog poo, and other basic jokes and gags. Naruto grinned as a familiar glint filled his eyes. If any of his old pranking victims had seen him, they would have become extremely nervous. He quickly grabbed some of the stink bombs and paint bombs, leaving behind some of the grosser pranks, as he knew they wouldn't help him. Adjusting his goggles on his head, he shot off and made his way to the village wall. Quickly and stealthily, the blonde made his way towards the main wall, with nobody noticing. Some looked up at the occasional sound of a roof tile moving slightly, but dismissed it as just a bird moving on the ceilings. After a few minutes, the boy reached the village wall. With no one around, the blonde was quickly able to get over the wall without anyone noticing. Meanwhile beyond the planet's atmosphere, from above the ninja world, the planet would look very similar to another human populated world. The planet held blue oceans, with various areas of brown, green, and white all visible from the atmosphere. 
As opposed to the different landmass consisted of seven continents, the land on this planet had only one giant landmass, like the prehistoric supercontinent of Pangaea. Slowly, the view pans to show a large dome sitting in the dark side of the moon. The dome appeared to be about the size of a baseball stadium and covered in tinted glass. The glass-like substance was a special polymer that was made to reflect the radiation from the sun, to keep the people inside from frying. The dome seemed to have a large metal ring on the bottom of it, with large rings digging into the rock, keeping it anchored. Inside the dome, a figure is seen sitting at a chair. We see a large hand, with three fingers and a thumb, typing away at floating dark blue keyboard, with a dark blue holographic screen floating above it. On the screen in front of him you could see numbers, letters, and symbols of all kinds, going by at such a fast pace, you'd be amazed the person typing could keep up. Above the screen he was looking at were various people all over the world below. Images of deserts, mountain, shores, seas, and various people. Suddenly, a dark blue circle with a white exclamation mark appeared on the screen getting his attention. The figure hummed in interest, before pressing his finger into the circle. The image of Naruto going over the village wall. The figure hummed again, moving his hand to rub his chin. After a moment of deliberation, he spoke. Caretaker, he spoke, what is the current situation of subject Naruto Uzumaki? There was beeping noise, when a computerized female voice spoke. Subject Naruto Uzumaki, is currently a half a mile from the village of Konoha. Scan reveals a set amount of survival supplies, as well as tools and gear. A lack of a member of Jonin level ninja or his team, as well as he no longer wears his headband there is a 97.661% chance that he is abandoning the village. Current destination unknown. The figure nodded. It was highly likely that the boy had gotten tired of the treatment those lower lifeforms. Why is it that whenever a person of that low intelligence they react with anger and fear? It was understandable at time, but at moments like this it just caused some unnecessary problems. The figure then responded, What about the village itself? Are they aware of his leaving? The computerized voice responded, Scanning. The screen cycled through various images, all of them various areas of Konoha. The hot springs, the academy, and various other areas before it came across the hospital main area. There was the image of Danzo and the two elders speaking with the various members of the remaining Rooking 12. What is he saying? A nurse apparently found subject Naruto Uzumaki's hospital room and told her superiors who then told Danzo, who had just arrived. He apparently, expected Naruto to attempt to leave at some point. The figure cursed under his breath and said, What about his comrades? The computer let out a beeping noise and the screen showed various information, including the names of the ninja, heartbeats, brainwaves, blood pressure, and other various objects that would indicate a physical reaction. Apparently, Danzo has given an abridged version of what happened on subject Naruto Uzumaki's retrieval of Sasuke Uchiha as well as his status as the nine-tailed foxes holder. According to scans of the various members of the group, rookies, Kiba Inazuka, Sakura Haruno, Ino Yamanaka, and Neji Hayuga are all experiencing a fusion of anger and disbelief. There is a 85.256% chance this is due to Kiba and Neji's injured pride three years ago, and Sakura Haruno's and Ino Yamanaka's hormonal attraction to Sasuke Uchiha. Choji Akamichi, Rock Lee, Tenten, and Hanada Hayuga, all experience disbelief. This is 87.528% likely due to Hanada's old affliction, Choji being out of the loop, Rock Lee's potential rivalry, and Tenten original indifference towards subject Naruto Uzumaki. Shikamaru Nara, Shino Abarame, and Sai Shimura, all seem calm. This react as, 87.265% likely, from the fact that they either knew of Naruto's affliction, or believe that something is not being told. The figure sighed. He could understand all their reactions. He idly wondered what the academy was thinking when they implemented that dead last and rookie of the year crap. All it did was assign a label that everyone would hold over the dead last's head like it would mean anything. He had a prime example in that Jiraiya fellow. He was originally the dead last of his generation and now he was one of strongest warriors the village had, as well as a spy master. A sudden blaring of an alarm got the man's attention. He turned back to the screen and was shocked to see that the remaining members of the rookies were now heading out. Warning. Threat to subject Naruto Uzumaki imminent. Konoha group, rookies, members have been dispatched by Danzo to retrieve subject Naruto Uzumaki. According to examinations of mental states, emotional states, 
there is a 75.236% chance that some may attempt to physically harm subject. The figure grumbled to himself, rubbing his chin in thought. What will happen if the subject is captured? The computer beeped, running through various numbers and computing various outcomes. After a few more moments it stopped and gave its answer. Probability of imprisonment. High. Probability of execution. Medium. Probability of weaponization. High. The man slammed his fist down on the armchair with a grunt of frustration. If this happened, all the planning and work he had put into his project would go to waste. The boy was a one of a kind, and probably the only person on the planet who seemed perfect for his experiment. He had hoped that he could wait a little bit longer before revealing himself to the boy, but now was a good a time as ever. Caretaker, he ordered, send down one of the drones. Only one. Put it in stealth mode, and it shall only intervene when it became necessary. Give it a non-lethal payload, but allow it to access the lethal payload if it comes to it. Acknowledged. Orders set and recognized. Sending drone now. Outside of the dome, a single figure can be seen moving through space. The figure approaches the planet below, turning red as it entered the atmosphere before it faded. The figure then sat back in the chair as the image changed to show Naruto running through the woods as fast as he could. Now, let the show begin. Back down on the planet. Naruto was continuing his run. After a minute of debate, all while running, he had decided the best place he could hide is in Snow Country, or Spring as it had been renamed. First, however, he had to make it to Wave Country. If his luck held true, Old Man Tizuna would help him reach the country. With a destination and a plan, albeit a very weak one, in mind, the now rogue shinobi ran as fast as he could, all the while making sure to keep his sensor abilities active. The blonde suddenly sensed a large amount of various chakra signatures heading in his direction. Naruto swiftly jumped into a nearby tree, hiding amongst the red-leaved leaf, and suppressing his chakra as much as possible. Within three minutes the remaining members of the rookies had arrived. Naruto quickly realized that simply hiding wouldn't cut it, especially with Kiba, Akamaru, Neji, Hinata, and Shino amongst the group, being expert trackers with the sense of smell, Byakugan, and Insect Hive respectively. Naruto calmly and slowly moved back out of the tree and began to move away, putting as much distance between the group and himself as possible. Damn, he thought. This could be a problem. It had been three years since Naruto had seen most of the members of the rookies. Almost of his information on them was outdated. The only members he knew about personally were Sakura and Sai. For the other members he had no idea about their current skill levels. He could make assumptions, but that could wind up making more problems than it would solve. This way, Naruto recognized the shout as Kiba's. Naruto continued to run through the trees until a barrage of kanai and shuriken slammed into a tree branch in front of him. Naruto stopped, and Swift turned in the direction that the tools were thrown. The spiky-haired blonde saw Tenten standing on a branch twirling a kanai on her finger, clearly the source of the attack. Beside her were Lee and Neji. Apparently, they had managed to find him first, most likely to Neji's Byakugan. There was a moment of silence between the three Chunin and one Jenny. Finally, the silence was broken by Lee. Naruto, my friend, please you must return with us to the village. Naruto simply scoffed and said, Pray tell. Why should I? Just so I can be arrested on trumped up charges. No thank you. Lee responded, Naruto please. There must be some kind of mistake. If you come back with us, you can set the record straight. Naruto shook his head and said, I'm sorry Lee, but that isn't happening. I've had it with that village, and I do not plan on going back. Tenten tightened her grip on her kanai and Neji activated his Byakugan. Lee sighed and said, then please, forgive me for what I am about to do. Lee launched forward with his fist cocked back, quickly joined by his teammates. Lee was surprised when Naruto blocked the punch and countered with a punch to the solar plexus, knocking the air from the near chakra less boy's lungs. Tenten and Neji both charged and stabbed their weapons and hands forward at the same time. Naruto dodged, pushing Lee out of the way and into a tree in the process, before pulling out a pair of kanai and blocking Tenten's assault. Neji attacked from the boy's side, only for the blonde to perform a quick substitution with Tenten. Neji was shocked when he found his attack striking his teammate instead of his opponent. Neji's danger sense went off as dodged a pair of kanai aimed at his shoulders. With Lee and Tenten temporarily disabled Neji stood alone in his regular stance. 
He was shocked at the amount of skill Naruto had shown in just a few minutes. However, it would not deter him from completing his mission. Give up now, Naruto. It is your fate to be defeated by us today. Naruto raised an eyebrow at Neji's words and asked, I thought you were out of that phase. Fate doesn't control everything you know. Neji answered, It does not matter to those who cannot rely on their own power. Naruto narrowed his eyes before getting into a basic stance of his own, one that Neji didn't seem to recognize. Neji launched forward and attacked with a few basic Jiyuken strikes, but it was blocked by the blonde. Dynamic entry. Naruto let out a cry of pain as he felt Lee's foot slam into his back. The boy was sent rolling as he was swiftly followed by the recovered Tenten. The bun-haired girl unsealed a staff which connected with the still recovering blonde's body and knocked him into a tree. Damn it, there are too many trees. I need some room to move. Leaf whirlwind. Naruto was drawn from his thoughts just in time to see a barrage of low and high kicks sent his way. Replace himself with a log a good distance away. With that, a sudden rush of memories of one of his clones getting taken out by Kiba filled his mind. The blonde then swiftly got up and ran with Team 9 in hot pursuit. After a few moments Naruto came into a clearing of trees. Naruto stopped near the center of the clearing and waited. Leaf Great Whirlwind, Gentle Fist, Tenkutsu Needle. The blonde swiftly dodged and parried a wave of low, mid, and high kicks from Lee in a single strike from Neji. As they were continuing to brawl, Tenten sat up in a tree a little bit away, hidden in the shadow of the leaves and branches, a bow and arrow in her hands. She took aim and waited for the right moment to strike. Seeing her opportunity, she fired. Naruto let out a cry of pain as the arrow entered his shoulder. He winced at the pain, but kept his head in the fight. The whiskered rogue ninja sent out a wave of wind chakra from his body, knocking the duo of fighting ninja off balance. Then, grabbing both of their heads, he slammed them together before throwing them off in different directions. Tenten launched out of a tree and shot forward, a sword unsealed and ready for use. Naruto responded quickly and focused some more of his wind chakra into his hand. With a swing of his arm the wind chakra wrapped hand struck the blade and sliced it clean into several pieces. Tenten's eyes widened before she got punched in the stomach. Tenten responded with a kick, that Naruto blocked and countered with a kick of his own. The two grappled for a moment before the blonde brought his knee up into the girl's stomach with enough force to knock the girl into the air. In midair, Naruto grabbed her leg and threw her a good distance away. Neji and Lee, now recovered from getting knocked around, got up and were ready to attack. Naruto, realizing he had to end this quickly, pulled the arrow out of his shoulder with a grunt. Pulling another object of interest out of his pocket, Naruto pulled his goggles down over his eyes. Look at the birdie. Naruto threw the object up into the air. The flash bomb went off temporarily blinding the three, Neji especially with his Byakugan activated. Naruto quickly formed two clones and all three of them attacked the team. A barrage of punches to the chest and face knocked Neji on his butt, breaking his nose, cracking a couple of ribs, and blackening both of his eyes. Lee's attacker knocked him in the jaw, the temple and then proceeded to dislocate his shoulder, then punch in in the knees overextending the joints, making him cry out in pain. Finally, Tenten received a mix of chakra-enhanced punches and kicks to the face and stomach. All three Chunin hit the ground out good and in a good amount of pain. To end it, all three clones got up and stomped down on the three ninjas. The strikes were powerful enough to knock the three of them out. Naruto panted that had been a bit of a pain. Naruto quickly pulled out his medical kit and applied a bandage to his shoulder. He also took a solider pill just in case some of the others found him. Naruto was about to make a run for it, when he was suddenly aware of something rushing towards him. He dodged just in time for a familiar pair of spinning drills of fur to rush past him. Naruto turned and glared at Kiba and Akamaru as they came to a halt. Naruto suddenly turned towards the direction they came from to see the rest of the retrieval team standing there. Naruto, Shikamaru called out, you know you can't win against us. Just come back with us already, troublesome blonde. Before the boy could respond, Sakura decided to butt in. Just give up now. Baka, she said, angrily, you couldn't take me back when we were in the academy and you can't take all of us on now. Just give up and come back so you can get your punishment. Naruto glared at his former crush, having grown out of it a year into his training trip and asked, why should I, Sakura? 
Why should I go back to be punished for completing the mission and bringing back that duck-haired traitor? I'm not going back to be brought up on trumped-up charges, while Sasuke gets a slap on the wrist. Sakura was about to say something, but Naruto cut her off. If you say something about trying to kill Sasuke, then push those thoughts out of your dumb mountain-sized head bimbo. You weren't there so anything you have to say about what I did to Sasuke means absolutely nothing. I'm not going back to just be blamed for something that should have been done long ago, so the council can have its Sharingan and Sasuke can have his perfect record. If you want to take me back to Konoha you're going to have to drag me back half dead." Sakura growled angrily and shot forward, her temper overriding her better judgment. She drew back her arm and was ready to slam her fist into the blonde's face. She had done this so many times, and was assured of her own superiority over the boy that she was shocked beyond all words when Naruto held up a hand and caught her fist. Naruto stared at his former teammate and former crush as he tightened his grip on her fist. Sakura, not entirely used to being in pain, fell to one knee as she felt the bones in her hand grind together. And to think, I used to find that forehead of yours charming. Sakura's eyes widened as he looked at the blonde before she was punched so hard she went flying. She rolled across the ground and stopped right in front of the rest of the team. Sakura groaned in pain, a nasty bruise forming on her face. She stood up on shaky legs before leveling a fierce glare at the boy who dared to hit her. That's it. I'm dragging you back to Konoha in pieces. Sakura raged, nursing her injured hand. They were about to engage each other when a familiar voice, to Naruto, spoke up and sent an all too familiar shiver down his spine. I'm sorry, but we cannot allow that. Naruto's eyes widened as he slowly turned towards the source of the voice. No, no way. My luck cannot be that bad, he thought, and prayed that it wasn't who he thought it was. Unfortunately, it was. Walking out of the tree line was one Itachi Uchiha and Kisame Hoshigaki. The recently turned rogue ninja cursed himself as he had completely forgotten about the Akatsuki, and the chance that he may run into one. Naruto gulped as he realized that he was currently in a no win situation. Even if he dealt with the Konoha team, he would have to deal with these two. He wasn't the only one nervous. The retrieval team, despite youthful arrogance, didn't believe that they could take on these two. They all knew what Itachi was capable of and that was years ago. In all that time, there was no doubt in their minds he had gotten more powerful. Naruto Uzumaki, Itachi said, I suggest that you come with us. Naruto glared at the man and looked between the two teams out to capture him. One so he could be dragged back and punished unlawfully, and another so he could be used to some greater game that he didn't know about. Kisame saw Naruto's hesitance and quickly got impatient. Forget reasoning Itachi, the shark man said, I'm just going to cut off the brat's legs and we can drag him back. Lifting his bandage-wrapped weapon, Kisame launched forward, appearing in front of Naruto in a few seconds before the blonde could perform a substitution. Kisame smirked maliciously as he swung his weapon. Naruto closed his eyes and braced for the pain. Clang. The sound of the bandage wrapped sword striking metal was not the sound everyone expected. Naruto slowly opened his eyes and gasped at what he saw. There was someone holding off Kisame's weapon with his bare hands. The figure stood as tall as Kisame himself. He was apparently wrapped up in advanced chakra armor. The armor area of his chest and abdomen resembled dark gray muscle. The upper arm, upper legs, and sides were black and had a metal sheen to them. On each shoulder was a small thick shield, most likely a pauldron. His forearms and lower legs had dark gray armored gauntlets and greaves boots on them with dark blue lines tracing their sides, glowing with power. His head was covered in a helmet designed after a samurai helmet, with a completely black blank face and everything else dark gray. The armored man shifted his weight and sent Kisami's sword upwards and then punched Kisame in the jaw sending the S-rank murderer flying like a ragdoll. Kisame hit the ground a grunt right next to his teammate. Damn that hurt, he said as he got up and angrily pointed his weapon at the interloper shouting, Who the hell are you? My name is of no importance to you, Kisame Hoshigaki. His voice was deep and sounded mechanical, he turned his towards Naruto and then at the group. From his point of view, the world looked dark blue as he scanned all the conscious members of the group. Based on bioenergy levels, brainwaves indicating states of mind, and other physical elements, they were deemed a mid to low level threat individually and mid to high altogether. However, a similar scan of Kisame and Itachi showed him that they were a potentially high threat level individually and together. 
He turned his head towards Naruto before pointing at the retrieval team and asked, Do you believe that your current skill set will be sufficient in disabling them? Naruto looked at this new member in surprise and slowly nodded. Good. You shall deal with them. I shall face off against these two. Naruto nodded and stood up and faced against his former comrades. With that the new guy and Naruto both charged ready for the fight to begin. Tsunade nursed a growing headache. This meeting between the councils had been going on for some time now. She was only here because she it was part of her job as the Hokage. Ever since Naruto had returned the rogue ninja Sasuke Uchiha, things had been hectic. The ninja clans were all practically calling for the Uchiha to face punishment. They believed that the Uchiha was still a flight risk. He had managed to get away from the village before, and he would be able to do it again. They were all calling for Sasuke to have his mind picked for any information he had on the sound village, Orochimaru, and any of his experiments that he had done so far. Then have his chakra sealed off and be imprisoned for life, or just have him executed. The civilians were calling for Naruto to be punished for his brutal treatment, in their opinion attempted murder, of one of the founding clans of Konoha. There were saying some bull about the Uchiha being kidnapped by the sound ninja and not going willingly. Basically, they were calling for Naruto to be punished for his assault on their golden boy. Tsunade was growing frustrated with the constant bickering between the two groups. Enough. Tsunade yelled in anger, having had enough of this argument, this a council meeting, not an argument between kids. Sasuke Uchiha was convicted of leaving the village on his own. As such he will be punished. Immediately. Mebuki Haruno, standing in for her husband, stood up and said, Lady Hokage, while I agree that the Uchiha should face punishment for abandonment of the village. However, we can't do so without getting any information out of him. After being in the sound village for about three years, he no doubt has some information we can use. As for the assault charge, we do not know what entirely happened. I suggest that we wait until he awakens in the hospital before passing judgment. Mebuki, amongst the civilian council, was a black sheep. While she had hated Naruto years ago, she realized it was pointless to hold the sins of a monster against the boy. Unfortunately, her husband was not of the same mind and they were only together now for their daughter's sake. As such, she was acting a mediator between the two divided factions. She was calling for Sasuke to be punished, just not in a permanent way, and not calling for Naruto to be executed, as he had done what the mission specified, bring Sasuke Uchiha back alive. Sume responded. I'm with Mebuiki on that assessment. I can agree that the Sherigan is an asset and that he has information we can use, but we can't just let the kid's abandonment of the village go unpunished. At most you're all thinking of just giving the kid a slap on the wrist. If he knows he can get away with leaving the village, you know he'll think it's okay to run away again. Besides, the mission was to bring the kid back alive and they did. I don't see why you're trying to bust the kid's chops anyway. His teammates and sensei were on that mission, too if he is going to be punished so should they. Another civilian, a rather fat merchant, said, the Uchiha is royalty in this village. As such, he is exempt from punishment. Besides, only the Uzumaki fought him, according to the reports. As such, he is to blame for the Uchiha's injuries. Hiyashi then said, really, then as a member of one of the founding clans of Konoha, Tsunade is exempt from punishment as well. She is technically royalty as well. Before another argument could begin, an Anbu wearing a bird mask appeared in the council room. Lady Hokage, the Anbu said, we have just received word from the hospital. Naruto Uzumaki has left the village. Tsunade's eyes widened and yelled, what? The fat merchant from earlier said, ha, huh, I knew that boy would run sooner or later. Suande didn't even both to glare at the fat man who had spoken. She simply rose up and launched out of the room towards the hospital. The council members wanted to make sure this was happening. Meanwhile at the hospital, Danzo sat down in a chair, thinking to himself. The plan had been simple. Take Naruto, and turn him into the village's personal attack dog. However, Hiruzen's bleeding heart didn't allow him to do so. To get their weapon, he, Kaharu, and Homura, with the help of the civilians of the village, who were blinded by a need for revenge against the beast that caused so much destruction, came up with a plan to get Naruto under the old Warhawk's thumb. Basically, make Naruto look bad so he could be either relocated, or frame him for some crime. He would then be placed under Donzo's care and he would be locked away. The plan had hit a roadblock with Kakashi. Like many of the villagers the silver-haired Jonin was against Naruto, 
but he wasn't willing to risk his ninja career by altering mission reports. However, he had reported incidents where he recorded Sasuke as being the main source of mission success, but noted Naruto having a small part, mostly from being too lazy. There were also the missions where no Jonin was present, are just the simple ones. This was fixed when members in records were convinced either through blackmail or bribery, if they weren't on their side, and had the reports altered, including a fake seal of approval. All they needed was the daimyo's approval for Naruto to be arrested for his assault, alleged assault in this case, and he would be arrested. En route to prison the boy would be intercepted by unknown assailants, really his root Anbu, and grab the boy. Then he would brainwash the boy with one of his many implanted Sharingan eyes, and if that doesn't work, break his will mentally and turn him into the village's weapon, and his personal attack dog. Unfortunately, a monkey wrench was thrown into his plans when the boy apparently discovered their plans. Now that he realized that the flash of orange from earlier was Naruto, he cursed himself for letting his guard down. It also made him want to update his file. When he learned Naruto had left, this from a nurse sent to check on him, he realized this could work in his favor. He could Naruto's attempt to leave the village against him, and use it to bring him down. Immediately, he told the group of Konoha rookies of Naruto's burden and that it was imperative they get Naruto back, so he could face the charges, trumped up of course, and face trial. He could tell immediately from their reactions, that Kiba and Neji were apparently upset, most likely from their injured pride as they had lost to the boy years ago. Knowing Kiba's brash nature he was taking the words at face value. From Sakura and Ino he immediately could tell that their fangirl nature had made the boy, public enemy number one, to them. Choji, Hanada, Tenten, and Lee all looked shocked as if they had come to a form of understanding, something that made the old man want to keep an eye on them. What really worried him was the contemplative looks on Shino's and Shikamaru's faces, like they were thinking they weren't being told something. He then had to use his Sharingan eye to influence them to follow his orders to bring Naruto back, even though you can't leave without Suad's permission, saying that they couldn't let Naruto get away. They agreed that Naruto should be brought back. That had been almost 15 minutes ago, and most likely they had caught up to Naruto by now, by his calculations. If his information was accurate, all of them should have no problem taking him down and bringing his weapon back. Danzo. The old war hawk scowled as he turned towards the sound. It was Suande surrounded by the shinobi and civilian council. She stomped up to him and said, What is going on here? I just learned that Naruto has apparently left the village of his own free will in only 15 minutes after the fact. Why wasn't I told immediately? Danzo, not threatened by the slug Sanin's anger, said, I was on the site, to check on our resident Jinchuriki and I found that he was gone after being checked on by the nurse. As it was necessary I already dispatched a group of Chunin to bring him back. The woman snarled at the man. You sent out a group of ninjas without my permission. She yelled angrily, you don't have that power Danzo. The elder said, as an advisor to the Hokage I, the woman didn't feel like listening to the man strut like a peacock and yelled, your job is to advise your cage on certain matters. You don't have the authority to give out orders to my ninja. Tsunade calmed herself down for a minute before she continued. You and I are going to be having a very serious conversation. Both you and those other fossils. In the meantime, Anbu. I need you to get some papers from my office. A rank mission clearance for a group to leave the village and retrieve Naruto Uzumaki and bring him back for questioning. One of the civilian council members said, The boy has clearly abandoned the village. We must kill him before he exposes any of our secrets. Tsunade was about to say something, but Mebuki was a bit faster. What secrets would a genin who hasn't been in the village for three years know? If this was your precious Sasuke you would be calling for him to be brought back alive. Shut your mouth about things you do not understand and let the Hokage do her job. Tsunade nodded thankfully and then turned to one of the Anbu in the room and said, Well, what are you waiting for? The Anbu vanished to do his ordered task. Tsunade began to wonder what had happened to make Naruto leave the village. She mentally prayed that Naruto would be brought back so they could have this whole incident cleared up. Meanwhile, Danzo was seething that his plans were going so far off track. However, he still had the daimyo on his side. Knowing the man was more interested in listening to the jingle of coins in his pocket than doing what was best for his main military power. Otherwise, he wouldn't have gotten away with everything that he did. All the old Warhawk had to do now was wait. Meanwhile with Naruto at the battlefield. The battlefield was shaken up by the group fighting one another. Naruto was currently on the receiving end of a lot of fighters. 
he had managed to fight them off for now, and was thanking whatever deity that was watching down on them for his training in fighting multiple opponents, usually his own clones, and for his massive chakra reserves and stamina. They had been battling for a few good minutes. Naruto was currently in another fist fight with Lee, he and his teammates being revived by Sakura's medical prowess. He dodged a pair of Jiyuken strikes from Hanada and Neji before spinning on his heel, to dodge a punch from Choji and countering with a powerful elbow into his cheek. The rotund boy was sent crashing the ground. Naruto then performed a substitution, with a log of course, to avoid a barrage of needles launched by Tenten, most likely covered in poison or a paralytic agent. Sakura charged at him from his side, but he quickly knocked her fist away, slammed a fist into her diaphragm, knocking the air from her lungs, and then throwing her over his shoulder in a different direction. Off to the side, Shikamaru and Shino, not being frontline fighters prepared to fight. Fang over Fang. The two drills that were Akamaru and Kiba, launched at the blonde from both sides, when the blonde performed a substitution to avoid the attack. The two wound up slamming into each other. They fell to the ground clutching their heads. Naruto landed a good few feet away from the substitution. As he prepared to fight again, he glanced over his shoulder at his mysterious savior. The unknown was currently engaged in a two-on-one brawl with Itachi and Kisame. He was fast enough to dodge Itachi's usual methods of attack and strong enough stop Kisame's sword. As Naruto glanced at the unknown, Shikamaru and Shino seized their chances. Ninja Art. Shadow Possession Jutsu. The Nara heir's shadow extended and connected with his former comrade's shadow. As soon as the two shadows made contact, Naruto felt his body seize up and he lost his ability to move. Naruto cursed his carelessness, but was immediately drawn from his thoughts to the sound of insects buzzing. Naruto was then aware of the sea of black that surrounded him. Shino's hive. The rest of the group stopped as they realized Naruto was now cornered. They were still prepared to fight, in case he got out of his situation, as unlikely as it seemed. Shikamaru said, Give up Naruto, you can't escape now. Even if you can get out of my technique you can't deal with all of Shino's hive. Just surrender. Naruto growled angrily and said, You can kiss my orange clad but, pineapple head. Shino sighed, though his visage was currently hidden you could tell he was frustrated. Then you leave us no choice, insect bog. The bugs closed in. Naruto was prepared however, and quickly sent out a massive pulse of lightning chakra through his body. Bug zapper. The massive charge of electricity shocked the entire group. Shino could feel his hive screaming as they were fried by the massive amount of power. The others stepped back, completely shocked by the massive amount of power that Naruto had just showed. Some of the more brash and arrogant, like Neji, Sakura, and Kiba, refused to believe that the amount of strength they were seeing was Naruto. The others who weren't as arrogant were now realizing that underestimating Naruto on this mission had been a huge mistake. The ones who showed real surprise were Shino and Shikamaru. They had theorized that Naruto had gotten stronger in the past three years that he had been gone. He had proved himself a good fighter in the Chunin exams and on missions that they had worked together on. However, they didn't know that it had changed that much. Shikamaru was so surprised, his shadow jutsu faltered. Shino quickly withdrew his hive, or what remained of it. Naruto knew that to fight the group in front of him, all at once would get him in deep trouble. So he opted to go a different route. Time for some old fashioned stealth. Naruto reached into his coat and launched out a trio of balls from his hands, aiming right at Kiba, Akamaru, and Shino. The orbs came within a few feet and then exploded into clouds of smoke. Almost immediately, everyone retched at the awful smell that flooded their noses. What the hell? Kiba yelled, Oh my god, what the hell is that stench? Everyone took a step back, as they held their noses to the foul odor. That was one of Naruto's old stink bombs, Shikamaru thought. Damn, he just took out two of best trackers, three, if you count Shino's hive's ability to track pheromones. Naruto quickly smirked before forming a few shadow clones and then running off into the trees, putting as much distance between them and him as possible as a mix of the training from Jiraiya and his old prankster habits started to mix, causing a fox-like grin to spread over the boy's face. Damn it Naruto get back here! Sakura yelled angrily as he ran off into the trees after the boy anger over her recent humiliation over her getting hurt overriding her judgment. Sakura, get back here! Shikamaru yelled as she ran off before he cursed under his breath, sigh, go after her, the rest of you split up into teams and find him. 
The group gave their confirmation of their orders and ran off into the woods after the blonde. Meanwhile, Naruto's unknown ally was currently in a grappling match with Kisame. Kisame was currently having a blast, even though someone was currently interfering with their mission. It had been a very long time since he had fought anybody who could match him in strength alone. He couldn't remember the last time that he felt his adrenaline pump like this, since he felt his blood rush with excitement, he couldn't remember the last time a fight brought him such enjoyment. As they were brawling, Itachi made sublet movements as he pulled out a series of shuriken. Fire style. Phoenix flower scarlet claw. Itachi released the shuriken from his grip and then using a fire blast from his mouth, wrapped them in blaze of crimson fire. To add to the flames, he went through a few more hand signs. Fire style. Grande fireball. The fire enhanced projectiles and projectile fireball all rushed towards Kisame and the still grappling unknown. The shuriken simply bounced off the man's armor, only two sticking to his back, as the flames spread. The flames hit the rogue swordsman, only for his body to evaporate into steam, revealing he had switched with a water clone. Kisame smirked and said, Guess that new fancy armor didn't do anything. Itachi kept his eyes on the flames. Suddenly, a dark figure could be seen in the center of the blazing inferno. It became clearer and clearer as it moved closer. The armored man was revealed to have no scratches on him, save for a few stubborn embers that stuck to his body. The sound of metal hitting dirt reached their ears. Glancing behind him, they saw that the shuriken that had embedded themselves into his back were falling out. The drone looked at the group with his blank face, giving an emotionless mask that surpassed even Itachi. The drone then opened a special compartment in its back. Two rods, both about eight inches in length shot into the air, before falling, the drone catching them. The tops of each staff glowed briefly then blades of energy formed, each one almost three feet in length. Chakra blades? Itachi thought, his eyebrow cocked in curiosity. Kisame scoffed and said, Ha, huh, if you knew so much about us, you should know that chakra blades are worthless against Samahata. Kisame charged and swung his massive weapon, only for the armored man to dodge to the left and then swing his own weapons. Kisame blocked, fully expecting the chakra to be drained from the weapons. His confident smirk was replaced with a look of shock when Samahata screeched in agony. He quickly drew back and immediately got on the defensive, dodging a barrage of precisely aimed sword swings. As they passed a tree, one sword swing cut right through it, bringing the smell of burned wood. Kisame jumped back to put some distance between him and the unknown. Itachi was also surprised, though his face, didn't show it. His armor gave him the strength to match Kisame, gave him immunity to genjutsu, and uses bizarre energy swords to fight them. Who was this guy? He was cut off from his thoughts when the man charged with his bizarre weapons drawn. In the woods, Team 10, Ino, Choji, and Shikamaru were currently in the middle of the forest. They had followed Naruto's clone and had managed to capture it with a well-placed shadow possession from Shikamaru. While Ino was boasting about they had caught the boy, he burst into smoke. As the blonde was ranting, Choji was attempting to keep her from going crazy, and Shikamaru was examining the immediate area. There was no doubt in his mind that Naruto had some sort of plan going on, as unlikely as it seemed. Up in the trees, Naruto glanced down at the trio. Out of all the teams of his generation, Naruto knew that the Ino Shika Cho trio was known for their teamwork, so he knew he had act fast before they could get into one of their infamous formations. Not only that, but Ino could have learned her clan's ability to telepathically communicate with others. Add in Shikamaru's superior intellect and they would be a problem. Naruto mentally thanked the old pervert for idea to learning about his fellow comrades in case of a future competition. Naruto reached into his bag and pulled out a grenade like cylinder. Naruto felt a brief hint of nostalgia as he popped it and then threw it at the trio. The device struck the ground and exploded into a blast of blue smoke and black powder. Shikamaru jumped back and knew that this was Naruto's work. Before he could do anything however, he suddenly realized that he was incredibly itchy. He quickly realized that the bomb had been laced with itching powder. Ino and Choji soon followed their boss's lead and began scratching like crazy. Jeez. Choji groaned in annoyance as he scratched himself like he had fleas, first a stink bomb now a canister of itching powder. Hell's king of pranks is making a comeback. Oh man, what did he put in this stuff? Ino was sharing Choji's sentiments and said, I'm going to murder that blonde moron. Naruto then leapt from the trees and said, well, here I am then flower girl. 
Ino growled angrily as she went through hand signs for her signature jutsu. She fully intended to transfer her mind into the boys and tear it apart. Shikamaru realized this as a ploy by Naruto Ad tried to stop her, but it was too late. Mind transfer jutsu. Ino's mind launched forward from her body leaving her limp. Naruto smirked at this and quickly performed another substitution, with Shikamaru this time. The next thing the genius knew his mind was being forced back as Ino took over his body. The possessed Chunin looked down at his hands with a shocked expression. Choji realized what this meant and turned only to a get a punch to the face, a knee to the gut, and a getting thrown over Naruto's shoulder to slam into a tree. Naruto then quickly performed a powerful curb stomp on the pone Ino's stomach, utilizing the long-time weakness of her family technique. The male blonde then launched forward towards the shell shocked Ino, Shikamaru, and slammed him, her in the stomach. A barrage of punches would result in some nasty bruises that began to appear on Ino's body as well. To finally, finish the job, Naruto punched the possessed Chunin before grabbing him by the skull and slamming him skull first into a tree. The Chunin hit the ground unconscious. Moments later, Ino moved slightly indicating she was back in her body, but feeling the combination of her own injuries and the ones dealt to Shikamaru. Naruto smirked and turned to Choji who just got up from his spot on the ground and growled before charging. The two began a rather brutal hand-to-hand -hand fight. Choji had Naruto beat in size and it was clear that he was putting his weight into his punches. Naruto used his smaller frame to his advantage ducking, bobbing, and weaving through the attacks, and then counterattacking. Naruto dodged a punch and threw a shot that struck the Akamichi air in the stomach, making him double over. Naruto then grabbed Choji's head and threw up a knee into his face, breaking his nose and causing blood to leak. Angry, Choji then went for his signature technique. He jumped back and used his expansion technique to bloat himself up. Naruto expected this and quickly began to for a Rasengan in his hand. He was shocked however, when Choji's hair wrapped around him and formed spikes. Something Naruto remembered seeing the old pervert do during one of their many spars. The surprise quickly faded, and Naruto brought his technique to bear, just in case. The two charged and prepared for the final stand. Spiked Human Boulder. Wind Style. Rasengan. The two techniques clashed. The resulting pulse kicked up dust and sent wind smashed into the trees, sending loose leaves from the branches. The two attacks ground against each other, the chakra infused hair holding up against the spiral sphere of chakra. After a moment, Naruto pushed more Charka into the technique pushing Choji back and knocking him out of his boulder form. Taking advantage of the chubby boy's temporary disorientation and rushed forward. The remained strength of the wind chakra enhanced Rasengan slammed into Choji's stomach causing him to scream in pain as it ground away at clothes and burned the skin and muscle beneath it. Choji, still screaming, was sent flying into a nearby tree and struck it with enough force to break it. With the Akamichi now unconscious, Team 10 was officially taken out of play. Naruto smirked at his victory before shaking his head. Now was not the time to get cocky. He quickly sent out a pulse and found that Team 8 was now the closest to him. He then made for them, intent on taking them down. Naruto quickly found themselves standing around. Kiba, Akamaru, and Hanada were currently looking for him, while Shino seemed to be performing a technique of his own. Naruto could feel something off but he couldn't tell what was. He guessed that it was something to do with the boy's hive. Naruto began to think of something to take them out and came up with a plan rather quickly. Staying down wind of Hanada, he approached the group. Down with team 8, damn it, where is he? Kiba growled angrily, Akamaru barking alongside him. Since Naruto had hit them with one of his old stink bombs, his entire sense of smell was messed up. This was supposed to be an easy mission, when the hell did Naruto start thinking like this? Naruto was practically the Omega of their class and that was how it was supposed to be. He was the only one frustrated. Because the smell had clung to his clothes, Shino's hive was also slightly incapacitated, due to the Kakaichu's sensitive sense of smell. Add in the damage he had done earlier with his surprise lightning attack, and Shino was beyond frustrated. Right now, he was using one of his clan techniques to speed up the repairs to his hive. Out of all three, Hanada seemed to be the least upset. Her Byakugan was the only thing that seemed to work at this point. The mission was proving hard for the now long-haired Hayuga. She didn't like having to fight her, not so secret, crush, but she had to bring him back, if only just to understand why he would want to leave. The boy had always preached about becoming the Hokage, so why would he just leave out of the blue? 
Off the side Naruto, still in stealth mode, came down and moved nearby one of the group, specifically Akamaru. Naruto glanced down at the large hound who glanced up at the hound before blowing a raspberry at the dog. The dog snarled and barked loudly before charging forward. The rest of the team turned towards the dog as it charged. Naruto dodged the swipe before grabbing the ninja hound's rear right leg. He swung the hound around in the air before throwing the nearly horse-sized dog over at Kiba, who didn't react in time. He was nearly crushed underneath the weight of his partner. Naruto then charged forward, leapt over the dog and then stomped hard, right on Kiba's skull knocking him out. Naruto formed a pair of shadow clones who proceeded to do the same to Akamaru, incapacitating the hound. To follow up all three charged at Shino and Hanada. Hanada took a step back as Shino pulled out his arm and sent out a wave of new Kakaichu. However, much like his earlier technique the two clones burst out lightning from their bodies, frying the two bugs. The two clones then leapt into the air, somersaulting in the air. As lightning erupted from their legs to the air and came down with a shout. Clone Lightning Axe Kick. The two axe kicks connected with Shino's shoulders before he could create a bug clone. The physical blow strained Shino's bones and the lightning shocked him, damaging flesh and nerves and frying a good amount more of the Aburame's hive. Shino let out a scream before he fell over, out cold. Naruto turned towards Hanada dispelling his clones. The girl looked nervous before getting down into her family's traditional stance. Please, Naruto, she said, just come back with us. We only want to get things figured out. Naruto sighed and said, Figure what out? Those council bastards saw a chance to get rid of me and they are. If you don't believe me then the daimyo is going to be arriving in a few days to discuss an issue involving a potential traitor. Hanada's eyes widened. People were conspiring against Naruto. In her own village. She guessed it might have to be about the Kayubi, but that was ridiculous. Naruto wouldn't do anything to harm the village, he had stated that as many times as he wore orange. There was no way anyone in their village would have to try Naruto executed or killed. No way. Naruto saw the surprised and disbelief in her eyes. He just shook his head. She had never seen the worst of Konoha, like Naruto had. She may have a hard time due to her father, sister, and cousin, but she never had been dealt with. Naruto then charged, taking Hanada by surprise before chopping her on the back of the neck, knocking her out. Naruto sighed as the Hyuga heiress fell to the ground out cold. Naruto then turned to leave, but was stopped when a barrage of kanai landed at his feet. Naruto turned towards the direction they came from and saw the remains of Team 7 and Team 9. Sakura cracked her knuckles and charged forward, completely ignoring the shouts of Neji, who was currently in charge in place of Shikamaru. She charged forward, and Naruto wound up grappling her. The two stared at one another glaring at one another. Just give up, already, she said, you're coming back with us, whether you like it or not. Naruto didn't answer her. He was tired of this old song and dance. He smiled and said, to think, I used to consider that forehead of your charming back in the day. Just so charming and kissable. Sakura's eyes widened. Those words. She remembered Sasuke saying those words to her just before running off, apparently feeling shy about admitting his feeling for her. How did Naruto know what Sasuke said to her? She didn't get a chance to ponder this before slamming his knee into her stomach. Naruto then punched her and sent her rolling backwards. Sakura immediately got up and glared at her. Naruto snarled and said, Listen, I've told you before, I'm not going back. Neji smirked and said, You don't have much of a choice. Even if we can't beat you, our backup will. Naruto blinked and asked, Back up. Neji simply smiled and said, I can see them. An Anbu and at least three Jonin. Even if you defeat us, you will have to defeat them. Naruto narrowed his eyes. Naruto wasn't sure about everyone in Anbu. On top of that, he wasn't sure he had the skill or experience to defeat one Jonin, let alone three. Neji didn't entirely count as he had only been recently promoted. Naruto, Lee said, you were outmatched. Please, just surrender my friend. You cannot defeat all of us. Naruto sighed and said, I told you before, I'm not going back Lee. Tenten brought out her scroll and said, Naruto, either you give up, or we just beat your orange wearing ass unconscious and drag you back. What is it going to be? Naruto looked between them all and reached out with his sensor ability. He could sense the fight between his unknown and the Akatsuki members. He also could sense the three Jonin and Anbu coming their way. Naruto sighed and said, I'll take option three. 
he formed a familiar hand signs and said, Beat the crap out of all of you and run. Mass Shadow Clone Jutsu. There was an enormous puff of smoke surrounding them. As soon as the clone were gone, there were multiple shadow cones surrounding the remaining teams on all sides. The Chunin and Jonin were all staring on in shock as they saw just how many shadow clones Naruto could make. If Lee wasn't so shocked, he would be spouting about the flames of youth right now. The group got ready to fight, but Naruto was one step ahead. Every clone leapt up into the air, and Naruto focused all his strength and slammed his fist into the ground with a small, local quake that managed to knock the group's balance off. As the clones descended Naruto and his clones called out the formation. Naru to 2K Uzumaki Barrage. Meanwhile, Itachi had seen many things in his life as a missing nin. However, this was something that had flabbergasted him. The mission had been simple. Zetsu had found that Naruto was leaving the village and they decided now was a good time to obtain the Kyubi. They had found Naruto about to confront his friends. Then they were interrupted by this unknown armored individual. As the fight progressed Itachi realized that this guy was no normal man. He was far stronger than any human being, aside from Tsunade or Kakuzu. Then there were his weapons. Those weapons didn't seem to rely on chakra as they burned through everything they touch, including the water and even the air something he could easily smell. Right now, Itachi was sporting some bloody knuckles form a close range attack that went bad. He was also suffering from some slight chakra drain because his armor allowed him to tank, basically all the techniques he threw. He also had some burned spots on uniform from some just barely dodged sword slices. Meanwhile, Kisami's arm was currently broken from a grappling contest that went horribly wrong. If that wasn't enough he also had a long, cauterized gash across his chest which, if Kisami's expression was anything to go by, hurt like absolute hell. He also had a large bruise on his face, and was clearly missing a tooth. All in all, there were too many unknowns with this guy. Who was he? Where did he get his armor and weapons? How had someone with this skill in building, weaponry, and fighting skill eluded them? I am through wasting time, he said, I will terminate you now. You have interfered with my mission long enough. He held out his hand and was about to act, when something happens. He glanced at the side. The man then turned to a different direction. Then, he deactivated his swords and put them back into his back. He turned and then shot off into the forest at such a fast clip, it would have made a certain green-suited Jonin jealous. Itachi turned towards his partner and said, Kisame, we are leaving. The shark man turned and said, What do you mean we're leaving? We have to. The former Mist Shinobi was stopped mid-complaint when he saw the sharp glare of his comrade. We are both injured by an unknown who is currently still around. There is also the fact that there is likely backup coming for the Konoha Shinobi. We are in no position to face off against them, especially with your arm and chest wound. Now, we must retreat. I am fairly certain that Pain will want to learn of this new player. Kisame growled, but he knew that his normally silent partner was right. His burn was really starting to hurt, and he couldn't fight with his arm broken. On top of that, Samahata had taken some damage as well, from the man's bizarre weapons and he needed time to be repaired. With a small grunt, the two vanished in a blur of speed. Back with Naruto, Naruto blinked as he stood over his fallen comrades. The group had been completely overpowered by his clones and himself. They were on the ground with several bruises and injuries, but they weren't going to be crippled or die from their injuries. As he stood victoriously and the last of his clones vanished he suddenly had a thought. Why didn't I just do that to all of them earlier? The sound of something hitting the ground go the blonde's attention. He turned around and let out a sigh of relief when he saw it was his new friend, he hoped. Hey, big guy, he said, thanks for the help back there with Kisame and Itachi. A thanks is not necessary, he said, I was simply fulfilling my mission. Naruto nodded and looked at him with a curious eye. Um. If I might ask, what was your mission? He answered, to prevent your capture and then deliver you to my creator. Suddenly, the man's head opened, revealing machinery and wires inside. A triangle shaped object shot out and hooked onto Naruto's face. Naruto grabbed at the hose and tried to tear it, but suddenly the large machine grabbed the blonde's hand and stopped him. After a moment, Naruto's movements started to slow until he fell over and lost consciousness. The drone then proceeded to pick up Naruto. The rest of his body, his chest, arms, and legs, opened up as well and then pulled him inside of his body, and then closed up. 
The robot's back then opened revealing a pair of thrusters, which fired up and sent him flying up into the air. As he flew off several shinobi from Konoha, including an Anbu with a fox mask, Kakashi, Guy, and Asuma arrived. Kakashi said, spread out, see if you can find them. If Naruto has gotten away they may know where he has gone, or at least have a hint. Little did they know, that Naruto was long gone, in a direction they would not be able to follow. Several miles above the surface, the drone flew up flying high above the clouds. Suddenly, a bright blue energy field formed around him as his feet fired off jets LIKD the ones on his back. He flew higher and higher until he finally shot through the atmosphere. Now surrounded by the icy void of space, his body began to glow slightly red, to add heat and warm to his currently sleeping, and unwilling, passenger. He flew through the void, approaching the massive dome, hidden in the shadow of the moon. Creator, I have returned with subject Naruto Uzumaki, what are my orders? After a moment, an answer came over the droid's internal computer. Bring him to the control. Make him comfortable. Seeing as we have, essentially, kidnapped him, he is bound to be a little bit upset. The drone understood this and flew towards dome and entered through large bay door open on the side. The drone landed in the middle of a large square-shaped room. The door closed and the voice of caretaker spoke. Door closed. Oxygen levels rising, rising, oxygen levels at prime levels. Artificial gravity activated. Another door opened, and the drone walked through the hall, his metal feet echoing through the empty hall. The lights came on room filling the room with light as he walked. He eventually entered a room where various machines sat. After that, his body opened, and Naruto's unconscious form tumbled out. The mask attached changed what was pumped into it, resulting in Naruto awakening, before it separated. Naruto jumped and spun around, looking around frantically. All right, buddy where did you take me? What the hell are you and what is going on? Suddenly, a new voice said, relax, Mr. Uzumaki. We do not mean you any harm. Naruto spun around trying to pinpoint where the voice was coming from. Who's there? The blonde asked, sounding annoyed. The sound of something moving got the ninja's attention. He turned around and saw a bowl-sized object floating towards him. On top of it was a small creature that could easily fit in Naruto's hand. It was only a few inches tall with gray skin, and green eyes with a horizontal bar pupil, like that of a toad. He wore a black suit that clung to him with a metal belt buckle around his waist, and dark gray gloves, which only had three fingers and a thumb. He also had two small tendrils coming off his face, between his mouth and eyes, acting like a small mustache. Greetings, the frog thing said, with a small wave. Naruto blinked in shock at what he was seeing. W what are you some, weird toad or something? The creature chuckled and said, no, I am not. However, I can see where you would get that mixed up. My species does have a several similarities with amphibians. He chuckled again and Naruto just stared. Now that all the jokes are out of the way we can get to business, the creature said, my name is Merlin, and I have an offer for you. Naruto blinked as he stared at the little frog-like creature that stood before him. So far this has been a very weird day. Naruto had learned there was a conspiracy against him, left Konoha, fought off against some of his comrades to get away from said conspiracy, was grabbed by a robot, and was now standing in front of a little grey frogman who told him that he had an offer he wanted to make. I'm sorry, I'm a little confused. Dot who are you, what are you and where the hell am I? Merlin let out a chuckle and said, oh, I'm sorry. I guess I should have explained a bit more. The frogman snapped his fingers and a chair floated down from out of nowhere. Naruto looked a little freaked out about the chair that had floated down from the ceiling, but he wasn't about to look a gift horse in the mouth. He sat down on the floating chair, which was surprisingly comfy. However, he was still preparing, ready to spring at a moment's notice if he needed to. As Naruto sat down Merlin continued, as for where you are, you are in a facility that I managed to build, hidden away from the rest of the world. As for what I am, I am an alien. A Galvin to be more precise. Naruto blinked and after he processed this information started to freak out. What? Oh no. Please, don't probe me or take my brain. Merlin looked shocked before the angry expression crossed his face. Oh, seriously what is with this probing and brain stealing nonsense? That has been considered a medical malpractice for several centuries already. I don't know why those idiots in the media thought that would be a good idea. What the hell would we even be looking for down there? 
and if I wanted to examine a brain I could find one of a less sentient race, or at the very least examined a freaking holographic one. As Merlin ranted Naruto took a small slide back from the minuscule alien. After about another few minutes of rambling and raging he started to calm down. Seeing Naruto's surprised he expression the Galvin cleared his throat. Forgive me. I'm usually a bit more composed than that. It's just that those media stereotypes really get on my nerves sometimes, especially the ones that show the more intelligent races being war-hungry, brain-stealing thugs. Naruto nodded and mentally made a note to keep any science fiction references to himself. Naruto then said, You said, something about an offer? Merlin nodded and said, Yes. You see, Mr. Uzumaki, I've been watching you for about two years, and I believe you would be a prime candidate for my grand experiment. Naruto blinked and suddenly felt nervous. W what kind of experiment? Merlin noted the nervous tone the blonde boy was using and quickly added, Oh no, no, no nothing dangerous, I assure you. You see it all started years ago. Feeling this might be a long story, Naruto got comfy. Many years ago, me and my younger brother had a bit of sibling rivalry between one another. We would always try to outdo one another in various ways to prove who was the smartest, or to get a date with a beautiful lady. Naruto rolled his eyes at this. Anyway, one day we decided to engage in one more challenge to prove who was the best genius. We decided to build a device, one that could be used to build bridges and take down walls between the various species of the universe. A way to bring the universe itself together. Naruto blinked at the goal. That seemed like a very good idea. Jiraiya had told the blonde boy, while on their training trip, how he wished to see the elemental nations at peace himself. No more wars, no more of this insanity, just a nice lasting peace. Merlin continued, we both set out to do that. I believed that the best way to do this, was to see through the eyes of another species. A device that could allow a person to change into any creature they could, so long as they had a sample of their DNA. I set out to gain the DNA and I managed to procure it. Unfortunately, things went rather wrong at that point. Naruto blinked in confusion and asked, what happened? Merlin sighed and said, you see, there is a high council on my planet, Galvin Prime. They believe that our technology should be kept to ourselves as we they were afraid that our technology could be used for terrible things. When they found out that I had the various samples of foreign DNA, they arrested me. My brother tried to convince them of my innocence, but it was not to be and I was banished. Naruto's eyes widened and said, I'm sorry. Merlin looked at the boy, his green eyes filled with sadness, and said, it is all right. Where was I, oh yes. I was lost for a while, traveling from planet to planet, working various jobs to get by. When, suddenly word reached me of a boy who could transform into various aliens with a device attached to his wrist. Naruto had a look of realization on his face and said, your device. Merlin nodded and said, my dear brother apparently finished my work and created a device that could allow a species to transform into another species. I was excited, however, I felt my old scientific curiosity come back to me. Merlin allowed a smile to cross his face and said, I found a planet full of old wrecked ships. I took some time, especially with my size, but I managed to create a ship that would take me across the universe. Over time I gathered DNA and new technology which would allow me to create various machines, weapons, and devices that would aid me in my adventures. However, I found that I needed something very important a person who could use this power. Naruto blinked in surprise and asked, Me? Merlin nodded and answered, Yes. Like I've said, I've been watching you. You have heart my dear boy. You have shown you can defy the odds many times. I believe that you are a prime candidate. So what do you say? Naruto was really interested, but he needed to ask, what's in it for me and, are there any strings attached? Merlin sighed and answered, well, you get to be something more than just a member of your planet. You'll get to see the universe in its entirety. You will have power beyond that of your species. Plus, it will keep you away from those who want to harm you. Naruto nodded as those were some very good points. Then Naruto asked, what about the strings? Merlin sighed again and said, I'll admit, there will be some changes due to the processes. Your DNA will forever be altered. If you were to go to a hospital on your planet they would notice anomalies almost immediately. You will never be considered human again. Naruto's eyes widened when he heard this. He would be changed down to his very DNA. There was no telling how this would alter him. There was just one thing he had to ask. What happens if I say no? Merlin answered, then, I will have you placed back on your planet, 
have your memory of this entire incident with me and my creation here wiped. It will be like you just started running after the defeat of your former comrades. Naruto sighed in relief, glad to know that he wasn't about to be disintegrated. He looked at Merlin and closed his eyes in thought. There seemed to be some serious pros and cons here. On one hand if he did this, he wouldn't be able to go home again due to his changed DNA, but other than the perverted sage, Granny, and Aruka, he probably didn't have much waiting for him back home. He could explore the universe, see what was truly out there. He could also say no and just continue with his life. His thought turned towards getting protection from Koyuki, and that potentially going wrong with Danzo pulling some crap that will lead to a huge problem, and on top of that the Akatsuki. He imagined the Akatsuki members breaking down the gates to Koiki's palace. Naruto mentally shuddered at the thought. He was nowhere ready to face off against ninja who eclipsed him in power and skill. He could use the Kyubi's chakra, but no doubt they would have countermeasures for that, like when he was trying to find Tsunade. With that thought, the blonde made up his mind. I'm in. Merlin smiled and said, Are you sure? This is a very big decision that you're making my boy. Naruto nodded and said, yeah, I'm sure. Merlin smiled and said, Great. Now come. Since you're going to be staying here for a while, I might as well give you the tour. Naruto rose up from his seat and followed Merlin. Behind him the drone stayed behind. Oh, right, Merlin said, having forgotten about the robot, return to the bay for repairs and examination. After that, deactivate until new orders are ready. The machine answered, Yes sir. The three left the room, Naruto and Merlin going one direction while the drone went in another. The next chapter of Naruto's life was about to begin. Meanwhile down on earth, a random cave system, Kisame and Itachi, having had a narrow escape from the Konoha ninja now stood in a cave system, surrounded by various holograms, or whatever those things were, and were currently retelling the failure of their mission. They had had a close call with some of the Anbu that tailed the Jonin to help the others who were to retrieve the now rogue blonde. You two failed to complete your mission, Didera said, a mocking smile aimed at Itachi, looks like that Sharingan of yours isn't that great. As usual, Itachi didn't take the bait, but he did send an annoyed look towards the mad bomber. Payne simply rubbed his chin in thought. This unknown figure was capable of going toe-to-toe -to -toe with two of their more powerful members. Add in the fact that he came and went so quickly, was immune to Itachi's Sharingan and used weapons that seemed more advanced than what was being produced in Spring Country. Who was he and what did he want with the Uzumaki boy? Payne simply said, Itachi, Kisame, return to base for treatment. Zetsu, I want you to keep an eye out for this man. We need to know who he is and why he saw fit to interfere with our mission. Itachi and Kisame both nodded before the holograms faded. Kisame and Itachi began their trek back to the hidden rain village. Back in Konoha, Tsunade rubbed her head as he approached the room where the Konoha rookies were being held. The slug princess was not happy. Danzo had gone behind her back, letting a group of Chunin, and one Jonin, out to retrieve Naruto without her permission or order. Thankfully, Naruto hadn't killed any of them, but they were going to be sore. In the meantime, the council was demanding that Anbu be sent out to hunt down Naruto to either kill him or drag him back. These went unanswered of course, as she originally believed that Naruto would be detained, however, after seeing the entire group beaten down she realized that wasn't going to happen. If things weren't crazy enough, she just learned that the fire daimyo was on his way to the village right now to discuss something important with her, and would arrive some time tomorrow. She could only guess that Danzo had something to do with this. Tsunade sighed as he went over the papers. This was going to be a very, very long day. Her attention was grabbed when, Suddenly, Jiraiya burst through the front door of the hospital. He ran towards her and skidded to a stop, panting as he tried to regain his breath. Haim, he panted. What's going on? Please tell me that you and Naruto are conspiring to prank me. The Toad Sanin had arrived in the village while the Naruto retrieval team had gone, and he wasn't aware that Naruto had gone because, as usual, he immediately went to the hot springs to get some inspiration for his latest book, when he arrived at Tsunade's office to give her his latest report, he was told, by an ANBU, about Naruto leaving and the failure to be brought back. All the Anbu saw after that was a Jiraiya-shaped dust cloud. As Tsunade stood there looking at the man she shook her head no, indicating what the old pervert had feared. He had always wondered when Naruto would have enough and just leave. Now he had an answer. Deep inside, he felt guilt boil in his gut and burn away at his herd. 
he began to feel sick as he realized that he had failed his first student. Jiraiya didn't care for Naruto in his early life because of his spy network, only checking on him when he came to do his reports and he didn't notice anything wrong. Of course, the old spymaster wasn't as observant as he should have been. There was another reason that he didn't care for Naruto back then. He was scared. The old sage was scared. What would happen to the boy with a life on the road and his own skills? There were times when he could barely care for himself let alone an infant. He wasn't the only one. Tsunade was also hit by a good amount of guilt. She left Konoha because the village had taken so much from her. Her grandmother, grandfather, granduncle, boyfriend, and little brother. After Kashina, who she viewed as pseudo-daughter, she left, using her Sanin travel rights, and drowned herself in her vices, gambling and sake. Tsunade then told Jiraiya about where the Naruto retrieval team was and what room they were in. The pair of Sanin walked towards the room. As they walked the pair couldn't help, but wonder what the situation would be like if one or both of them had stayed around to raise the boy. As they walked Tsunade informed him on what happened, including what Danzo had done, that she knew of. They arrived at the room and Jiraiya was surprised, but not very surprised at what he saw. All of them had various bruises and scrapes, most likely from Naruto fighting them. However, some of them had very specific injuries. Ino had some bandages around her waist. Shikamaru had some bandages on his stomach as well. Choji had several more bandages, and Jiraiya guessed the Akamichi air was hit with either a strong Rasengan, or a weak version of one of Naruto's elemental versions. All three of them also seemed to have a minor rash, something he recognized from Naruto's personal itching powder which included shredded bits of poison ivy, according to Naruto's pranking tales from their trip. Kiba. Akamaru most likely at a veterinarian to get patched up, had a bandage wrapped around his head and some which he guessed from Naruto's stink bombs. Shino had some bandages around his shoulders, and had a foul smell lingered about him too. Hanada was the only one who seemed to have very few injuries. The other teams only had various bruises, bumps, and minor scrapes and cuts. By examination they had been on the receiving end of a serious beating. With the group of injured shinobi were their senseis, Kakashi, Gai, Kuranai, looking pregnant, and Asuma. Off to the side, Inoichi was currently writing down some notes, most likely having used his abilities to enter their minds while they were unconscious to get answers. Such a thing was legal if the shinobi was. Jiraiya sighed and said, I have a feeling that your mission was a failure. Neji answered, Unfortunately, yes, it would appear Naruto was far more skilled than we originally believed. Jiraiya simply stared at the Hyuga prodigy and said, Naruto has been away from the village for almost three years. Did you honestly think that Naruto wouldn't have improved in so long? Neji looked rather flustered at this as he remembered his failure in his mission and feeling a little frustrated at his loss. In their first battle Naruto had been forced to use the Kyubi's chakra to win their battle, but this time he didn't need to. From her hospital bed, Sakura growled angrily. She had been the top kunoichi of her class, she had been trained by Tsunade, and she still hadn't been strong enough to take the blonde boy down. Sakura clenched her fist as she snarled angrily. She would get him back for this humiliation. She would show him what happens when you mess with Sakura Haruno. She wasn't the only one. Ino, Kiba, and Neji were considering upping their own training to get back at the boy for this incredible humiliation. As the four ninjas considered what to do for revenge a silence had passed in silence. What I want to know, Kuranai said, breaking the silence, is how Naruto got so good, he never showed this kind of skill a few years ago. Asuma, chewing on some gum because he wasn't allowed to smoke in the hospital, said, no idea. Kakashi, nose in his porn as usual, simply said, no clue. Naruto didn't show that kind of skill at all when I taught him. Suddenly loud, somewhat obnoxious, laughter filled the air. Everyone was surprised to see that Jiraiya was the one laughing. He was laughing like he had just heard the world's funniest joke. After a few moments the man stopped laughing, catching his breath, before he fixed the perverted scarecrow with a blank gaze. You really are an idiot Kakashi. You speak about looking underneath the underneath, but you are completely clueless. Kakashi still had his nose in his porn book, apparently not taking the sage's words seriously. With an annoyed scowl Jiraiya walked right up to the man, snatched it from his hands and then threw it out the nearest open window. Thankfully, it would land in open dumpster where no kids would find it. Kakashi looked shocked at the loss of his precious book and was about to say something, 
but the look in the toad sage's eyes stopped the silver-haired man cold. Asuma, Guy, and Kuranai were surprised at the old sag's actions. They had only known him as the self-proclaimed super-pervert. However, it was a little-known fact that, if the old sage ever took a situation seriously then only someone like Tsunade or Orochimaru would be able to stop him. It made the Jonin nervous. The younger generation was surprised to see the old pervert was serious. Something that, those who knew about him, were not used to seeing from the usually comical sage. Sakura, undeterred by the man's change in attitude, scoffed, what's that supposed to mean? There was nothing more to see with that idiot. He was loud, obnoxious, and nothing but a hindrance, especially to Sasuke. There was nothing more for anyone to see in the dead last. Several others seemed to agree. The exceptions seemed to be Lee, Shino, Shikamaru, and Hanada. It made Jiraiya slightly annoyed with this generation. He himself had been labeled the dead last in his years at the academy. It had taken him forever, but he managed to get the recognition he deserved after proving he had gotten better over the years. Now these kids were making the same mistake. It was time for the Toad Sage the Toad Sage to put an end to that. Jiraiya turned to the rosette and said, So, if he's the dead last then why is the top kunoichi of her graduating class and the rookie of the year from his class, currently in a hospital while the dead last stands in victory? Sakura growled, angered at the insult towards her pride, and was about to yell something, only for the Toad Sage to cut her off. If that isn't enough proof, Lee here, the dead last of his class, is by far the best in taijutsu of your generation, arguably. Sakura blinked at the man's answer, she tried to give him a comeback, but before she could he continued. Now, tell me, why should Naruto still be weak? So that you and your little crush can have their so-called happy ending. Your happy ending with a guy who barely seems to even acknowledge the fact that you existed even in the beginning of your team days. Sakura let out another growl as she tried to say something but Jiraiya raised his hand, silencing her. In all honesty, the man continued, I'm beginning to wonder why we go with these titles anyway, especially since once you're out of the academy they mean absolute crap. Kakashi looked annoyed as he said this. The scarecrow walked forward and said, Now Jiraiya, you know that isn't exactly true. Naruto was abysmal in the academy and once he was out of it, he didn't really improve much. The other Jonin seemed to agree, mostly hearing from Kakashi's stories, most of them being assumptions that Sasuke had been the brains behind the incidents, through his blatant favoritism and immediate labeling of Naruto. Jiraiya sighed and said, Kakashi. That would be true if you had actually been a teacher. You left Naruto and Sakura both on their own while you personally trained Sasuke. You kept telling Naruto that he needed more chakra control to learn, but you never taught him any exercises other than the tree walking exercise, which you didn't teach them until your first C rank turned into an A rank. He came up with a strategy that saved your life, and don't say it was Sasuke because only Naruto is capable of thinking off the wall like that. He fought against and defeated Zabuza's apprentice with a little help, while your golden boy was going the world's best impression of a hedgehog. In the Chunin exams he managed to make it to the finals, something many of you thought he couldn't do. Oh, and Kiba, he beat you while having a handicap that messed up his chakra flow. Think about that for a moment. This surprised the group as they didn't know the real story behind the mission to wave. Kiba remembered his defeat and was shocked that Naruto had a handicap, as was Kurenai. It showed just how much they underestimated him because of his dead last title. On top of that, you trained Sasuke personally, like he was your own apprentice. You taught him various fire jutsu even that cursed Chidori that you were so damn proud of, which he had no problem using on my own apprentice several times. Kakashi winced slightly, just barely noticeable, while many of the other shinobi were shocked beyond words. Kakashi's motto of abandoning your comrades and were beginning to realize just how hypocritical the man was, and it made them sick. It also made the retrieval team realize that Naruto had a very crappy teacher. Kakashi defended, Naruto was too impatient. He couldn't sit still, and he never really showed much improvement. In all honesty, I thought I couldn't be able to teach him. The white-haired Sanin and said, so you basically bet all your money on who seemed to have the most potential and ignored the other two. I can't tell you how stupid that is. Not to mention how much this is a painful repeating of history, he mentally added. Jiraiya simply said, since you believed Naruto was a lost cause, allow me to clarify a few things. First off, the reason Naruto was so bad in the academy was because he had too much chakra, hell he had more chakra than anyone in the academy. 
Sakura immediately shot up and, that's a lie. Sasuke had the most chakra. Naruto couldn't even create a clone and Sasuke could perform a fire jutsu. Jiraiya sent a blank stare to her and was about to say something, but Shino spoke up. Actually, the Abarame heir said, Naruto did have higher chakra than most of us during the academy and even on our mission to bring him back, despite his injuries and the drain from his fight with Sasuke. Everyone looked at Shino with a shocked expression. He continued, My insects investigated the chakra levels of my potential teammates. I found early on, that Naruto had higher chakra levels than most of our class. I brought this to a teacher's attention, but nobody did anything. After another attempt, I found that it was pointless to continue to attempt to do so. This brought thoughtful looks to the group. Naruto was so weak, because he was so powerful. Lee suddenly felt a feeling of kinship with Naruto. They were both the dead last in their class due to their chakras seemingly working against them. Ino blinked and asked, Why would they do that? Jiraiya turned towards the platinum blonde and said, It's a common technique for training Jinchuriki. They keep their regular skills low so their ace in the hole is their main skill. If they try to rebel, their only main skill is how to use can easily be countered. This brought shocked looks to everyone. Naruto was being sabotaged early on? Jiraiya then said, as for Naruto not showing any progress, Naruto learned the Shadow Clone Jutsu in a short amount of time, and his chakra levels allow him to make over a hundred of them and not feel any sort of side effects. The retrieval team all felt some phantom pain from the massive one-sided beat down by Naruto and over a hundred Shadow Clones in a single sitting. The sage continued, during the month to prepare for the Chunin exams, Naruto learned how to summon the Toad Boss Gamabunta in under a month. He probably would have learned sooner, but hey, research. Which he has been able to summon at least twice, once during Gara and some other mission. Neji's eyes widened as he remembered hearing about how a giant toad had fought against a giant sand monster during the Chunin exams, but he had thought it was Jiraiya, but after hearing that he had doubts. Glancing to the side, he noticed Shino and Ino both nodding in confirmation, remembering the mission to see country. The white-eyed prodigy paled slightly as he realized that there were several ways that his fight against Naruto, could have gone badly if he had summoned a large enough toad. What? Sakura asked, surprised, but I heard it was Sasuke was the one to beat Gara. Jiraiya didn't dignify the fangirl's words with a verbal response. Instead he summoned a familiar toad who handed the white-haired pervert a scroll. Jiraiya unrolled it revealing the names written on it, including Naruto. Kuranai, Asuma, and Gai were all shocked that Naruto had been able to learn how to summon at such a young age. They now realized that Kakashi had been sitting on a literal gold mine and he had walked away from it for a piece of fool's gold. Jiraiya wasn't finished, however. If that is not enough, the sage continued, Naruto learned the Rasengan, a jutsu created by the fourth Hokage, in under a week. Something that took me over a month to do. And he's taken it and expanded it into ways that the Yandaimi didn't have time to. He looked right at Choji and said, You're lucky that he didn't use a stronger variant of it, kid. If not, you'd probably be a paraplegic right now. Choji paled as he realized that he was very lucky to be alive right now, especially if Naruto was as tough as they said. Jiraiya then looked Kakashi right in the eye and said, What was it you always say Kakashi? Those who abandon their comrades are scum. Well, I guess we know where you stand in Naruto's eyes and mine. He then gave a very intimidating look. Well, at least you'll have to deal with one less piece of dead weight, he said. Before a response could be made the door opened, revealing Tsunade. Jiraiya we need to talk, the slug princess said. Jiraiya left the room and joined Tsunade and Inoichi. What is it? He asked, sounding annoyed. Inoichi answered, before I explain, I have to ask, what was Naruto's mental state and what was the condition of his seal? Jiraiya looked puzzled at the question, but he answered, Naruto's mental health shouldn't have come into question. Despite everything that happened he is mentally sound. As for the seal, over the training trip, I did attempt to loosen the seal a bit to allow Naruto a bit more access to the Kyubi's chakra. Upon seeing the shocked, and horrified, looks on the pair's faces he quickly added, but that proved to be a huge mistake and I quickly returned to seal to its original state. Shock and horror were replaced with relief. What does this have to do with Naruto? The white-haired pervert asked. Inoichi answered. I went through the memories of the retrieval team, especially when Danzo gave them the orders to go after Naruto, as well as the mission itself. Apparently, 
Danzo told them about Naruto's status as a Jinchuriki and told them that his seal was failing, causing him to become more violent and unpredictable. The two Sanin snarled at Danzo's manipulation. However, there is something else. When he gave the orders, I felt something nagging at my mind, or rather their minds. I think Danzo may have cast a subtle genjutsu to influence them to go after Naruto. On top of that, Naruto kept talking about him being set up. Jiraiya rubbed his chin in though. Something wasn't right here. The fact that Danzo seemed to be at the center of all this didn't seem to be a coincidence. That old war dog had been trying to get Naruto turned into the village's personal weapon for years. He wouldn't put it past the half mummy to conspire with others to make Naruto look like a bad guy. He wasn't the only one who was thinking that. Tsunade had suspicions about Danzo. Ever since she came to the village, he and her advisors had been talking to her about trying to get Naruto to be brought under Danzo's wing. She heard about his methods years ago and it made her sick. Could he really have conspired something against Naruto behind her back? And if he did, who was involved and how far did it go? Tsunade said, go through everything you can. See if you can figure out what Danzo was planning and why. The daimyo is coming tomorrow, and I want to have something solid against that old mummy. You work with him Jiraiya, and no research. The two nodded and walked off, ready to start investigating. Tsunade rubbed her temples at the oncoming migraine. With Naruto and Merlin, Naruto was currently sitting in what could be described a small room. It contained a bed, a hollow screen for movies and games, if necessary, and a few other necessary items. Merlin had informed Naruto that this was where he was staying. The blonde boy had gotten a rather nice tour of the facility Merlin had brought him to. Naruto was shocked to learn that the base was on the moon. When Naruto expressed doubt, Merlin showed him by opening a shutter that revealed the planet to him. A sight that captivated Naruto as he got to see just how beautiful the world was. Naruto was then shown Merlin's lab, which had technology both military and medical, that would make certain people in his village green with envy. He also showed Naruto a small production facility that produced his battle drones. When Naruto looked confused, Merlin explained that drones were essentially puppets that could move on their own. There was also a kitchen that had various food from Earth, harvested by multiple small drones. To help with the freshness the base actually came with a biological chamber which allowed them to grow their own food, multiple vegetable, and even meat samples from various planets. Something that made Naruto drool. One of his favorite rooms however, was the map room. The chamber had a large map, that showed most of the universe. Which, apparently, the Galvan won in a card game. Naruto was shocked that so many planets, so many species lived in the universe. It made Naruto feel small, and it made him sit down to process it all. The last place that Naruto was shown, was the training room. A gigantic chamber that, using special hard light hologram technology, could mimic anywhere in the universe. Naruto was drooling at the thought of training there. Naruto was even more shocked when Merlin said that the technology here was considered below par on his home planet. It turns out, Merlin could have made a larger better base, but he didn't have the resources to do so due to his banishment, and because, as he stated earlier, his people were very picky about who got their technology. At the exact moment, Naruto was fiddling with the remote to the hollow screen, getting frustrated that he couldn't turn the alien device on. The sound of a door opening got the boy's attention and he saw Merlin enter in on his flying disc. Dinner is almost ready, he said, I just threw you might want to know. Naruto got up and was following the miniature alien out the door. As they walked Naruto asked something. So how exactly do you intend to do to me? Merlin looked back and said, well, I have a few plans, but first, we have to get you healthy. Naruto looked confused. Merlin answered, you only started eating healthy after your nearly three-year training trip. We have over a decade of malnutrition to make up for. After that, we'll work on your skills as a shinobi. I have a few plans for that. Then we'll get to the alien stuff. Besides, you may need a bit of time to get used to some of the new technology, if the hollow screen is anything to go by. Naruto grumbled something under his breath and followed the minuscule alien to the dining area. A whole new chapter in Naruto's life was about to begin, and he couldn't wait. Meanwhile, several million miles away, another Galvin raised his head from his workbench. He had a distinct feeling something big was coming in the future, and he couldn't wait. The mood was tense as the clan heads entered the council chambers. Each member was silent as they entered the room. Even the normally lazy Shikakunara had a serious look on his normally bored face. 
Each member quickly took their seats, at the half-circle table and began to wait in tense silence. The clan heads didn't know why they had been called here, but it was apparently serious as the civilian council members had not been invited. Curiously, the only civilian present was Mebuki Haruno. After a few moments, the silence was broken when the doors opened. They saw Tsunade and Jiraiya, holding a large folder in his hands, walked into the room, both looking incredibly serious. Soon after was another man. The man was old and thin with round eyes and dark pupils. He wore a headpiece that consisted of a grey band around his forehead and a dark blue cloth framing his head, reaching his shoulders. The rest of him was covered in royal, expensive-looking robes. This was the daimyo of fire country, Ozai. Flanking him were two samurai guards, and a third man. He wore white and dark purple robes, with the Yamanaka clan symbol on his back, and had blonde hair and blue eyes. His name was not known to the members of the council, but he was clearly here at the daimyo's behest. The three walked across the room. Ozai took his spot at a podium at the front of the table, and took a seat. Jiraiya and Tsunade approached the man. First, before we begin are all the members here? The daimyo inquired, looking around with a blank expression, seeing no empty seats, are any of the clan heads being substituted today? Upon receiving, no, for an answer the daimyo spoke. Good, the daimyo said, now, you are probably all wondering why you have been called here today. Tsunade, please explain. Tsunade nodded and said, before we begin, I have something to announce. As of two days ago, the civilian council has been disbanded as they have shown they have been unable to keep secrets or remain unbiased in certain situations. As she has shown maturity, and the ability to see past her own issues, I have allowed Mebuki Haruno to sit in as a single councillor who shall remain in charge of civilian matters. The woman in smiled thankfully at the woman. She had seen how out of control and arrogant the civilian council was beforehand, and she had a feeling if it kept up something very stupid was going to happen. The ninja council members all nodded in understanding as they had seen that Mebuki was capable of remaining unbiased and acted as a grey area in these times. Tsunade continued, moving on, the first matter is the sentencing of Sasuke Uchiha. The second is the running away of Naruto Uzumaki. The daimyo nodded and said, after looking through all the evidence I am surprised that this has been allowed to go on. I have read up on Sasuke Uchiha with the information given to me by the various reports found across the village. He had been already marked a flight risk before his desertion. In accordance for his crimes Sasuke Uchiha shall be stripped of his ninja rank, have all information from the hidden sound village extracted, and any information involving Konoha wiped. After having his chakra sealed he shall be sentenced to life in the blood prison. Upon doing so, his assets shall be liquidated. This brought a few nods from the group. Sasuke was an asset sure, but the boy was an obvious flight risk and he was obviously mentally unstable. It was clear that something needed to be done. Mebuki knew she was going to be getting an earful from her husband, but she didn't care. Tsunade said, with that matter taken care of, we shall move on to the matter of Naruto Uzumaki. Sume suddenly said, if you are ready to bring him back to face trial, I can send out some of my best trackers on your orders, Tsunade-sama. Tsunade nodded and said, while I thank you that Sume, we have a more pressing matter to deal with involving Naruto Uzumaki, besides his defection. There was a moment of confusion from everyone, except for Inoichi who nodded in understanding. Tsunade continued, We have come to believe that there was a conspiracy put in place that would have Naruto Uzumaki expelled from the village on false charges. A conspiracy that some of your children may have unknowingly participated in. This was greeted with looks of surprise from the council and outrage from some of the more brazen ones, namely Sume. My son Kiba would never willing betray one of his comrades, she shouted, Loyalty is something that is hardwired into every member of the Inazuka clan. Similar shouts came up from the clan heads defending their children. The daimyo banged his gavel causing the chatter to die down. He said, We are not here to accuse blame. Thanks to the investigative skills of Inoichi Yamanaka and Jiraiya we have found proof that they did not willingly take part in this conspiracy. We also believe that we have those in charge of this conspiracy as well. This resulted in a series of mumbles from the group. The fact that a conspiracy had been set up in the infrastructure of their own village. The daimyo then stood up and said, bring in the accused. The doors to the tribunal opened and someone was guided in. The figure was wrapped tightly in chains covered decked out in special chakra suppression seals. His hands were cuffed with special cuffs that kept his hands apart, 
and put metal lines between his fingers to prevent him from using hand signs for techniques. Standing in front and back of him were two Anbu each, for a total of four, all of them were ready to execute the man should he move in a way they don't like. After being brought in, Danzo was pushed by the Anbu to his knees. The sight of the Hokage's advisor down on his knees and in chains shocked the clan heads as they looked on with shock. It made them incredibly nervous as they realized that this conspiracy was high up in Konoha's power structure. Tsunade didn't allow herself to smile, but she felt a large amount of achievement at seeing the man who attempted to have her godson charged and arrested, while the traitorous Uchiha went free. Flashback. Three days ago, Tsunade sat in her chair as he drummed her fingers on her desk feeling a bit nervous. Why wouldn't she be nervous? She was about to go into a deep battle of politics with the daimyo to determine the future freedom of her godson. She, Inoichi, and Jiraiya had spent many hours trying to get the information needed. She went through various mission reports with Jiraiya sending out word to his spy network to contact the clients who had paid for the missions, which was rather easy thanks to the smaller summons he used. Inoichi had gone through every member of the Konoha teams, even the sensei to help get their perspective of the missions, at least the ones they were on. The members of each team were quick to point out the inconsistencies in the mission reports. Well, except Sakura when it came to the wave mission as she, along with Kakashi hadn't witnessed much due to the mist at the time and being stuck guarding Tizuna. The three were shocked to find that the mission reports that they found were altered, showing Sasuke to be an exemplary ninja, Sakura to be above average, and Naruto to be, in summation, dead weight. They originally suspected Kakashi, but after comparing his handwriting from some recent paperwork, having been framed by a teacher at the time, to commemorate the time. After realizing minor differences in the writing that couldn't be done by Kakashi, they believed they had enough evidence to put him out of suspicion. They would have gone into more detail on who was dirty, but they had to bring enough evidence to convince the daimyo and they didn't have the time. She discreetly glanced out the corner of her eye at Danzo, Homura, and Kaharu. The trio were currently in their office waiting for the daimyo to arrive as well, no doubt to bombard him with Naruto's trumped up charges and false evidence. While Danzo hid his well, the other two held a level of smugness about them that old her that they thought they hadn't been exposed. Tsunade took another breath to calm herself, before the intercom on her desk fired up. Lady Tsunade, the voice of the secretary said, the daimyo has arrived. Tsunade let out a breath to calm her nerves and said, let him enter. The door opened to reveal the daimyo flanked by two of his personal ninja guards, wearing the familiar garb of the ninja guardians. Though she couldn't see them, she could only guess that the others were currently moving around the tower just in case. Lord Daimyo, Tsunade said with a respectful tone, I welcome you to our village, but I wish it were under much better circumstances. The Daimyo nodded and said, I understand that this matter is of the utmost importance especially given how it revolves around the security of my ninja village. Tsunade nodded before she turned towards the three advisors and said, You three, out. The three advisors looked shocked at Tsunade's sudden dismissal of the two did not sit well with them. Lady Tsunade. Danzo said as he tried to convince her to let him stay, but she cut him off, with a cold icy tone that left room for no argument. Danzo Shimura, I don't know who you think you were given what you pulled a few days ago, but I will not allow you to try to undermine my authority again. Now, you and the other advisors can get up and leave. This is a very important matter and I don't want any unnecessary information getting out. Homura and Kaharu looked upset, and Danzo didn't say anything, his years of mental training keeping him from showing his annoyance. He began to focus his chakra into his hidden Sharingan eye, putting suggestions in the woman's head. However, after discovering the use of Genjutsu on the members of Konoha, Jiraiya and Tsunade had come prepared. Under her desk, Tsunade applied some chakra to a seal that was hidden from view. A special anti-Genjutsu seal that Jiraiya had developed. I told you to get out, Tsunade said just as firmly. If Danzo was surprised, he didn't show it. He simply frowned and walked out followed by the other elders. The daimyo's guards eyed the group curiously and were making sure that the two old men and old woman left the office and stayed out. As the door shut the daimyo turned towards the remaining trio in the room. I am surprised that you have gotten rid of your advisor Tsunade, the daimyo said, curiosity clear in his tone. Tsunade answered, I trust him as far as I could throw him. Jiraiya stepped forward and said, Lord Daimyo, you are aware of the situation involving Sasuke Uchiha and Naruto Uzumaki, correct? Daimyo nodded and said, 
Yes, I was told that the Uchiha boy had returned from an S rank mission to spy on the hidden sound village and was attacked by his former teammate Naruto Uzumaki. Now I hear that the same boy has deserted the village. Tsunade sighed and said, Lord Daimyo, there was no mission to spy on the sound village. The old man looked shocked upon hearing that. Using the silence as a chance to continue, Jiraiya said, First of all, Sasuke was considered a flight risk by the Sandame before his passing. Following being given a curse seal, he willingly left the village to join Orochimaru in the hidden sound village. Jiraiya then proceeded to hand the man a folder. The daimyo took it and skimmed through the various papers. He was surprised to read that multiple things in the files did not match up with what was sent to him. Inoichi continued where Jiraiya left off, saying, We have learned recently the psychologist who was put in charge of Sasuke's mental evaluations had been bribed into keeping Sasuke's mental state a secret. Apparently, Sasuke was horribly traumatized by the death of his family. The daimyo was shocked as he was shifting through the papers. He found a bunch of financial papers that had the name of the psychologist. There were some rather large amounts of money sent in, on dates that lined up with the dates of the evaluations. Inoichi continued, after realizing the corruption, I went through Sasuke's mind myself. He suffers from a massive inferiority and superiority complex, as well as PTSD, after being trapped in a powerful genjutsu by his brother Itachi when he left the village. The daimyo went through the papers and was shocked about this. The papers he had been given were completely wrong. Sasuke wasn't some prince who was given a great mission he was a traitor and a liar. However, he was also curious about something. What about that Uzumaki boy? Ozai asked, with a raised eyebrow, how does he fit into this? Jiraiya said, I can answer that for you. You see, Naruto was considered the dead last of his class. However, that was not due to a lack of talent, but rather bias towards him. Naruto, it turns out, had rather large reserves of chakra. Far more than what a normal academy student should have. The teachers didn't realize this immediately and labeled him a lost cause. At one point, I myself started training Naruto and I found that the boy was a diamond in the rough. The daimyo was now going through a few more of the papers. He found the mission reports that praised Naruto for the work he did. As well as an observation from Jiraiya of Naruto's skills and abilities. He had to admit, despite not being a ninja, that Naruto's accomplishments were quite impressive even though people didn't seem to want to train him for being a lost cause. He also compared them to the fake reports and was immediately able to pick out the biased words and fake praise of the Uchiha boy. The daimyo then turned towards the trio and said, Why would they do this? Why such blatant favoritism? Jiraiya answered, We aren't entirely sure. At this point we can only speculate that the civilians, and some of our shinobi, show favoritism towards Sasuke for his status as an Uchiha clan member. Some of them probably think that by getting in Sasuke's good graces, he would repay them in kind in the future. The daimyo nodded. He had seen some people treat the nobles and wealthy in the capital better than some others. However, there was one last thing that had him concerned. And the Uzumaki boy? He asked. Why would they hold such a grudge against him? Tsunade sighed and said, Naruto Uzumaki is the jailer of the nine-tailed fox. The daimyo looked surprised at this and was shocked. He had heard through some members of his court that the nine-tailed Jinchuriki was amongst the leaf village. The thought of Naruto turning that massive beast upon the village in revenge made him break out into a cold sweat. Tsunade quickly saw the look on his face and quickly added, Inoichi did a mental evaluation a while back. He was mentally sound. However, we have found that there may have been a conspiracy to frame Naruto for assaulting Sasuke, possibly attempting to murder him, sending Naruto to prison and getting off with a slap on the wrist. The color returned to the man's face as they realized the threat of the nine tails wasn't present. However, the word conspiracy immediately made a deadly serious expression come up to the older man's face. What conspiracy? He asked. Jiraiya answered, between the fake mission reports we discovered, I did a mental evaluation on the retrieval team to get some clear images on what happened. In their memories, I sensed a genjutsu, a very discreet one, being put on them to make them go after Naruto. All of this centered around one person, Danzo Shimura. Flashback end. Tsunade smirked to herself as she saw Danzo push down to his knees. After giving him their evidence, Ozai had given the three days to get the evidence they needed. With many Yamanaka, after making sure they weren't in Danzo's pocket, found out some very interesting things about Danzo. They found out that Danzo had either bribed, 
blackmailed, or just straight up owned several people in the records department, allowing them to fake mission reports. They also found that the Uzumaki clan had been wiped out from the village historical records, which seriously pissed the blonde cage off. Knowing that Homura and Kaharu were somehow involved, the two advisors were taken to the INT department. Depending on who they were, some of them were difficult and others caved in immediately knowing the jig was up in exchange for a lighter sentence, or just to get out from under Donzo's thumb. They also found out that Homura and Kaharu had a part in this conspiracy. Almost immediately, and very discreetly, the two elders were placed under our arrest with their assets being seized. The daimyo looked at the man and said, Danzo Shimura, you have been brought before this tribunal to face the following charges, conspiracy against a ninja of Konoha, conspiracy to commit treason, obstruction of justice, and abuse of power. How do you plead? Danzo looked up to the daimyo and answered, not guilty. The daimyo answered, the defendant has pled not guilty. Let the record show this. The rest of the council muttered amongst themselves. The daimyo continued, you may say you are innocent, but we have plenty of evidence that go to the contrary. The man listed all the evidence provided by the trio's investigations and examinations. Obviously, the council was shocked at what they heard. They too had taken the words of the academy instructors at face value when it came to the grades. Many of them were smacking themselves for not realizing that there would be some prejudice and anger towards the boy for his burden. They were also shocked that Danzo managed to pull of all of this. Danzo was shocked to find that many of his dirty dealings had been exposed. While they were recent, they were unable to get anything damning from the past, thankfully. However, if their investigation continued it would only be a matter of time before that happened. You have heard the evidence, the daimyo said, do you have anything to say in your defense, Danzo Shimura? Danzo looked up at the daimyo, realizing that the jig was up. He growled, I did this for Konoha. Tsunade scoffed and said, working to have an innocent boy banished, or worse, and have a traitor pardoned. How was that for the good of Konoha? Danzo answered, the Kayubi Jinchuriki was becoming too powerful. The Jinchuriki was meant to be our village's main defense against the other villages and by holding the most powerful of the tailed beast, makes him our most powerful weapon. Inoichi asked, and what does the Uchiha play into this? With a huff, Danzo answered, I don't have to explain everything to you. History will know that I am right. The Jinchuriki were made to be weapons of war and they should have remained weapons of war. Jiraiya snarled, and you wonder why the second didn't nominate you for the title of Hokage. Donzo's exposed glared hatefully at Jiraiya, while his hidden Sharingan eye burned as he wished to use it. You are a sentimental fool Jiraiya. You were brainwashed by Serutobi's bleeding heart. His notions of peace made this village weak. With the nine tails as our personal weapon we would have wiped out the other villages, leaving Konoha at the top of the world, where it should be. To the others Danzo sounded like a patriot gone mad. He was not winning any allies here or anywhere else in the room. I have heard enough, the daimyo said, you have heard the evidence. What is your judgment? Those who find him guilty. Practically every hand raised in the room, innocent? No hands were raised. The verdict is set. Danzo Shimura you are hereby found guilty of all charges. You are to be sentenced to death tomorrow at 10 a.m. Court adjourned. Despite the setback, Danzo didn't go into a tangent like many of them expected. He was guided out of the room, not very gently, by the guards, he held his head high with dignity, at least the dignity a man condemned to die had. I'm glad that matter is settled, the daimyo said, now on to our next matter. The issue involving Sasuke Uchiha. As he said this, Mebuki Haruno stood up and asked, Daimyo-sama, permission to speak? The old man turned towards the woman and said, permission granted, Lady Haruno. The woman said, I understand that the boy committed treason, and the punishment for that is execution. Is there a reason he is being allowed to live? Also do we tell this information to the rest of the village? The woman wasn't trying to keep the treacherous boy alive, she had merely pointing out a fact. She knew herself how the members of the village practically praised the ground the Uchiha walked on because of his status as a member of one of Konoha's founding clans. If the Uchiha was executed there would likely be a riot, which could put people in danger. The daimyo said, I understand your concerns, Lady Haruno. However, this is not up for discussion. Inoichi, please share with us what you learned from the Uchiha's mind. Inoichi stepped forward and said, First, Sasuke Uchiha was not kidnapped as many of the civilians would like to believe. He left willingly. 
After examining the memories of that mission from the retrieval team members, Choji Akamichi, Rock Lee, Neji Hayuga, Shikamaru Nara, and Kiba Inazuka, we learned that Sasuke had apparently gone for power, as he was seen, by Rock Lee, briefly in a transformed state like the members of the now deceased Sound Ninja. The members of the Shinobi Council were mumbling amongst themselves. After hearing that, it was obvious that the Uchiha was a traitor to the village, especially since he went to that monster Orochimaru. Mebuki Haruno sighed mentally from her seat. She had heard of how Sasuke was some prodigy amongst the remains of his clan, but she didn't see it. When her daughter was growing up she had heard of how he was some great student, and it seemed that was true. However, she saw him and how cold he was. It honestly made her afraid of what would happen if he did marry her daughter. Now she just hoped that what happened after this would snap her daughter out of this love-struck fool phase she was in. Inoichi continued, Also by examining Sasuke's most recent memories I learned that the tales of Naruto accessing the Kyubi's chakra was in fact true, but it was only after Sasuke willingly activated his curse seal. Naruto's fight was clearly a fight to survive, not an attempt to murder him like Danzo tried to make it look like. The daimyo nodded and said, In light of this, I believe death would be too swift for him. That is why I am having him sent to the blood prison, however, I understand many of you are for the usual punishment of execution. The council members were split on the punishment at this point. While many of them wanted Sasuke to be executed they could also see the reason for this. Sasuke, like many in Uchiha before him, prided himself on his Sharingan. Doing this would no doubt be a far more fitting punishment and could see the reasons. The daimyo said, with that in mind we shall bring it to a vote. All for Sasuke Uchiha's execution? Sume and Mebuki both raised their hands. Now those set for life imprisonment? Hiyashi, Shibi, Inoichi, Shuza, and Shikaku all raised their hands. The daimyo said, The motion is carried. Sasuke shall be placed in Hazuka Castle, for the rest of his days. Inoichi Yamanaka, you are to immediately begin scouring Sasuke Uchiha's mind. Pull every secret from the Sound Village and wipe out all things he knows from Konoha. Are there any other matters we must discuss? It was at this point that Hiyashi asked, What is to be done about to Uzumaki boy? Is he to be put in the bingo book? The daimyo said, After looking things over, it was decided that Naruto fled out of fear for his own safety. He will not be put in the bingo book as he has performed no great crime. However, if he should be encountered the shinobi should attempt to reason with him and convince him to return. We must keep this quiet, however, as we cannot let the other villages get wind that we have lost our Jinchuriki. The others nodded in understanding. It was clear Naruto left because he believed that there was no other way to get away from those who wanted to control him and had sent the group of ninjas after him. Plus, without their resident Jinchuriki, the phrase sounding odd on their tongues, some of the other villages might become emboldened. As the group filed out, they didn't notice that they had an unwanted visitor. Up in the corner of the room, a small object sat on the corner, hidden from view. The object was spider-like in shape and had a large camera set up on its back. The camera was on a ball joint allowing it to move around. It was also camouflaged, making it appear invisible. Back on the moon with Merlin and Naruto, the main screen in Merlin's base showed the image of the trial to the Galvin and human. Naruto just stared in shock at seeing the trial and was surprised to see Tsunade take charge of things alongside the daimyo, Jiraiya, and Inoichi. And they say there isn't anything good on TV these days. Merlin mumbled as he took a bite out of what looked like a bug. I figured out about the trial through my spy drones. I had a feeling you would want to watch, Naruto. The blonde in turn nodded and asked, Thanks. At least I know that not everyone turned on me. There is one thing I don't understand though. Why would that Danzo guy try this? I mean, I know that a lot of people hate me because of the fur ball, but why? Merlin sighed and said, Truth be told. It is hard to understand motives. In Donzo's case, it was for power. He saw a chance for his village to become great and eternal with the power of the Nine Tails and he went with it. Damn whatever consequences there might have been. You need to understand that there are people like that Naruto. Those who will throw away their comrades and allies for power, money, or any number of things. But worse are those who have no meaning behind their actions. They only want to watch the world burn. Naruto shuddered at the thought and nodded. Orochimaru had experimented on humans to get power and betrayed his village. Sasuke joined him in his quest for revenge. Danzo had been a puppet master. So, what does this mean for you boy? Merlin asked. 
Do you intend to return to your village now that you know that Danzo was behind it all? Naruto sighed and said, I don't know, Keiru sensei. After everything that's happened, I don't know if I should go back to Konoha or not. The amphibian alien nodded and said, Don't worry, Naruto. When the time comes, you'll know what to do, and don't call me Keiru. Naruto chuckled a bit at the alien and took a bite out of the bar he was eating. Naruto immediately blanched and gagged slightly. He looked the bar over and said, I know these bars are supposed to be nutritious, but do they have to taste so bad? Merlin moved towards his own meal and said, Well, if you have problems with that, maybe you should have some of mine. Upon seeing a collection of what appeared to be dried up old bugs, Naruto immediately denied it. No thanks, I'm good, Naruto said quickly before taking another bite out of the awful tasting bar. Naruto mentally wept and thought, I miss Ichiraku. Five months since Naruto had left the village. Five months since he was taken off planet by the Galvan known as Merlin. Things had changed all over the place. First, we will be sending out vision towards Naruto and see how his training is coming. On the Elemental Nation's moon, Merlin's secret base. Naruto grunted as he pushed up a heavy set of dumbbells, weighed a good amount greater than what a normal human could lift. He was currently shirtless with a good amount of sweat forming on his body, showing off the good amount of muscle his body had gained from both his life as a ninja, and from his training with the banished Galvan. In the five months that had passed, Naruto had undergone a strict diet, mostly consisting of those horrible nutrient bars, as well as a strict physical training including weights, cardio, and all kinds of physical exercises. When Naruto wasn't training with his body, he was training with his mind. Naruto was put in front of a computer that would help train his strategic thinking, memory, and other parts of his brain. At times Merlin would combine these with a special training room that allowed him to combine the two. However, it was somewhat limited due to a lack of resources on Merlin's part. However, he had plenty of drones for Naruto to spar against. Another change, was Naruto's training in chakra and jutsu. Using the same cameras used to spy on the trail of Danzo, Merlin used the to spy on the training of certain members of certain villages, using what they scanned for their training to add to Naruto's training. Naruto also managed to learn a few extra techniques from the hidden water, hidden sand, and hidden cloud villages. There was also a slight problem that had come up with the whole, alien thing. Some of the technology went right over Naruto's head, and left him very confused. Naruto was also introduced to powerful weapons and tools that could rival certain jutsu and could cause a lot of damage. It also helped hammer home just how small in the universe that his species were. Naruto let out a grunt as he let down. Naruto set down his weights. Grabbing what looked like a canteen he drank the cold liquid, feeling the refreshing beverage go down his throat, quenching his thirst. Naruto, the voice of Merlin said, over the intercom system. Come down to the lab, please. I have some things I want to show you. Naruto stood up, dried himself off with a towel, and put on a shirt. He then exited the exercise room and walked down the corridor. After a few minutes, he arrived at the banished Galvin's lab. The former member of Konoha entered the lab. The lab itself wasn't as impressive as some of the flashier ones around the universe. There were a few tables filled with different gadgets and experiments that the man had been working on. There were a few other things, including a refrigerator like device no doubt for storing chemicals and other things needed to be kept cool. There were also several warnings on the object, reading, danger, and, do not touch, and a more recently added one read, this includes you, Naruto. Naruto rolled his eyes. He turned to the side and finally landed his eyes on Merlin. The banished Galvin was currently sitting at a computer, typing as fast as his tiny hands could, numbers, equations, and all kinds of technical mumbo-jumbo reflected in his eyes. He was mumbling to himself, making sure that everything would go perfectly for what was about to transpire. As the Galvan was completely entranced in his work, Naruto glanced around. Nearby the computer that the man was typing on, there was a type of bed, resembling, what looked like, a high-tech tanning bed. Naruto glanced in another direction and saw Merlin's workbench. There were several items and objects on it that looked incredibly sophisticated. Naruto saw a glass ball hooked up to his bunch of wires with a hand in it. Occasionally, the wires would flash with electricity and the hand would morph. First become covered in orange fur, with thick black claws, then turning rough and red, and then turning into sharp dark brown and covered in scales. Naruto removed his eyes from the strange sight at a few other things. Naruto saw what looked like the beginning of a gauntlet, 
primarily black with a few pieces of orange here and there. There were also a few devices that resembled the grenades that he had seen used, a few high-tech guns, knives, and swords. They all looked half-finished, however. Before Naruto could finish his examination, the sound of a throat being cleared got his attention. He turned around to see Merlin looking at him with a quirked eyebrow. Are you done? he asked. Naruto shrugged and said, Hey, excuse me if I'm a bit curious. I've never been allowed in your lab before. Merlin sighed and said, Those aren't finished. So, please, don't touch anything at all. Naruto nodded. While in his stay, Merlin had shown him a few times when greatly advanced technology, wound up in the hands of species that were considered to have low-level technology. He had seen people incinerated by their own weapons, and Naruto decided that it would be best to leave all the tinkering to the alien genius. So, what did you call me down for here, boss? Naruto asked crossing his arms. Merlin answered, Naruto, over the past few months, you've improved a good amount, and you've adapted well to the technology I have here. As such, I believe it is time for the next step. Merlin went over the computer and punched in a few keys. After a few moments, the image of a small machine appeared. It looked like a ball, glowing dark blue, with a few black pegs coming out of it. What is that? Naruto asked, slightly confused, and in wonderment. These, Merlin answered, are nanites, or if you want to use a different name, nanobots. These are microscopic machines, so small that even a huge colony of millions would be hard to see. It is these machines that will make you a greater warrior. Naruto looked incredibly interested. How is that? Naruto asked. Merlin smiled and said, These nanites shall be injected into your body. Once inside, they will begin the process of enhancing your body. Your strength will be greater, faster, it may even affect your chakra system, making it stronger, if I am correct. According to my numbers, it should even increase those regenerative powers of course. Naruto looked excited for a moment, then he thought of something. What about the fox? What if it wound up becoming stronger? Naruto immediately flashed back to when Jiraiya tried messing with the seal during their training trip. His memories of what happened that day after the seal was loosened, but the outcome was clear as day. Jiraiya had multiple second-degree burns, some bordering on third-degree burns, a few broken ones, and was suffering from chakra exhaustion. Naruto himself had suffered from several burns. Naruto remembered walking past the field where it happened. There were several knocked over trees, craters, and scorched earth. Merlin saw his scared face and immediately added, Judging by how the seal separates your chakra from the nine tails, they shouldn't be any effect on the nine tails. Naruto let out a sigh of relief. However, there is another feature, Merlin said with a smile. These nanites are connected to a special system that regulates the various DNA that I have connected over the years. With these, you will be able to transform yourself into various alien species. Naruto whistled and said, Wow. So how does this work? Do you just take a needle and inject me or something? Merlin lost his smile and answered, Unfortunately, no if you were a human of Earth this would be that easy. However, the nanites will need time to adjust to your body. They will need time to adjust your personal chakra network as well as your DNA. By my calculations, this process, while painless, will take a long time. Naruto blinked and asked, How long exactly? Merlin answered, by my calculations, 12 hours. Naruto blinked and asked, 12 hours? With all the advanced technology, I thought this wouldn't take so long. Merlin answered, well, this may be advanced by your standards, however, by Galvin's standards it is pretty behind. Naruto sighed as he reminded, once again, that Merlin was not at the height of his technological prowess. So, what do I have to do? Naruto asked, raising an eyebrow. The diminutive genius smiled and said, Well, all you have to do is lay down in the pod here. He motioned to the machine that resembled a tanning bed. He continued, Once you lay down, the device will put you to sleep and the nanites will be injected into the body. Naruto nodded and said, Okay, let's do it. The pod opened revealing an interior, with a spot hollowed out in the shape of a human body. The inside of it looked like circuitry, with a glowing green color, with black and gold lines running through it. Naruto laid down into the pod. The lid shut, and a bright glow filled Naruto's vision. Outside of the pod, Merlin went over to his computer and began typing into the various numbers and commands. Inside the pod, Naruto felt his consciousness waver, and he finally fell asleep. Merlin then continued typing. 
The screen showed a shape of a human body, outlined in green, and slowly filling up with a bright green color. Subject. Naruto Uzumaki. Consciousness diminishing. 80%, 50%, 0.10%. Consciousness reduced. Beginning nanite infusion. Scanning systems. Probability of error, within permissible limits. Commencing nanite infusion. As this was shown, it showed a timer, revealing a clock. 11 hours 59 minutes and 39 seconds, indicating 11 hours, 59 minutes, and 39 seconds. The diminutive scientist sighed and said, Okay, now I just need to pass the time. He walked over to another fridge, this one had a sticker with the word, food, written on it. He reached in and pulled out a jar full of, what looked like, cockroaches, and canned drink, just the right size for him. He walked over to his lab table. He sat up, popped open the can, taking a sip, and then munched on a roach before he began setting to work. He had 12 hours and he was going to use it. On the planet's surface, Konoha, Tsunade sighed as she finished up a set of paperwork. She leaned back in her chair, allowing the sense of accomplishment to wash over her. After a few moments, she turned and looked out the window over her village. It had been five months since Naruto left the village, leaving behind his friends and comrades. To her, and several others, after Naruto left it was like there was a cloud over the village, like a large ray of sunshine had been blocked off. Despite the peaceful way the village looked, a lot of people looked like they were walking on eggshells, and for good reasons. A reason that had happened, a few days after Naruto left. Flashback begin, four months, and twenty-nine days ago, Tsunade stood above the bound form of Danzo. Nearby was Jiraiya, who stood nearby, glaring at the warhawk who had conspired against the village's resident prankster and diamond in the rough. They were currently in the arena that was normally used for the Chunin exam finals. The villagers were currently watching with rapt attention. The members of the shinobi clans had serious looks on their faces, especially the members of the Konoha rookies, who had been under the old man's genjutsu. The civilians however, were confused as to why one of the Hokage's personal advisors was currently in chains. People of Konoha, Suande announced, a small microphone on her ear, we have gathered here today to witness to the execution of Danzo Shimura, for acts and conspiracy to commit treason against the village of Konoha. Whispers of shock and surprise, ran through the villagers who weren't part of Danzo's trial. Up in the stands, Kazashi Haruno feigned surprise. He had a feeling something was wrong when his wife was called in for a council meeting and he was not. Immediately, he began an operation putting up a few people as patsies so that he would get off without being noticed. Thankfully, with all the other people being secretly taken down for crimes against Konoha it worked. He was currently sitting next to his wife and daughter, both of which seemed glad to hear the news. Tsunade stood before the man and said, Any last words before you meet your maker? Danzo spat and said, Everything I have done was for the good of Konoha. The Nine Tails was meant to be our weapon, and you foolishly lost him because of your bleeding heart. You are just as pathetic as that fool, Hirazan. Unfortunately, the statement about the village's resident Jinchuriki was heard and a small uprising began in the village. This is all about the demon brat. The kid should have been given to Danzo years ago. She's killing a patriot of the village because of some brat. Other such calls came up from those who were blinded by prejudice towards the boy, but were not part of the conspiracy. The only member of the conspiracy who wasn't talking was Kazashi. Who knew it would be best to keep quiet? The shinobi members of the village were currently. Jiraiya stepped up, a microphone like Tsunade's on his head, and yelled, Shut up! The sound of the shout, plus the enraged look on his face. You know, over the past few days, I've gathered a lot of information on what has been going on around this village, and I am beyond sickened with how my village has fallen. Seeing as you all seem to live in your own personal bubbles when it comes to reality, it is time to finally pop it. Those listening were now surprised, and a sudden feeling of nervousness flooded the arena. Jiraiya said, the supposed failure, was sabotaged early on by teachers who wished to keep him weak and malleable. As for the potential to lose control, here is a little bit of information you should all know. The only way for a Jinchuriki to be influenced by the beast sealed inside of him, is for his mind to break. In other words, if he had been given to Danzo like you're all so blindly suggest, there was a good chance the little self-fulfilling prophecy you all made would come true. Many of the civilians all looked shocked at this information. In the stands, Aruka suddenly realized why many of his co-workers hadn't shown up for work the past couple of days. 
He also felt guilty as he realized he had allowed his own prejudice blind him when it. Jiraiya continued, as for your precious Sasuke, he is being hauled off to prison. And before you say anything, we checked his mind, and he had no intention of ever returning to the village. There is also the fact that he suffered from severe PTSD, that resulted in his currently mentality. Something that the elders kept from the populace, so they could push forward their agendas. Looks of absolute surprise went through the villagers. Many who were hoping to have the Uchiha wed their daughters, but weren't part of the conspiracy, were suddenly filled with dread, at the thought of Sasuke being anywhere near their daughters. Jiraiya then decided to go ahead and pop the final bubble they had surrounding them. He glanced at Tsunade with a questioning expression, she nodded. As for Naruto being an orphan, he said, he is no such thing. His full name, was Naruto Uzumaki Namikaze. Everyone in the village looked shocked upon hearing that. Everyone recognized the name of their beloved Yandaimi and many of them were now kicking themselves for not noticing it before. Mebuki groaned in frustration as she now realized the name. She didn't associate Naruto with her old friend as he had blonde hair, and now she was kicking herself for not realizing it sooner. He even had the same verbal tick. Down in the arena, Suande felt that Donzo's execution had been held off long enough and walked forward. Chakra formed around her fist as she raised it into the air. Without a moment of hesitation, she brought her fists down with earth-shaking strength. When the ground stopped shaking Donzo's body wasn't even recognizable. However, a gasp of shock ran through those present as his body faded into mist, leaving only the bindings that were used to hold him. Jiraiya's danger sense went off, just in time as a large group of Anbu, all wearing blank masks. Danzo growled as he stood up, flexing his crippled arm, causing the braces to fall off revealing multiple eyes embedded into it, as well as some strange discoloration. I see now, Danzo said, unsheathing his cane, a slightly unhinged tone in his voice, I see that I can't control things from the shadows anymore. If I wish to have what is owed to me, then I will take it. Flashback end, Tsunade sighed to herself as she remembered the following fight. Danzo was much stronger than she originally believed. The man made incredible use of the implanted Sharingan eyes, which acted like a big middle finger to the deceased Uchiha clan. However, the fight didn't exactly go in his favor, having apparently underestimated how much the people would fight. In the end Danzo lost a good amount of his forces, and was forced to retreat. He wound up using a few of his root Anbu as meat shields to protect himself while he ran. Afterwards, the Anbu continued to fight until they were dead or captured. Immediately afterwards, Tsunade sent a new file towards the daimyo to add a new criminal to the bingo book, Danzo Shimura. He was a high S rank bounty with a kill on sight order. She also made sure to Danzo's crimes, thought she made sure to keep what knowledge he knew that could be used against them. She didn't want anyone taking the risk of Danzo taking over their village. Naruto wasn't officially put into the bingo book himself. However, it was considered an ongoing mission to bring Naruto back. It was considered a high A rank mission given his importance. If anyone were to ask, Tei would respond that Naruto was a person of interest in a high profile case. To make things worse, nearly a day afterwards, Sasuke's transport to the blood prison was intercepted and attacked. She quickly dispatched a group of Anbu to deal with the problem. However, it seemed that I wasn't needed as when they arrived Sasuke was found tied up and ready to be imprisoned. Tsunade smirked as she remembered that part of her and Jiraiya's plan. During the trawing trip, Naruto had apparently mentioned how easy it was to steal the Forbidden Scroll. After that he and Naruto came up with a special seal to be used on it, dubbed the Cerberus Lock Seal. The seal was a special lock, which could only be opened using the distinct chakra of three people. In the case of the scroll, the Hokage and her advisors, if someone tried to use their own chakra, it would turn against them resulting in a crippling injury and letting out a loud siren-like sound. After Inoichi, wiped all the ninja training, from advanced to academy lessons, from Sasuke's mind, Jiraiya applied a version of the seal that could only be opened by his, Inoichi's, and Tsunade's chakra. If someone tried to undo it, the seal would obliterate Sasuke's chakra network. Suande smiled to herself, wishing she could have seen the look on the cycloptic war hawk's face when he found that all his manipulating for Sasuke's behalf had all but failed. Soon after, Sasuke was escorted to the blood prison where he was locked up. Even after all that there was still some hard work after that. It took Jiraiya nearly a month to crack the seals that were on the root members' tongues, and it took Inoichi nearly two to crack through the mental conditioning, or as she called it, 
brainwashing, on the root members. After that they group need to be assimilated into the village, which was rather difficult given how they were shut-ins and weren't very social adapted, but they were adapting quickly. With their brainwashing mostly undone, Danzo's bases were found and exposed. They found out about how Danzo had Itachi murder the Uchiha clan, and how he worked with Orochimaru. Suande had been furious when she found out that Danzo had transferred Sharingan eyes into his arms, but also cells from her grandfather. After that, Danzo's bounty almost double overnight. Tsunade sighed once again before looking out over her village. After the truth of Naruto's parentage came out, several of the civilians were expressing remorse for their actions. Though a few were upset that they had missed out a potential cash cow, the greedier ones anyway, but they made sure not to say such thoughts out loud. However, things got crazier when word of Naruto's burden spread out as well. The children who had mocked Naruto or listened to their parents to ostracize him, now looked at them with disdain for telling them something without getting all the facts. A lot of parents lost the respect of their kids that day. Other groups that were affected was the main Konoha shinobi. Kakashi had gone into a depression, by not only not recognizing his sensei's son, but because he had failed so epically. He had officially become an outcast among some of his fellow shinobi and had been demoted to Chunin. And once he got his rank back, if he got it back, he was forbidden from teaching a team again. Shino and Shikamaru were both upset that they hadn't seen the relationship between the two sooner. Hanada became slightly depressed as he realized she could have done more when she was a child. It also hardened her reserve to come out of her shell more. The others now respected Naruto even more, realizing what he went through trying to keep the great beast at bay. However, out of all of them, the one who seemed to be taking things the hardest was Sakura. The Rosette had here entire world shattered after learning of Sasuke's true nature, and of Naruto's burden and how it affected him throughout his life. Sakura regretted every time she punched Naruto just for asking her out, and every time she called him an idiot. Her own self-image as the top kunoichi of the year had always prevented her from seeing how Naruto had grown stronger and more mature, if only just barely, over the years. Tsunade was pulled from her thoughts about the recent events by the sound of the window opening. Turning towards the noise she sought he familiar sight of Jiraiya coming in through the window. Can't you ever use the door, pervert? She asked, with a raised eyebrow. Jiraiya smiled as he said, and not be able to keep you on your toes, princess? Tsunade smiled to herself, glad that Jiraiya could keep up his attempts to cheer her up. So, any news from your spy network? She asked. Jiraiya's smile quickly became serious as he said, well, first off. Sasuke had just recently become a member of solitary confinement in the blood prison. So, I guess we won't be hearing anything about that for a while. After Donzo's attempt to grab Sasuke from the prison transport, they decided it was best to keep an eye on the boy. Apparently, the harsh reality of prison and no chakra was not doing well for the boy. Now, moving on to more important matters, Jiraiya said, the Akatasuki organization hasn't moved in a while, since Naruto's disappearance. My guess is that they are waiting for a concrete location on the boy before they make their move on the rest of the Jinchuriki. My sources still haven't been able to confirm as to why they are after them, however. Tsunade nodded. A man fitting Donzo's description was reported being spotted near the hidden rain village, but it has yet to be confirmed if it is in fact him. Tsunade rubbed her chin in thought. What would Danzo want with the hidden rain village? Jiraiya's look took on a somber tone, and unfortunately, no one has seen hide nor hair of Naruto or the mysterious man who saved him from the retrieval team and the Akatsuki members. Tsunade sighed, dejectedly. It had been almost five months and there had been no sign of the orange-clad knucklehead anywhere. She was starting to wonder if he had been killed. Jiraiya, seeing her upset, walked over and gave her a small hug. Don't worry, Tsunade, he said soothingly, we'll find him. Suande simply sighed and leaned into the hug after making sure Jiraiya's hands were staying in the appropriate zones of course. Meanwhile, in the hidden rain village, Danzo was starting to curse himself for not planning so far ahead if his plans had been discovered. After escaping his execution, he ran for it. However, his assets were frozen in the village and only a handful of his root anbu came with him. His first act was to make sure Sasuke didn't get sent to jail, hoping to use the boy as a puppet. However, he quickly realized that was a mistake as Sasuke had his chakra sealed away and he couldn't undo it. If that wasn't enough, he had bounty hunters on his trail trying to collect the bounty put on his head. Because of these attacks, 
Danzo had lost his remaining soldiers and he couldn't risk going near the village to get more. Not to mention, the money had had saved in case he need to move from the village was running low. He couldn't risk going to the major villages, as they would no doubt be privy to his necessary actions back in Konoha. So, now he was in a village that would probably not know of his crimes. One that hadn't been a part of any alliances for a very long time. So now, Danzo stood before the cage of the hidden rain village. The orange-haired man, with piercings in his nose, and strange eyes looked at him, with a blank expression. You wish for us to take you into the village? Payne's diva path asked, as he looked at the man. Unknown to Danzo, the Akatsuki's own spy network had found out about Danzo's crimes and they had no doubt that he would try to play the master manipulator here. Yes, Danzo answered, I have knowledge that could be very useful to you. The path looked at him for a moment and said, I'm sorry, but I cannot allow an S-rank criminal into my village, or can I even begin to trust that one who is as manipulative as you to keep your word? Danzo's visible eye narrowed. He activated the Sharingan eye behind his bandages to try and control the man. This proved to be a huge mistake. In puffs of smoke, the Prada and Naraka paths appeared. The Prada path grabbed Danzo's face tearing off the bandages covering his stolen eye. The chakra was ripped from his eye, ending the potential genjutsu. The Naraka path then grabbed Danzo by the neck and hauled him into the air. Danzo found himself paralyzed. With a simple thought, the Naraka path performed a summoning, bringing out a large pale head with bizarre eyes and surrounded by dark purple flames. The head opened its mouth and a tendril shot out, connecting with Donzo's back. Donzo's eyes, real and implanted became blank. Now then, the diva path said, tell us everything that you know. Danzo proceeded to spill his guts about everything. How many he had, his money, his contact with Orochimaru, even the specialized dead man sealed to the hat on his chest. Thanks to the Naraka path, nothing was kept secret. With that done, the diva path grew a black rod from his hand and proceeded to swing, severing Donzo's head, from his body. The Prada path then proceeded to drain every drop of chakra from the man, preventing the use of the powerful seal he had on his chest. Pain Sama, a voice said. Everyone turned to see Zetsu standing on the windowsill. I sensed something strange, what has, oh. The plant man calmed down upon seeing the dead form of Danzo. Then he cocked his head to the side and asked, Who is that? The extension of Nagato's will answered, Just a fool thinking he could manipulate a god. You may consume him if you want. If pain wasn't so good at hiding his emotions, he would have ripped Danzo apart. As it turns out, he had helped Hanzo the Salamander years ago during the Shinobi War and had been perfectly fine with ruining the lives of several people. If he wasn't so good at hiding his emotions, he would have destroyed the man on the spot, with not even ashes being left. However, he felt more content to see man who thought himself untouchable being used as food for Zetsu. The plant man got down from the window and walked over. He sniffed a bit and said, nah, too old. He'll be too chewy. Plus, insanity leaves a terrible aftertaste. The paths had to suppress a shudder as the plant man said this. Throw the body away then, the diva path said. I do not wish to dirty my office with such filth longer than necessary. Zetsu leaned down and examined the body for a moment. Suddenly, a disturbing grin spread across the man's face, well the white half of it anyway. I think I might have an idea for that, Zetsu said, gaining the attention of the paths. Naruto grunted as he pulled himself up, his chin hovering over the top of the pull-up bar, three very large, very heavy weights attached to his legs. Under normal circumstances, this probably wouldn't be much a workout for a ninja in training. However, the weights were far more than they seemed. Each weight had a special gravity control device set up in them. With the push of a button, the weight could be increased and decreased. That's enough Naruto, Merlin said from his position on the side, pressing a few keys on his holographic clipboard, set yourself down. Naruto then let go and hit the ground, causing the entire room to shake. Naruto let out a breath of relief as he rolled his shoulders, making them pop. How was that? The boy asked as she grabbed a towel to wipe the sweat from his face. The amphibian genius answered, that was 90 reps with 50 tons of weight. It looks like the augmentation system the nanites have given you is working well. Naruto smiled at this, that was at least 10 more tons since last month. It had been 4 months since Naruto had gotten the nanite upgrade to his body. After Naruto woke up, he admitted that he didn't really feel any different. 
That ended when Naruto tried to stand up and accidentally launched himself across the room like he was running at full speed. It was at that point Naruto realized just how strong the armor made him and what he could do with it. However, there was an unforeseen problem. When Naruto tried to transform like Merlin said he could, the boy found out that he couldn't. Merlin went through the systems and found that the DNA he had collected, the very few samples he had, had been corrupted. With the DNA unstable, the nanites wouldn't allow Naruto to use them, as part of a safety protocol. Merlin and the Naruto had been upset, but Merlin was a problem solver. Instead of having Naruto focus on his transformation, he had Naruto go through some physical training to regain control of his strength. It had taken almost a month for him to get it under control and since then Naruto had been working on different for Naruto to use, apparently armor and weapons. In the meantime, while Merlin worked, Naruto got to work testing out his enhanced body. The nanites in his muscles enhanced his strength. They also worked in his bones, making them denser. This in turn made Naruto heavier, but his enhanced strength meant it didn't hurt. The nanites in Naruto's brain also played a role in his enhancement, supercharging the neurons in his brain and allowing him to process information more quickly. With these made known, Merlin adjusted Naruto's style to include more powerful blows and counters. Merlin jotted down some information and said, Naruto, I think it is time we move on to the next part of your training. Come with me to the shooting range. I have a few more toys to add to your collection. Naruto smiled as he chugged down a bottle of water and followed the amphibian alien. The two walked down the corridor until they arrived at the shooting range. By Galvin standards it was simple. A spot to stand with various targets to shoot at. There was also a scoreboard with Naruto's name on it, and a high number next to it. There was a table covered in a tarp, but Naruto could make out several different objects on it. Naruto pulled the tarp off revealing a pack of kanai, shuriken, and senbon needles. Merlin smiled and said, I see you found them. Since you're most comfortable with these, I figured I'd make some upgrades to them. These kanai have special blades, that when activated, can vibrate at an ultra-high frequency, loosening molecular bonds and enabling them to pierce and cut through anything. I have the same setting for the shuriken. Naruto then asked, What about the senbon needles, they aren't exactly good for tearing through people. He said, I know. These senbon needles don't vibrate. However they rotate light small drills, enabling greater piercing power. These are mainly used for immobilizing targets. Naruto whistled and said, Okay, I'm impressed. Merlin smiled and said, Now, all you have to do is transfer a small amount of chakra into the tools to activate them, then let the fly. Naruto picked up one of the shuriken, bouncing it in his hand slightly to test the weight, finding that it was, in fact, lighter than the ones he was used to. Naruto then turned and swung his arm, unleashing the shuriken, without activating it. The weapon struck the target, but it bounced off, leaving only a few small dents. Naruto then picked up another shuriken, this time activating it. The edges began to glow and vibrate, the only stationary part was in the center. The enhanced blonde then brought it up to his ear and he could hear the vibrating, the low hum of the blades echoing in his ears. Naruto then proceeded to throw the shuriken with incredible accuracy and struck the center of the target, it tore through it easily, as if it had been loaded up with wind chakra. This made Naruto wonder what would happen if he used another type of chakra. Naruto proceeded to repeat this process, sending the projectiles, quickly getting used to the weapons. Naruto, in the end, was impressed by the weapons. Naruto then turned his head and asked, So what else have you been working on? Merlin answered, Well, I have been working on some new weapons, but I've run into a few setbacks. That being finding a suitable power core that won't overload. Naruto looked confused and asked, You mean you can't figure out how to make the battery? Merlin answered, Good attempt, but no you see, the cores have attempted to make for more advanced weaponry for you have failed badly because they were unstable. If used for extensive periods of time, such as in combat the cores would overheat, and then explode. Naruto said, Good reason. Merlin said, yes, well, for now Naruto, go relax. Take a nap or something. I'll figure something out. Naruto nodded and prepared to head for his quarters to take a little nap. Merlin, however, was a little bit upset. There had been setback after setback when working with Naruto. If he were back on Galvin, this wouldn't be happening. Okay it might be happening, but at least not as much. Without the DNA transformation Naruto was going to need powerful weapons if he were to go against Ben Tennyson, 
not to mention others if they found out what Naruto was and wanted the technology for themselves. Images of an alien with a squid-like head and tentacles for a beard formed in his mind and made him shudder. He may not have been in the loop with the other Galvins, but even he knew of the atrocities that Vilgax had done in the past. If Naruto were to run into him now, he wouldn't stand a chance. Merlin sighed as he made his way out of the range and started towards his workshop. He glanced at the busted cores and then at an object covered in a tarp near the back wall. The alien sighed as he thought about this constant in his life. Ever since he was banished from Galvin Prime he hadn't had some of the necessary resources to bring his technology to his fullest. He sighed and then set back to work. As with many of his project, Merlin lost how much time he spent in his workshop. However, he was cut off from his work, when the moon suddenly shook. Merlin let out a cry of shock as he was suddenly knocked off his stool and fell backwards. Naruto shot up out of his bed and yelled, Earthquake, no wait, moonquake. Naruto looked around and stopped panicking when he realized that nothing was happening. He then shot up and ran down the hall to find Merlin's workshop. The enhanced blonde burst into the room and was shocked to find Merlin on the ground. You okay, Merlin? Naruto asked, raising an eyebrow. The Galvin said, Yes, I'm fine. Just a little shaken up. Naruto said, Yeah, I didn't know that the moon could shake like that. Merlin answered, It doesn't. Something crashed nearby. Come with me. Merlin then proceeded to hop onto his hover pad and made his way back to the surveillance room. The minuscule alien hopped into his chair and began to type away at the keyboard. Outside a drone, this one being round with a large camera on it, flew up and flew towards the source of the crash. The image was fed back to the computer. The image showed the barren moon and star-filled sky for a few moments before they saw it. What crashed wasn't a large rock, like Merlin though it would be. It was a ship, or a building, rectangular shaped and dark gray in color. There were multiple dark blue bars on the sides, and multiple dark blue circles, that resembled incomplete pie graphs. It was also heavily damaged. There were massive cracks in the metal exterior, large dents going inward and outward, but the biggest site of destruction seemed to be near the rear of the machine, where a huge hole had been blown in the hull, metal bent up and outwards. While the machine was new to Naruto, it was something that Merlin had seen before. I don't believe it, the banished Galvin said, his eyes wide, Atachaden factory? All the way out here? Naruto looked confused. What's a Atachaden? A race of geniuses, like you? Merlin shook his head and said, No, you see, Tekadens are like the drones that I built. However, they are made for one purpose, and one purpose only, combat. The Tekadens use nanites, like the kind I injected into you, only they use a different version to repair damage, and have a multitude of weapons. They are also capable of adapting to different opponents. To put it simply, you can't kill a Techaden the same way twice. Naruto nodded and said, So like your drones, but on steroids, wait, does that mean they aren't as smart? Merlin nodded and said, You're learning boy. Yes, for a Techaden to adapt, their predecessor must be destroyed. Plus, from what I heard, they are programmed to only go after one target, and can be easily tricked. Naruto filed that information away for later. Thought. I must admit, I am curious, Merlin said, their creators don't have a reason to send them out to this part of space. Naruto asked, What do you mean? Merlin explained, The Techaden creators, known simply as the Masters, are guns for hire. They will sell any of their machines to the highest bidder. There have even been instances where a single Techaden master sold weapons to both sides of a massive civil war. Naruto said, So, they're gun runners basically. Merlin nodded and said, and that's what has me confused. In this area of space, there are no people they can sell to. They don't have a reason to be here. So, what is a Techaden factory doing out here in the middle of nowhere? Do you think that the drone might be able to get in? Naruto asked. Merlin typed in a few keys and sent the drone to move towards the machine. When it got into specific range, however, one of the circles on the side of the factory, opened and a large cannon-like apparatus came out. Moments later, the drone was blasted into smithereens, leaving only static on the screen. Well, that was a total bust, Naruto said after a few moments of silence. Indeed, Merlin said. So, what are we going to do now? Naruto asked. Hum. Merlin hummed rubbing his chin and said, I think I have an idea. A few minutes later, airlock, Naruto now stood in the middle of the airlock. However, he was wearing something different from his normal training clothes. 
The man was wearing what looked like an advanced suit of body armor. It was primarily black, as in all black, with a few pieces of white on the shoulders, shins, knees. On his left forearm, there was an object that resembled a screen, and the right forearm seemed to be a little bit thicker than the other. Naruto's head was covered in a black helmet. The face was covered by a one-way glass, with special covering to keep his eyes from being damaged by ultraviolet rays in space. On his waist what a dark gray belt, with a pack on the left and right side, for easy reach, one pouch had HF Kanai, and the other had HF Shuriken. To finish up the look, there was a jetpack on his back. Naruto examined himself and said, his voice was fused with a small amount of static from the speaker of the suit, okay, this is new. Suddenly a voice said, Naruto, Naruto, can you hear me? The boy answered, loud and clear, Merlin. Good, now what you are wearing is an enhanced suit of combat armor, Merlin said. The suit is based off special exploration suits meant for exploring dangerous areas filled with lethal radiation, extreme temperatures, and vicious predators. Naruto whistled and said, Nice. The Galvin was currently sitting in his chair, a screen showing Naruto's point of view, as well as levels of oxygen currently at 100%. Armor integrity at 100%, and power at 100%. Merlin said, First, we need to calibrate the suit. A few lights will light up, look towards them when they do. Naruto followed these instructions. Merlin said, This suit can take a lot of damage, but it can only take so much, so don't scratch it up too much. Also, you only have about two hours of oxygen in your suit, so please be careful with how you exert yourself. The more you exert yourself, the more oxygen you use up. Naruto said, wait so, how do I know how much oxygen I have? Merlin answered, the screen on your left arm can show you where your armor is damaged, as well as oxygen levels, and your vitals. Naruto brought up the arm and it flashed, glowing with blue light. Then it showed the various readings that Naruto had, including a heart monitor. Merlin continued, now, there are a few other systems. Your helmet comes with a special zoom function, and can switch between infrared and night vision which could be useful in case of dark areas. You can switch through these modes using the pad on your arm. Naruto brought his arm up again, and found a pair of logos near the top of the screen, the one currently selected looked like shield with a heart in it, and the one next to it looked like the picture of an eye. Naruto pressed the picture with his armored finger and saw two images appear. One was flashlight and the other was temperature. Naruto pressed the temperature button and immediately saw his vision change, Naruto saw that the area around him was mostly blue, but it was hard to see things clearly as it was slightly blurry in all blue. There was a mix of yellow, indicating a higher temperature, where the light had been turned on, and in the lights above him. He then pressed the infrared vision button again turning it off, then he turned on the night vision, only seeing pure green. Naruto said, huh, that'll come in handy. Merlin said, indeed. Now, your right arm contains a specialized grappling tether. To fire it, Simply hold out your arm, point your wrist down a bit, and clench your fist. Unclench to withdraw it. Naruto held out his arm, aiming for the wall. He did as Merlin instructed, and a slot on his arm opened, and a cable, headed in front by a drilling bit, shot out and dug into the wall of the chamber, sending sparks falling to the ground as it drilled through the material. Naruto then unclenched his fist and the rope retracted. Merlin said, Okay, now the last thing is your jetpack. Now, you only have a limited amount of fuel so be careful. Also, I would not recommend going too fast as you may shoot off into space due to the low gravity, and neither of us want that to happen. Naruto nodded and said, Okay, let's get this show on the road. Suddenly a computerized voice said, Airlock door opening. There was a sound of hissing as oxygen was pulled from the room. Then the door opened. Naruto then stepped out of the airlock and found himself standing on the source of the moon. Naruto looked out and saw, for the first time, an unblemished look at the stars and the beautiful view of his home planet. Naruto stepped out on the moon's surface and said, One small step for a ninja, one giant leap for my race. Naruto jumped up with a cry and yelled, Hey, I'm the first ninja to set foot on the moon. Take that every single teacher except for Aruka WHO thought I wouldn't amount to anything. Naruto then realized that he had jumped a little too hard and he was going to be flying off the moon's surface. Naruto quickly fired his grappling hook, pulling himself down to the moon's surface. The boy let out a breath of relief realizing that he wasn't about to start drifting off into space. The boy landed in a typical superhero pose with a cloud of moon dust picking up around him. 
If you are done messing around, Merlin's voice said, over the suit's communication system, we have a crashed ship to examine. Naruto let out an embarrassed chuckle and began running towards the crash site. Naruto found himself standing a few feet from the ship. Naruto approached, but stopped when he saw the same machine that detected the drone and shot it, came out of the factory's side. Dang it, Naruto said, so, tell me you have something that can get me in there that doesn't involve getting turned into a piece of Swiss cheese via laser surgery. Over the communications Merlin answered, yes, I said that I had a specialized stealth system put into the system. It bends ambient light around you, giving the vision of invisibility. There should be a way to activate it on your arm. Naruto brought up his arm again, and scanned the screen. He found a symbol next to the eye symbol, and found a symbol that looked like a human body. He pressed it and the image of a body formed on the screen. If that wasn't enough, he found that there were options for the body. Armor enhancements, weapon systems, which were currently faded to show that they weren't active yet, and finally, the stealth mode logo. Naruto pressed it and heard some strange sound. Naruto looked down at his hand, the same one that had the pad on it, distort before becoming invisible. He then moved it around, seeing the air distort around where he moved it, indicating where it was. Naruto then immediately moved towards the ship, walking on eggshells until he realized the gun wasn't going to shoot, he relaxed and jumped up, using his charka to stick to the surface and made his way up towards the hole in the side of the ship. Naruto looked around and saw that it was pitch black inside. The only lights coming from the holes in the ship and the lights flickering on occasion. Naruto had a sudden sense of familiarity to a scary game he played when he was younger, completely against the Sandame's wishes, and wound up having nightmares for a week. Naruto then pulled up his pad and turned on the night vision. He walked through the halls of the ship and noted the destruction around him. It wasn't just the ship's outer layer that has been blasted. There were spare parts and pieces everywhere. The walls were blasted with holes in them, huge holes, and some smaller holes clustered together, indicating rapid fire, from what Naruto's limited knowledge of firearms told him. There were also areas where large parts of the wall had been carved open, as if cut by a blade. Dang what happened here? Naruto asked, and where are all the people? Shouldn't a factory have workers? Merlin answered, in this case know the Tachadan masters have fully automated factories, for easy manufacturing. However, this doesn't seem right. Naruto nodded as he found a door that hadn't been ripped open. He opened it and found it to be full of mechanical parts, all of them destroyed. Do you think one of those Tachadans might have gone rogue? Naruto asked. I doubt it, Merlin replied, they aren't supposed to be that smart. Even if they did, their masters are incredibly intelligent. No doubt they would be able to create fail safes in case such an action happens. Naruto nodded. He then heard something, metal clattering to the floor. Naruto spun around and saw nothing. Naruto let out a breath he didn't know he was holding and said, Dang, this place is getting kind of creepy. Do you think that I might be able to get the lights back on? Merlin answered, Well, I have a drone scanning the ship from a safe distance. I have a small map of the area. Keep going straight and take a right you should arrive at the main power generator. Naruto kept walking, though he was obviously on edge. He could honestly feel that something was not right around here. He kept hearing things and thought he was being followed. Naruto mentally chastised himself for acting like a little boy scared of the dark, but he was honesty creeped out. He did make sure that he was ready to throw out a kanai when he needed to. Eventually, Naruto found what he was looking for. The door had been half open, so the boy was able to pry it open with his strength. He approached it and asked, Now what? Merlin answered, A good electric charge should be able to reactivate it. Give it some juice. Naruto cracked his neck underneath his suit and approached the generator. He pressed his hands against the metal hull and a focused, sending a huge amount of lighting chakra into the device. The machine sparked as lightning arced around it. There was a moment of silence before the machine let out a loud humming noise before it sparked up and light up, glowing. Each light in the room came on and the sound of machines coming alive was heard. Naruto said, Wow, I didn't expect that to work. Wouldn't electricity be primitive? Merlin answered over the comm, No the idea was only enhanced upon and more effective ways to harness power were found. Electricity is considered a base form of power, and is still used in many species today. Now then, based on what my drone has scanned, there is a main control room near, what I believe is an assembly line. I'll guide you there. Oh, before I forget, it looks like that some of the security measures were shorted out when the system went down, 
side keep your helmet on, unless you can suddenly survive in space. Naruto walked out of the room and made his way down the now lit hallways. He was surprised to see that he could move normally now, as opposed to the nearly weightless movement that he had before. It took Naruto a few moments to realize that return of power meant the gravity generator must be working. The armored boy then made his way, following Merlin's directions and found himself in the assembly line. Though to be honesty, it was more like an assembly room. Multiple conveyor belts, or objects that resembled them, with a large area elevated above them, no doubt where the control room would be. Naruto climbed up to the control room and was shocked at what he found. It looked like there had been a fight, there was the destroyed robot laying down on the ground, a large hole in its chest. The metal warped from intense heat, and it looked like it had been on the receiving end of some serious punishment. There were also some intense burns on the wall behind it, the ceiling, and the floor. Naruto said aloud, What happened to you? A good question, Merlin's voice said over the intercom, and I think that I might have a way to do so. Give me a moment, ah, from here you should be able to turn off the outside defenses. Naruto scanned the console and quickly managed to find, something that resembled language. He couldn't read it, but thankfully there were a lot of pictures. Though there were a few snafus here and there, his first attempt he accidentally turned on the factory, which started moving around like they were building something, but they didn't have the materials, he accidentally turned off the lights, then turned them back on. On his third attempt, he heard what sounded like an engine roaring and realized he accidentally started the flight system. Thankfully, the ship was too damaged to take off. Finally, Naruto found what he was looking for and turned off the outside security measures. Moments after that, a round drone flew down from the door and entered the room. That you Merlin? Naruto asked. Yes, the minuscule alien's voice said from a speaker on the drone, now, let's see what you were working on. Several long wires moved out from the drone's sides and moved towards the console. They began moving quickly. A swarm of languages that Naruto couldn't read, went across the screen as blueprints of weapons, tools, ships, and machines. How interesting, Merlin said, from what I'm reading this was a very important research and development factory, they were made to put out prototypes for systems, weapons, and other machines. Naruto cocked his head to the side and said, a mad tyrant I knew a while back would have loved this place, heck a maniac I'm aware of right now would love this place. Indeed, Merlin said, it seems that the man in charge of this facility was working on a special project. An enhanced Tachadan soldier, damn it, some of the files were damaged. I can't pull them. I can uncorrupt them, but it would take a few minutes. Naruto then asked, do you think that he had a log? Maybe there was something there that happened. Merlin's machine started typing on the console to go through the system, before found the logs. It looks like the Tachadan master had been making logs about his progress. He pressed a button and an image formed on the screen. It was of a humanoid green alien, with red eyes and nasal cavities instead of a nose. He wore a full white dark blue bodysuit with various pockets on them. Dang that is one ugly sucker, Naruto said out loud, only for Merlin to hush him as the video began. I am developer 5. Naruto winced slightly at the cold, calculating tone. It reminded him of Itachi. Recently, one of our clients, a rather brutish individual named Vulcanus, ordered a Tachadan factory so that he may destroy an individual. A boy named Benjamin Tennyson of the planet Earth. Ben Tennyson. Merlin said, surprise evident in his voice, that's the boy who wield Azmuth's Omnitrix. Naruto looked surprised by this information and turned towards the screen. Unfortunately, our Tekadans proved ineffective as Benjamin Tennyson was able to turn our Tekadans against our client. As a result, he has terminated his agreement with us, and refuses to work with us in the future. In response, Inspector 13 went to the planet, attempting to harvest and use Benjamin Tennyson's Ultimatrix to enhance our technology, which would bring new clients. Unfortunately, this plan failed and one of our factories was taken. Naruto yawned and said, this is really fascinating, but what does all this have to do with why he is here? Merlin turned the camera on the drone to his protege and said, I think they are getting to that. With that said, Naruto quieted down as they turned back to the recording. With these developments, Executive One has put me in charge of creating a new Tachadan soldier. One that can fight and adapt, without having to be upgraded and enhanced. Not only will this save resources and money, but it will also increase productivity, with less Tekadans needlessly being destroyed. Naruto said, it looks like your brother's protege is known for causing trouble. 
You're one to talk, Mr. Prankster King. Merlin responded getting an annoyed huff from the boy. The drone then turned its attention back to the machine, he pressed fast forward and moved the logs farther along in the timeline, they settled on the developer 5. In the past three months, we have made considerable progress, though it has taken more time than we have originally believed. The nanotechnology used in the Tekadens has been enhanced with a new and improved AI system, which will help the nanotechnology adapt to enemy weapons and powers. However, this process is slow and some of the prototypes have failed. Testing shall continue until system is perfected. Merlin hit fast forward again. When developer 5 spoke again, his calm, calculating voice now held a small iota of pride and a look of accomplishment on his face. A final product has been produced at last. This new Techaden has shown a vast increase in intelligence, adapting to enemy weapons as well as extreme environmental conditions. In combat against, original Techadens it has taken down at 8 minutes and 42.5 seconds. Merlin fast forwarded again and now developer 5 looked frustrated. Sadly, the new Techaden design and system has been rejected. The amount of money and resources going into the new systems were considered too expensive for mass production. As such, I have been ordered by the executive one to eliminate the Techaden and return to the home world for further instruction. Merlin fast forwarded again, and they were both shocked by what was going on. There was the sound of laser fire, crunching metal and parts being destroyed. Developer 5 clearly panicked. While his face was still calm, you could still see some panic in his eyes. The Techaden has rebelled against us. It has learned more than we thought and knows of our attempts to destroy it. It shorted out the main power core, and Techaden production has stopped completely, and is now on its way to destroy me. However, I have noted that a low level planet sits a short distance from here. By my calculations, the factory will have just enough backup power to reach the planet, with that speed the factory will be burned into nothingness in the planet's atmosphere. All files have been loaded into backups in my suit, and I will escape via pod. There was the sound of heavy metal footfalls. The Techaden master then turned and said, Construct heavy plasma dispersion system. There was the sound of a powerful blast of energy as the video died. So, the robot got too smart for them. Naruto asked, but how did it crash into the moon and not the planet? Merlin's voice was quiet for a moment, in thought, then answered, by my guess he didn't calculate the moon getting the way. It was a one in a million chance that stopped the factory from slamming into your planet. Naruto nodded and then stopped. He heard the slight, almost imperceptible, sound of metal moving. He then asked, Hey, Merlin, were those videos shot from here? Yes, why? Naruto answered, Because I think the big bad bot is right behind us. Naruto was then proved right as Naruto was suddenly grabbed from behind and slammed into the wall. Naruto then ducked, just barely dodging a metal fist to the face. He threw out a few punches striking the stomach area of his opponent and then throwing it out the open door. Naruto quickly shot after it and was prepared to stomp down on it, only for the object to turn into a mess of liquid metal. Naruto was then lifted into the air and then slammed down hard on his back. Naruto then backflipped to avoid the machine coming down on him with enough force to dent the metal floor. Naruto jumped back up, a beeping in his ears as he glanced down at his pad to see that the back of his armor was damaged as well as some of the back of his helmet, but his systems were still functioning. Naruto then stood up and saw his opponent. For a moment, it was only a glob of liquid sentient metal, before it all merged and took a solid humanoid form. The enhanced Techaden was shorter and less bulky than the original model. The armor was all back, with red areas on its forearms, stomach, between its legs, and in the areas around its joints. There were also areas of gray on its shoulders, knees, and thighs, similarly to a normal Techaden. Each hand ended with four fingers and a thumb, each digit pointed. Its head looked a regular Techaden, except instead of the Y-shaped prongs, they were pointed together like a capital A. Yeah, figures. Should have guessed. Heaven forbid I don't get pulled into some crazy adventure just by checking out a downed ship, Naruto said as he stood up and addressed the mechanical creature. The robot didn't answer as it got down into a low stance, assuming a type of combat stance that Naruto didn't recognize. Naruto got into his own, realizing this machine was itching for a fight. Okay, space battle, can't be that hard, Naruto thought, I can't use fire or winjutsu because of my mask and the lack of air. Still got my armor and weapons. Let's go you oversize can opener. The two charged forward and met in the middle in a brief grappling contest. 
Naruto overpowered the machine for a moment before slammed his knee into the robot's stomach knocking it airborne slightly, then throwing it hard across the room. The machine slid across the floor, picking up sparks as it slid across the room. The Tachadan then stood up like nothing had happened. The machine's arms warped, distorting into an almost liquid-like metal before they reformed into a massive set of armored claws. The machine charged forward and began slashing at Naruto. The enhanced shinobi's enhanced abilities enabled him to dodge and then unleashed a punch towards, what he thought, was the robot's throat. The strike struck home and the robot stumbled. Naruto then kept up with his assault aiming at the joint areas in the shoulders, arms, and knees. Then, for good measure, he grabbed the robot by both of its arm and with a solid yank, tore them both off. The enhanced Tachadan fell to its knees. Stopped for a moment. Naruto then walked behind it and said, well that was easier, than I thought it would be. As Naruto was fighting, Merlin had been working in the control room. He had immediately closed the door and locked it, then he started accessing the computer, trying to get some of the systems working again. Merlin looked back to see Naruto walked away from the, literally, disarmed Tachadan, but saw it get back up again and turned towards the young ninja. Naruto behind you. Hearing the warning, and then his danger sense going off, Naruto ducked just in time to avoid a powerful kick that, if it had hit, would have either broken his reinforced skull, or shattered his helmet. The boy spun around just in time to take a knee to the chest. Naruto was then slammed into the ground as the armless Tachadan held Naruto in a leg lock around his neck. As the machine held Naruto tight, the recently separated arms, transformed into a liquid metal and then moved towards the body, reattaching. Naruto stood up, lifting the robot who then started raining a barrage of punches from its position on top of Naruto's shoulders. The strikes were mainly towards his upper chest, shoulders and face, one of which formed a crack in the mask of his helmet. Naruto, thinking quickly unleashed a blast of lighting charka that shocked the machine, making it seize up for a moment. Naruto then proceeded to slam it down on the ground with enough force to crater the steel. The boy then grabbed the robot by its legs and then proceeded to repeat the process at least three more times. Naruto, throw it on one belts, Merlin's voice said over the calm. Naruto looked confused for a moment, and then proceeded to do so. Immediately, belt began moving and the various metal arms began attacking the Tachadan, welding unnecessary pieces of metal to it, slamming into the metal with plasma welders, and all sorts of other devices. It was a good thing that it didn't have a voice box otherwise it would be screaming in pain by now. After a few moments, the belt stopped. They were silent for a moment before the pieces added by the belt were starting to be pushed off, and the heat from the plasma was being undone. Dang, Naruto said, that thing just won't stay down. Naruto, Merlin said, I found the Tekadon's blueprints. Apparently, the nanobots made for it were different. To help it learn that added a processing system in the form of a specialized nanobot, like the queen in a beehive. Naruto was interested in this, but was forced to dodge another punch to the face. Naruto was quick to realize that it seemed to be targeting his face exclusively, telling the boy it knew that he was human, and thus needed oxygen. So, what am I supposed to do? Merlin was quiet for a moment, no doubt thinking and said, I think I found something. A specialized weapon, made to deliver huge amounts of destruction. Use that and you should be able to defeat this to Chaden. As this was said, the Tekadon's arms morphed again, this time forming what? Naruto could guess were powerful laser cannons. And how long is that going to take? Naruto asked as the jumped up to avoid the blasts that nearly reduced him to base particles. About five minutes, give or take. Naruto yelled, Are you serious? Give or take. Merlin said, I may be a genius, but I've never used this kind of technology before, plus the blueprints are encoded so cut me some slack. Oh, and by the way, dodge. Naruto looked confused and asked, What? The Tachadan had slammed his fist into Naruto's stomach and proceeded to unleash a barrage of swift punches, not unlike the fighting style Naruto used earlier. The boy was then knocked back a couple feet into a wall. Naruto looked at the pad on his arm beep saw an image his armor, with the area around his stomach, the helmet, and his shoulders now tinted red, indicating it was damaged. He then turned towards the Galvan with an annoyed expression. Just for the record, shouting dodge is more distracting than helpful. Naruto then dodged to avoid another blast of energy. The boy then pulled out a surprise and activated his stealth mode. While invisible, Naruto slammed the robot into the wall. While it was briefly stunned, 
Naruto grabbed the robot by the skull and proceeded to slam it into the wall several times, leaving a head shaped and dent. Then he proceeded to unleash a barrage of punches that knocked the Tachadin through the wall. Naruto turned and asked, How much longer? Merlin answered, Two and a half minutes. The Tachadin moved through the hole in the wall, its sensor switching modes to a sonar. It could now see Naruto's outline, despite his stealth mode being on. The boy let out a cry of shock as he was tackled to the ground and was now being punched in the face, more cracks forming in his mask. Naruto managed to catch both fists and delivered a blast of lightning chakra, however, it didn't seize up this time, the nanites in the Tekadon's body absorbing the charge. Naruto's eyes widened behind his mask just as the Tachadon slammed his head into the ground pinning his skull. The Tachadon was prepared to crush the boy, until it saw the weapon being built. Realizing it would probably be dangerous, it raised its free arm which morphed into a large cannon. Naruto saw this and reached under himself, pulling out and activating a HF Kanai. The boy swung hard, using his chakra to help extend the blade and slice through the Tekadon's cannon just before it built up enough energy to fire. Naruto then stabbed the Kanai into the Tachadon. Naruto then tensed his legs and used his enhanced strength to launch them both upwards. The Tachadon was slammed into the ceiling forming a dent. As they fell, Naruto grabbed the robot's head and spun around like a twister, slamming the robot hard onto the floor face first, forming another crater in the floor. Naruto then grabbed the downed robot by his lead and proceeded to throw it with all his might, sending it through the wall on the far end of the factory. Naruto took the moment to catch his breath. His armor was damaged and with the cracks in his mask, the oxygen in his suit was dropping, and the fight wasn't helping. Naruto was pretty sure that some of his bones were possibly cracked from the fighting, but he could guess that they were healing already, as were some of the bruises. Naruto the hand. Naruto was shocked when he heard Merlin's voice. The boy spun around and saw the severed hand was standing up on its own, the cannon had transformed back into a hand and was now aiming five little cannons at the belt. Naruto grabbed it, and saw the Tachadon was getting back up. Thinking quickly, Naruto shot out his grappling hook piercing the robot's body. Get over here. The ninja yanked on the robot and pulled him close swinging up the still charging finger cannons on the Tekadon's severed hand. The blasts fired point blank and launched the Tachadon backwards, now with five holes burned into its chest, and causing more damage to the ship. Merlin then said, Naruto the weapon is almost done, only about 30 seconds. Now would be a good time for you to get some distance between you and the Tachadon. Naruto nodded and held his hands up in a very familiar symbol. Shadow Clone Jutsu. Seven clones formed with five charging forward and two staying behind with the original. The clones unleashed a barrage of punches and kicks on the robot, before they all jumped back and slid forward, throwing up powerful kicks to send it skyward. Naruto. The remaining three clones formed a Rasengan in their hands before charging forward at the falling robot, their arms pulled back ready to unleash their techniques. Rasengan Barrage. The three spiraling spheres of doom slammed into the Tachadon grinding away at the metal and launching it across the room. It went right through one of the holes made before smashing through the wall. The combined strength of all three Rasengan kept it going through a few more before it lost enough momentum to only form a crater in a final wall. The clones quickly dispersed into smoke leaving the original. Naruto then turned and approached the belt where the weapon was being built. Naruto walked towards it as the arms building it pulled back. It appeared to be a huge metal gun. Damn that is a big freaking gun, Naruto said. The boy then picked it up, half expecting it to be heavy, but found it to be surprisingly light. So, what is this thing and how does this work? Naruto asked. Merlin answered, they hadn't gotten around to naming it, however, it is incredibly powerful and can fire massive energy balls of plasma, doing heavy damage to objects. It may take a few shots, but it should eliminate the Tachadon. Naruto turned as he heard metal slamming down on metal at a fast pace, indicating the Tachadon was back up and it was running. Merlin quickly said, just hold the trigger to charge it, and let it go to unleash the blast. Naruto did so, pressing the trigger down. He heard a high-pitched whine before a green glow formed in the barrel of the massive weapon. Naruto looked up from the gun just in time to see the Tachadon shot through the hole in the wall, intent on crushing its foe. Naruto then held up the cannon and just as the robot came within spitting distance said, bye. A large blast of energy shot out of the barrel and slammed into the Tachadon. 
there was a huge blast of energy that threw Naruto back sending flying over the belt where the weapon had been built, adding some further damage to his armor and the factory which now had some plasma burns on the floors, walls, and ceiling. The Techaden wasn't as lucky as our hero, as the massive blast of concentrated plasma burned it away, it tried to repair itself, but the blast destroyed too much leaving nothing in its wake but the smell of disintegrated matter. Naruto stood up with a groan of pain, his nanobots healing his body. Well, that was crazy, Naruto said, is it over? After a few minutes of nothing happening Merlin said, yes, I believe it is. Back in the base Merlin said, come back, Naruto. I need to repair your suit, not to mention you are starting to run low on oxygen. I'd get back here fast, if I were you. Naruto nodded and said, yeah, thanks boss. Naruto then proceeded to get out of there as soon as possible. Meanwhile, Merlin looked at the image of the destroyed factory and an idea formed in his head. Maybe they could use this to their advantage. It had been one year, since Naruto had gotten enhanced by the nanites. One year, since discovering the alien factory that crashed into the moon. One year, since his fight with the enhanced Techaden machine, and it had not been a lazy year. With the finding of the Techaden factory, Merlin immediately set his robotic drones and the AI caretaker to get the factory in working order, and getting all the system fully functional. Much like his base, he connected it with the AI caretaker and began using the nanotechnology in the Techadons to enhance his drones. They were faster, stronger, could carry more systems and weaponry, and could adapt to their opponents. He also found various upgrades and system that would be useful in Naruto's armor until he got the DNA system in the nanites to work. Sadly, he hadn't made any progress in getting the DNA conversion process. He had taken a sample of Kyubi's chakra to do so, but was shocked to find that it wasn't the source of the DNA degradation. This led to him believing that there was a flaw in the nanites, which wasn't that much a stretch. He was incredibly intelligent, but that didn't mean he didn't make mistakes. Speaking of Naruto, with new technology Naruto's workout got a lot more intense. He found himself lifting heavier weights, using more powerful techniques, learned by the new and enhanced spy drones. Naruto also found himself practicing with multiple weapons, ranging from powerful mid to long range guns to brutal melee weapons, and with the drones now able to learn and adapt to Naruto's strategies, even becoming wary of his ability to plan on the fly, and even using it themselves. It was then that Naruto truly became aware of how dangerous his ability to think ahead was. This was only made more dangerous when Naruto found himself studying and practicing combat tactics and strategies. If that wasn't enough, Merlin had said that he would work on a few vehicles for Naruto to use. Vehicles to fly through the sky, space, and the various terrains of his own home planet, all of which could reach speeds that even the most well-trained ninja couldn't go. To help with this, Naruto went through simulations, in a new chamber built into the factory, to practice driving. It was a good thing he did, because he got into a lot of crashes when he first tested the simulator, not to mention the issue where he accidentally launched himself out of it by pressing the emergency eject button. Naruto walked through the factory with no helmet on, having no need for it. He made his way through the halls and towards Merlin's new and improved laboratory. He entered and found the Galvin sitting at his workbench, going over a new weapon, most likely. Hey, working hard there, frogman? Naruto asked using the new nickname he had given the frog like alien. Merlin looked up with an exasperated sigh and said, I know you find that nickname funny, but I find it rather annoying. Naruto said, I know, but that won't stop me from calling you that. Nicknames aside what is it that you called me down here for? Merlin turned away from his workbench and said, Naruto, you have been here for over a year. I believe now is the time for you for you to go to Earth. Naruto blinked and said, Am I hearing you right, I'm going to another planet? The Galvin answered, Yes. Given everything that we've done so far, I estimate that you are now ready to fight Ben 10. Also, you won't be going alone. I'll be going with you, but it may take some time. Naruto asked, Can't you just, warp across the galaxy in a few minutes? Merlin answered, Unfortunately, no the machine we have would not allow us to do so. The factory's coating and the material the hull is made of would not withstand such speeds. We will, however, be able to move at light speed for the duration of the journey. We should be able to reach Earth in, by my estimates, three days. Merlin sat down in a chair, and fastened a seatbelt around his tiny waist. He looked at Naruto and said, You might want to sit down somewhere. This is going to get a little bumpy. 
Naruto nodded and immediately moved for a nearby chair. The blonde sat down and put on a seatbelt. As soon as he did, Merlin said, Caretaker, prepare to launch and fly towards planet Earth. Orders recognized. Beginning launch in 3, 2, 1, launch. A loud rumble was heard by the two lifeforms as they felt themselves being lifted from the surface of the moon. Outside of the factory, the large ship was lifted off the ground by powerful thrusters, which broke through the gravity. Moments after doing so caretaker's voice was heard. Artificial gravity increasing to levels necessary for space travel, complete. Light speed preparing, are you ready? Merlin said, go. Caretaker's voice said, acknowledge. Preparing light speed to planet Earth. Arrival time in 72 Earth hours. Enjoy your flight. The ship briefly rumbled for a moment before calming. Merlin then undid his belt and said, with that now done, we need to get to work. I want to run some final diagnostics on your new suit. Would you be willing to try out a few new moves and some of the new weapons I've added? Naruto nodded and said, you got it, frogman. Merlin sighed and said, I still wish you wouldn't call me that. Later, the new training room, the training room was a recent addition to the factory. The room was round, with dome-shaped ceiling. Through it looked plain there were panels that hid different weapons for weapons, targets, and system used for obstacle courses. From the center of the ceiling a cylindrical metal chamber hung. This was an observation room, where Merlin currently stood, waiting for Naruto to finish suiting up. A door opened, and Naruto soon walked out, in a brand new and enhanced armored suit. It looked like it had the same basic design, but now it was completely black with dark orange areas, over his arms, legs, and chest, something Naruto had asked for specifically. Merlin had said that it was unnecessary, but Naruto was firm, and he agreed to make it darker orange, so it wouldn't stand out as much. His left forearm still had the screen on it, and the right forearm was now sleeker, replaced with a pad on back of his right hand, which had a glowing blue circle near the knuckles. Speaking of knuckles, there were now some wicked-looking spikes jutting out of the four knuckles on Naruto's hands. On his waist was still the belt, with pouches that had the high-frequency kanai, and shuriken. There were also a pair of holsters on the belt, on either side of Naruto's belt. Naruto raised his arms and looked at his hands. The view through the HUD showed him a clear vision of his hands. Naruto, can you hear me? said Merlin's voice over the intercom from the observation room. I hear you loud and clear. Doc, Naruto said, so this is what? You've been working on. I have to say the suit feels nice, and a bit lighter. That's because I made it out of new Alao, that is not only just as strong as the original, but lighter as well, Merlin explained. I also added a special mesh under the armor that hardens in response to trauma, to add some extra defense. Naruto flexed his hands and then slammed his fist down on his forearm, carefully to avoid the screen. He could feel something hardening under his arm guard as he did so. Merlin said, I also made some adjustment to the armor. I've added a few new systems to the headset. The suit is now linked to your thoughts, as I've introduced similar nanites into the suit. The stealth mode can now be activated with a thought, as well as a new enhanced armor mode, that defensive capabilities even further. Naruto didn't answer. He then thought about it, and stealth mode activated, light bending around him and making him appear invisible. With another thought, Naruto deactivated it, nodding in approval. He then proceeded to use the enhanced armor. Upon doing so, he found it a bit harder to move, something he made note of. He quickly deactivated it, and then moved around a bit. Now, that that is out of the way, I want you to look at your right arm. No doubt, you have noticed that it is now not as thick. That is because, I have replaced it with a special kinetic tether. As opposed to the original grappling hook, the tether has a near unlimited reach and can reach great distances. Give it a try. The training room floor rumbled as five pillars, each taller than the last rose up. They flashed brightly with technology, with a special sheen that Naruto immediately recognized. A special anti-chakra alloy that Merlin developed, usually for obstacle courses so Naruto would be able to use the wall walking exercise to get up walls. Squeeze your fist, aim, and fire. Naruto did so as the object on the back of his hand lit up. A bright beam of pure energy shot out and the end attached to the top of one of the pillars. Naruto was caught off guard by how fast, but quickly managed to get a hold of it and caught himself before flipping upwards and landing on the pillar. He repeated the process, though with less near crashing, and the pillars were soon lowered. Good, good. The tether can also be used to pull objects and people close to you, 
suspending them for a few brief moments of time in a temporary stasis field. Don't you just love technology? The panels on the walls opened and platforms with white orbs that had red targets painted on them. Just point it at your target, fire, and pull back hard. Naruto did just that, aiming his hand and firing. As soon as he saw the beam connect, he ripped back, pulling the target towards him. As it flew, it slowed down, now glowing bright blue, indicating the stasis field that Merlin mentioned. Naruto then proceeded to perform a spinning kick, knocking the target away. The blonde repeated this with the rest of the targets until they ran out. Good working at optimal efficiency. Now that that is out of the way, we can move on to the next portion. I have a new set of weapons and gadgets for you. Several targets, formed again, and then seven small areas in the floor opened, and pedestals rose out, each having a small rectangular box on them, seven in total. Uh, I don't want to ask a stupid sounding question, but these are Zhu Ta bunch of boxes, Naruto said. Well get to those in a minute. Now the two weapons on your waist, could be called your default weapons. They are based off weapons used by Sodaraji on handguns, specifically these two are called the Eclex Prime Pistols, or AP for short. Naruto drew the two weapons from his waist and twirled them in his hands. These two guns only hold about 16 shots, total, but those shots are incredibly powerful. Take a few shots. A target appeared in front of Naruto. The blonde took out his guns and fired them blowing holes through the targets. Naruto immediately noticed that the HUD had a picture of the weapon in the right corner of his vision, showing two numbers, with one number shrinking with each shot he took. The bullets are also chakra conductive. They by taking on wind chakra they become powerful enough to pierce armor, and lightning chakra will shock your enemies. Give them a go. Naruto took aim and focused said chakra into his weapons. Wind chakra on the left, and lightning chakra on the right. Both bullets flew at the targets, piercing one target completely while the other was lit up like a Christmas tree. Nice, Naruto said, Tenten would be going crazy over these. Wait, what about water chakra? Merlin answered, I have been unable to find a use for that type of chakra in the bullets. However, I should note that these are the only ones that I've been able to add this technology to. The others proved to be unstable. Naruto simply nodded and put his weapons away. Merlin continued, your next weapon is something that you may be familiar with. The small platform glowed, showing which one to reach for. Naruto reached out and opened it, pressed it, the box expanded into a large shuriken, and we mean large, so large that he would have to carry it on his back. He was immediately reminded of the shuriken that Mizuki used when he tried to defect and steal the forbidden scroll. I combined some of my technology with something else. A group of hunters called the Yautja use special target seeking discs, referred to as smart discs, to hunt dangerous creatures. This shuriken combines that technology, and as a bonus, it can return like a boomerang. A panel on the wall opened and a round target came out. It began moving through the air, very quickly. Naruto picked up the large high frequency shuriken, and took aim, the HUD in his helmet locking onto the target, indicated by a shrinking circle that started off red, then yellow and green as it got smaller. Naruto threw it hard with a grunt, the weapon spinning like a buzzsaw as it flew the target moved out of the way, but the smart shuriken turned and caught up to it, slashing through it like a piece of scrap metal. The weapon then flew back towards Naruto, who caught it easily. Nice, Naruto said as he set it down. Next, is something that I believe you will enjoy. It works like your handguns, but they are not as powerful, however, it fires at a much faster rate and has a lot more ammunition. They are dubbed, the dual raptors. Naruto reached for the lit up the targets, seeing that the guns nearly had 300 rounds of ammo, but he saw it decreasing quickly, and they didn't seem to do a lot of damage. Naruto made a note not to use this against enemies with thick armor. Naruto laid them down, and looked at the next box. Picking it up, he opened it up revealing a rifle. Also based on the weapons used by the Sodarajion, this is the Sybaris Prime Rifle. This is more powerful than the gun, but it makes a lot of noise, and has a strong recoil. Be sure to hold the butt against your shoulder, or it may shatter even your collarbone. As he spoke, Naruto picked it up and took aim. Naruto made sure to hold it tight as he pulled the trigger. Naruto winced slightly as the recoil caused his shoulder to shake, something the guns from before hadn't done. Next is the Heck Shotgun. As opposed to your other weapons, this is more suited for more close-range encounters due to the ammunition type. I would not recommend using this in an area where there are a lot of bystanders, as someone is bound to die. 
Naruto opened the hex box and held out the gun, he had to admit this one looked slightly different than the rest of them, as it didn't seem as advanced. Then again, he probably shouldn't look a new weapon the barrel. Naruto then aimed at the weapon and fired. Naruto immediately noticed a difference as the blast left a barrage of bullet holes on the target. Naruto realized this would not be good from a distance, and that it would be very difficult to aim with the spread, and would probably be better if an opponent was close. Next, we have something very special. An asymmetrical recoilless carbine, or as some of the more combat-oriented races would call it, a railgun, that fires special explosive rounds. It will take two seconds to charge, but that shouldn't be a problem. Naruto picked up the gun and was surprised by the weight of it. He aimed and fired a round, which exploded on contact with a significant amount of force. Naruto then proceeded to open fire on more targets that appeared. He smiled at the large amount of damage that he had unloaded. Next, we have something that I think you will remember quite well. I believe the words you used to describe it were simple enough, the big freaking gun. Naruto's eyes widened in familiarity of the powerful weapon he had used to defeat the enhanced Tachaden. The boy smirked, before he picked it up and a large target appeared. Naruto turned around and aimed, holding down the trigger as the weapon charged. He let it go and the familiar ball of green energy shot forward, striking the target and exploding with a massive amount of force and leaving plasma burns on the surrounding area. Unfortunately, the BFG only has about five shots, Merlin said, use them wisely. Next up, we have something for dealing with someone at close range. Naruto asked, like a sword or something. Merlin smiled, thought Naruto couldn't see it, and said, actually yes. It is referred to as a type 1 energy weapon, more simply referred to as a plasma sword. Naruto picked up the last box. He opened it, revealing a large handheld object. Naruto held it in his hand, and squuzzed it, causing two large glowing energy blades to shoot out, parallel to each other. Naruto whistled as he moved it through the air, pouting slightly as it didn't make that humming noise like it did in a science fiction movie he saw. Then again, he'd already figured out that science fiction had nothing to do with science fact. Naruto was brought out of his thoughts when targets shot out of the walls at high speed. Naruto spun around and started slashing through the targets, leaving behind burnt and warped metal. Naruto continued to do so, until they stopped. Now we just have one last thing to pick, Merlin said. Located on the bottom of your left wrist is one last powerful weapon. Squeeze your hand to release it, and then you can loosen your grip to bring it back. Naruto held out his hand, half expecting his arm to transform into a cannon. What he didn't expect was for a small gun, barely big enough to fit in his hand to pop out while connected to a small mechanism. Naruto looked at it and asked, Is this a joke? Merlin seemed to be holding back some laughter as he said, No it is an energy pistol, known for its incredible strength. Some circles refer to it as the noisy cricket because it sounds like the insects on Earth, and your planet. Naruto said, I don't see how it is powerful. Heck, I may just break this thing by accident. Merlin said, Just try it Naruto. Naruto sighed and aimed at the target that appeared. After a second he pulled the trigger, and was immediately thrown across the room as a massive shocked fire out of the gun and smashed the target to pieces. Naruto moaned in pain as he tried to get up and said, Okay, that hurt. What the heck? Merlin was heard laughing over the intercom as he said, Consider that payback for putting hot sauce in food, you little runt. Naruto looked up at the observation room and asked, You do know that I'm going to get you back for this, right? Merlin simply chuckled and said, Worth it. Back to serious matters, we have three days to get to Earth. I want you to practice with these weapons until then. In the meantime, why don't you walk off your little accident? Naruto grumbled as he stood up and grumbled, he is going to pay for that later. With that, Naruto left the room to prepare for his upcoming battle with the hero of the planet Earth. Meanwhile on the planet Earth, Ben Tennyson was currently sitting on his couch, watching his favorite show, Sumo Slammers. Ben had been in a bit of a slump recently. He had recently just broken up with his longtime girlfriend, Julie. Julie had been given a spot on an international tennis tour, and wound up having to leave his hometown of Bellwood. They had tried to make the long distance thing work, but unfortunately, even with his fastest alien, he was currently unable to make it work. The two broke up on good terms, but Ben was still in a bit of a breakup slump. At least he knew she would be safe as she had Ship, the small galvanic mechamorph, with her. A knock came at the door, and it opened, revealing his cousin Gwen Tennyson and her boyfriend of some time, Kevin Levin. Still feeling bummed, Ben, 
Gwen asked. Come on man, Kevin said, so your girl moved away. It's not like the world is going to end. Ben said, well, how would you feel if Gwen suddenly had to leave town? Kevin didn't answer, as he already knew what he would probably say. That and saying anything else with his girlfriend in the room would probably not go very well. Gwen said, come on, Ben. You've been in a funk for a few days now. You need to move on. Why don't you come with us? Get some smoothies, see some stuff around town, chase off a few fangirls and haters. It'll be fun, just like the good old days. Ben looked at his show and sighed. Yeah, maybe getting out of the house would be a good idea. It's not like anything exciting is going to happen around here, Ben said. A lot of aliens have been laying low since Vilgax got beaten and Diagon got taken down. Kevin said, easy there, Tennyson. The last thing we need is for you to start tempting fate, especially with the old Tennyson luck. Ben said, yeah, to be honest though, I could use a little bit of excitement. Unknown to Ben, the beginning of a new adventure was charging right towards him. The three days had passed quickly, and Naruto had taken the time to get to know his weapons far more personally, and had managed to get some work done on figuring out his new toys. He was even figuring out a way to use the recoil on the noisy cricket to his advantage, thought it had lead to some seriously hilarious Pratt Falls that he was pretty sure Merlin had recorded. In any case, three days had passed, and they were currently arriving at Earth. Naruto saw the planet and was feeling a bit nostalgic as he was reminded of his home planet. The only thing that seemed different was that instead of a single supercontinent there were several. This is Earth, Merlin said, described as the cesspool of the galaxy and the universal melting pot. Naruto asked, why is that? Merlin said, well, the first one is because it is a refugee planet, in some ways. Aliens come to Earth, usually seeking to start a business of their own. Unfortunately, from what I've heard, not all the businesses are of the legal sort. The second one, is because of the humans, believe it or not. Naruto raised an eyebrow in confusion and asked, Um, how so? I thought you told me some humans are considered delicacies. Merlin smiled and said, So you have been listening. Anyway, according to geneticists, earthling DNA is highly resilient and adaptable. From what I've been told through the grapevine, several human alien hybrids have been found on this planet and currently work with the plumbers naruto said the intergalactic anbu merlin snapped his fingers and said correct this is the reason human dna is sometimes coveted by alien races some species believe that human dna could be used to revive dying races however such experiments would be frowned upon in modern times so nobody has been able to figure that out naruto nodded his head the time he spent with the alien genius had allowed him to understand his genius talk. Naruto then realized something and turned towards the diminutive alien. Wait, if that's true about humans, what if there was a hybrid between aliens and my species? Naruto asked. Merlin rubbed his chin in thought. To be honest, I'm not sure, the Galvan answered, given how similar, yet similar, Gaian and Earthen humans are, I'm not sure. If possible, I would like to compare the two side by side if I get the chance. Merlin then said, Now, I'm going to bring us down outside of Bellwood. You should know that we may run into some trouble. Naruto said, So what do we do, just sneak into the city? Merlin said, No, most likely, we will be approached by the plumbers. Just act peacefully, and don't do anything rash, okay? Naruto nodded and said, Okay, I mean, I have improved, haven't I? Merlin gained a deadpan expression and said, For the sake of my food being unspoiled by laxatives or hot sauce, I'll have to say yes. Hey. Merlin cackled slightly and said, Now, we better strap in. These kinds of entrances can be a little rough. Naruto and Merlin then sat down in chairs perfect for their sizes, and strapped themselves down. It was a good thing too, because as soon as they hit the atmosphere the factory began to shake and rumble. Outside, the hull heated up as a cone formed the friction of the air hitting the metal hull. With that the ship descended, aiming for a forested area just a few miles outside of Bellwood. As they did, secret satellites that orbited the planet picked up their entrance of the Earth's atmosphere. The device took a picture of the fire-covered object, filtered through the flames, and, once obtaining the unobstructed image of the hijacked Tachadon factory, sent it to the plumber base. Earth. Bellwood plumber base control room, one of the many computers beeped, as the image of the Tachadon factory came up on the image. The computer then went through some numbers, and predicted a trajectory, and a potential landing area. The technician, 
a brown-haired human, said, Uh, Magister Tennyson, we may have a problem. He was approached by another human. He was tall for his age, and a little on the heavy side, but not too much. His hair was gray with some hints of white, some wrinkles to indicate his age, and green eyes, that had the spark of a war veteran, hero. He wore a pair of long white pants, black shoes, and a black shirt under a red button-up, floral design Hawaiian shirt. This was Maxwell, Max, Tennyson, legendary magister rank plumber, war hero, and grandfather to intergalactic hero, Ben Tennyson. What is it? Max asked, using a serious tone. The plumber answered, one of our satellites picked up something entering our atmosphere. Max asked, are we expecting any arrivals today, or are there any aerial tests this week? The plumber brought up a link on his screen and said, the arrival isn't planned, sir, and there aren't any tests, practices, or anything involving our ships until next week. Max rubbed his chin and thought, bring up what the image was. The plumber did so, pressing buttons at a fast pace, until the image of the Tachandan factory appeared on the screen. Max's eyes widened as he said, a Tachandan factory, great. The plumber asked, should I send a team in to intercept, sir? Max rubbed his chin and said, no I'll call Ben. Him and his team can take care of this one. The old man then mentally added, besides, some fighting might get his mind off his recent breakup. Max reached into his pocket, pulling out a phone. He dialed a number and waited for Ben to pick up. Meanwhile at Mr. Smoothie, Ben slurped down his smoothie with a bored expression on his face. So far, he had to say, it had been a good time. He was getting over Julie, which was a good thing, but what was getting annoying was the constant badgering from his fangirls. Apparently, word that the hero of the world was single had spread quickly, and now several girls were hoping to make their mark by being the hero's girl. Now, under normal circumstances, Ben would have jumped at the chance, but after being a real, meaningful relationship he was not so quick to jump at a fangirl's adoration. Back off you vultures, an annoyed Kevin said as he and Gwen sat down with smoothies of their own. How do you deal with this? Ben asked. I've seen those girls at the garage who come to check out Team Tennyson's bad boy. Kevin said, what can I say, the ladies can't resist the bad boy. Plus, I helps that I have a girlfriend who can blow stuff up with her mind. You, unfortunately, have no such protection. Ben sighed and said, honestly, when I thought about having fangirls, it seemed like a good thing, but now it just seems like I'm being followed by girls who just want me for the fame. Does anyone else have to deal with this? Back on Gaia, in the blood prison, Sasuke Uchiha sneezed, which drew the ire of his cellmate. Gwen began counting on her fingers while listing, heirs, heiresses, movie stars, actors, male models. Ben said, okay, I get it. Kevin said, I'm surprised you're upset. I thought you wanted to move on from Ju, you know who. Ben said, I do, and I am. It's just getting kind of annoying. It was at that moment that Ben's cell phone went off. He recognized the ringtone, as it was one he used when Grandpa Max called. Knowing that this must be important. Pulling it out of his jacket pocket, Ben proceeded answer. Hey, Grandpa Max, Ben greeted. What's up? Max said, Ben, we have a situation. A few minutes ago, our satellites detected what resembles a Tachadan factory landing a few miles outside of Bellwood. Ben looked surprised and asked, a Tachadan factory? You don't think it is another one of those investigators do you? Kevin and Gwen immediately became alert at the thought of that. The investigator had been one of their toughest fights, in their opinion. With his knowledge of technology, use of them, and the capability to create an entire army of Tachadan soldiers, he had been tough. Add in the fact that Ben's Omnitrix had shorted out, and they were having some serious difficulties. Max answered, we don't know. Since you and your team are close to the site, we're sending you out to investigate. We'll send in some backup if you need it. Ben answered, you got it, Grandpa. Ben hug up, sucked down the remains of his smoothie, and said, hey, Fred, we're going to have to get some to-go bags. After Gwen and Kevin got their orders wrapped up, Ben got into his car, and Kevin and Gwen got into Kevin's car, and they drove off, following a map that had been projected up by their plumber badges. Meanwhile a half a mile outside of Bellwood, Naruto unstrapped himself as he got up, he rolled his shoulders as he cracked his neck. Naruto said, well that was a little different. Merlin said, if you think that was a little rocky, you should try it in a one-man ship. Believe me that shakes you up a lot more. Naruto then said, so, what happens now? 
Merlin said, well, first, we need to get our bearings. We know we are about a half to three quarters of a mile outside of Bellwood. However, finding Ben is going to be a bit of a problem. We need to be careful, or we are going to attract some unwanted attention. As soon as the Galvin said that, the proximity alarm sounded. The diminutive genius ran for a nearby console, and started typing away at the keyboard. An image from an outside camera appeared, and showed them the outside. Outside the familiar black and green cars used by Kevin and Ben showed up, respectively in that order. Or they could just come to us, Merlin said. Naruto said, huh, when the stars align right? Outside the factory, the trio of earthlings got out of their cars and approached the factory very carefully. They noticed a large camera on a long metal limb staring at them as they approached. So, does anyone else feel like we got her a bit too easy? Ben asked, remembering the last time they approached a Techaden factory. Gwen said, yeah. Normally, these things start shooting when we get too close. Ben said, yeah, but the last time we fought, each Techaden became immune to everything we threw at it. What comes out might be just as strong. There was the sound of metal moving and everyone turned towards the sight of the factory door opening. The trio got ready for battle. Ben slid the Omnimatrix selection circle until it went over four arms logo. He was prepared to transform at a moment's notice. Gwen got into her normal stance with orbs of pink energy forming around her hands. Kevin placed his hand on his car and absorbed the metal, a layer of green colored metal covering his skin like armor. After a few moments, the door finally opened fully smoke pouring out the opening. The trio tensed as they heard metallic footfalls that grew louder with each step. Then, out of the smoke appeared Naruto in full armor. He walked forward out of the smoke, and continued to walk until he was in front of them. Naruto looked at them, taking in their appearances, and formed his thoughts on them. Ben was skinny, and didn't seem like much a fighter, but then again, not everyone who could fight looked like they were built for combat. He saw the Omnimatrix on his wrist and realized that this was the Ben that he heard so much about. He was glad that he managed to find who he was looking for so easy. After seeing the Omnimatrix, Naruto figured Ben used whatever alien form would best suit a situation, and with a lot of forms, there was no doubt he could adapt to situations, which made him dangerous. He turned his attention towards Kevin. He was slightly surprised to see that Kevin had metal skin but after a scan realized that the man was only covered in it, and not completely made of metal. He also noted Kevin's physique and thought that me might be more suited as a brawler, and was, most likely the team's muscle. He turned to Gwen, and was surprised at how pretty she was. Nice red hair, pretty, sparkling eyes, and a pretty nice figure. He also noted the energy forming around her hands. It felt somewhat like Charka, but, incomplete. Either way, she seemed like she was more built for mid to long range combat. There was a silence, tense, as the trio expected this to be a new Techaden. Though a par tof them had their doubts as they didn't know a Techaden to actually carry guns. Naruto, realizing that no one was going to break the tension, decided to speak. As Merlin told him, it would be best to treat them as friends, until the fighting started. Realizing the tense silence had been going on for a few minutes, due to his observations, Naruto took it upon himself to end the silence. So, come here often? He asked, his voice sounding slightly mechanical due to the helmet. The trio was shocked by the fact that this guy could talk. Um, since when could Tekadans talk? Ben asked. Naruto answered, Oh, I'm not a Techaden. A hundred percent human, thank you. Don't believe me? Naruto sent a thought to his suit, and the helmet retracted from his face, revealing it to the trio. The group was shocked at this action, seeing that he was apparently very trusting. That and the fact that this guy looked completely human, save for his whisker marks. Huh, Kevin said, slightly shocked, you seem a lot more human than we thought. Naruto raised an eyebrow and asked, what do you mean? Ben said, no offense, it's just that all the aliens we've dealt with don't look as human as you. Naruto was quiet as he considered their words, and remembering his meeting with Merlin and Developer 5. Naruto said, fair enough. Gwen then stepped forward and asked, if you aren't a Techaden, and you don't look like the inspector, what are you doing riding around in a Techaden factory, while we are at that, who are you? Naruto smiled and answered, my name is Naruto Uzumaki of the planet Gaia. As for why I'm riding around in this thing, well the damn thing crashed into my moon, found it, got attacked by some enhanced Techaden, beat it, and used it to come here. Kevin blinked and said, Gaia? 
never heard of that planet before? Naruto answered, we aren't a very well-known one. Ben then asked, what do you mean enhanced to Chaden? Naruto sighed and answered, well apparently, some guy named Vulcanus ordered some while back, and after that failed one of the guys in their organization, called a developer, was tasked with creating a newer, stronger, and smarter to Chaden. Ben said, let me guess, it went the way of Terminator? Naruto cocked his head to the side and asked, huh? Ben slapped himself mentally and said, sorry, I thought I was talking to an earthling for a moment, sorry. I mean that it turned on him. Naruto nodded and said, yeah, that's essentially what happened. Ben then asked, so, what brings you to our corner of the galaxy? Naruto, deciding it would be a good idea to be direct, and said, I came here to fight you. There was a moment of silence before Naruto's words sank in. The trio immediately jumped back with shocked looks. Hold on kid, Kevin said, you aren't taking anyone on. Naruto said, hold on. I said I was here to fight him, not kill him. Gwen raised her arms, her hands still alight with glowing energy, and asked, why do you want to fight Ben? What do you get out of it? Naruto answered, you see my boss wants to test out what I've got against the famous Ben 10. Nothing more, nothing less. The trio looked surprised as Ben approached. No evil overlords? No giant armies? No fighting for the planet? Ben asked, looking surprised, you just want to fight me? Naruto answered, yeah, though there are going to be a few rules to the fight. If you want to accept of course. Ben looked surprised at the challenge, and that it seemed like this guy was only looking for a fight. Ben thought about it for a moment, and asked, what kind of rules? Naruto answered, first off, it is only until the opponent gives up, or if they are knocked unconscious. No killing is allowed, and all techniques are allowed. Ben looked surprised at the rules and asked, so, what do you get out of this? Naruto crossed his arms and simply answered, bragging rights. The rest of the trio looked surprised by the answer. Gwen asked, no claiming the planet? Kevin asked, no crazy marriage law? The others looked surprised at Kevin's statement. Naruto answered, first off, big guy, I don't swing that way. And why would I want the planet? I happen to like my own just fin, thank you very much. Ben looked surprised as it seems this guy just wanted to fight him for the fun of it. I twas a great change form fighting criminals who wanted money, or those who wanted the glory foe being the ones to defeat the great Ben Tennyson. After thinking for a few minutes Ben answered, fine, I'll fight you. Naruto smirked and said, thanks, this ought to be fun. You two can proctor the match. Sound good? Gwen asked. Wait, you want to fight here now? Naruto shrugged his shoulders and said, I don't see why not. We're both here, and we are both ready. I don't see why we can't fight. Ben was silent before he shrugged. Hey, I don't see the problem, the hero said, as he brought up the Omnimatrix, which had gone back into its dormant state after being left alone for so long. He found the right icon and pressed the button. There was a bright green flash, and while it only took a couple of seconds, there was a lot that happened. Ben's body was warped as his DNA was altered. His muscles grew thicker and stronger. His skeleton grew to accommodate the large weight change, becoming stronger in the process. His skin became thicker, rougher, and turned red as his body expanded. His skull extended slightly, as new orbital sockets formed in his head, as new eyes grew in them, making a total of four, and Ben's eyes turned yellow, as he lost the hair on his head. Then new bones, grew on Ben's sides as they burst through the skin, were quickly covered in muscles, and then thick, rough, red skin. Ben's attire changed. His jacket faded out of existence, replaced with a dark green X-shaped harness, over a black short-sleeve shirt, which was tight against Ben's muscles. His lower half was clothed with black tight pants that left his feet bare, and his toes merging into two digits. To finish the look, two fingerless gloves had formed on his hands. Finally, a black stripe formed on the back of his head that went over his now bald head, and ended just above his top pair of eyes. Finally, the Omnimatrix symbol formed on the crossing in the harness. Ben threw back his head and let out a battle cry as he punched both of his left palms with his right hands. Ben examined himself and said, his voice now significantly deeper, and said, sweet. I actually go the alien I wanted this time. Naruto cocked his head to the side and thought, huh, so that's what that looks like, I thought it would be more, graphic, you know, body horror kind of thing. Ben said, nope, quick and painless. 
Naruto nodded and jumped back. He pulled out the apps and twirled them gunslinger style, before he aimed them at four arms. His helmet formed back on his face. On your cue, bright eyes, Naruto said. Gwen smiled slightly at the compliment, while Kevin growled in annoyance. Gwen said, Oh, uh, begin. Naruto started off, firing bullets at a fast pace. However, four arms armored skin tanked the bullets with ease as he charged forward, with both of his arms drawn back and ready to slam into the young man. Naruto dodged to the right, getting in Ben's guard, and performing a powerful uppercut that caught the Tetraman in the chin. The strike to the jaw, jarred him slightly, and caused him to stumble. Naruto noticed this and thought, looks like you still maintain some human weaknesses, such as certain body parts being attacked. Better remember that. Naruto unleashed a barrage of punches to Four Arms' stomach, but it did almost nothing to make the transformed human stop. Both O Four Arms' bottom arms, shot up in a double uppercut that caught Naruto in the stomach. Naruto skidded back a bit, before stopping himself by driving his legs into the ground, and gripping the earth with chakra. Naruto winced slightly. The strength behind this form was not to be underestimated, and if his skin was any indication, he was just as durable. Meanwhile, Ben was just as surprised by Naruto's strength. It made him wonder if it was all him, or if a portion of it, was his armor. However, he was also fast, and he knew how to use those guns. He wondered what else he had under his belt. Kevin whistled and said, Dang, this guy hits hard. Gwen said, Yeah, but there's something else. When Ben punched him, I sensed something around Naruto. Some, weird energy. Kevin raised an eyebrow and asked, Mana? Gwen shook her head and said, No something different. Back in the fight, Naruto sheathed the apps and reached for his belt pulling out of the heck, which he cocked. Four arms asked, What, you got an armory in that belt? Naruto said, Believe me, this is going to be full of surprises. Four arms cracked his neck and said, Yeah, here's one of them. The Tetra Man slammed his hands together unleashing a sonic wave. Naruto was shocked and quickly performed a substitution just in time of the blast to reduce the log he was using to splinters. Four arms looked shocked at the sudden disappearance. Before he could respond, however, Naruto shot out the trees at a fast pace. He slammed into Four Arms' body, launching a shot to the throat, then clapping him over the ears, stunning him further, and then unleashing a shot from the heck point blank. Thankfully, Four Arms managed to dodge to the left, just to avoid the vital organs, but it hit his shoulder hard. The alien stumbled backwards, a wound forming in his shoulder, and the loud sound of the gun shot making his already ringing head, ring louder. It was only thanks to the Tetra Man's natural durability and armor-like skin that kept it from being. However, four arms had to bite back a scream of pain as blood dripped down to the grass below. Naruto looked surprised at the wound and realized that this form had a lot of durability, if the damage it had done was any indication. Whoa, is that heck model shotgun? Kevin asked. Gwen looked at her boyfriend and asked, a what? Kevin asked, that gun is regarded as an incredible powerhouse. It is normally used by Sotarajian death squares, at least that's what I heard. They say if you hear one, then someone is guaranteed to be dead. How did this guy have one? Gwen asked, I don't know, but it looks like it did some serious damage. I've seen four arms take blasts from lasers and run through flames with no effect. It makes you wonder what else he has in his arsenal. Back in the fight, four arms, finally got his head back on straight, wincing at the pain of his wound, something that completely shocked him. Damn, the Tetra Man said, you're a lot tougher than you look. Naruto said, I'll take that as a compliment. Naruto then put his hands together in a familiar cross and four clones formed around him. The group charged forward at the shell-shocked alien. The Tetra Man steeled his nerves as he threw out all four hands, but they dodged the attacks. The original launched a fist into the larger being's jaw, enhancing his strength with his nanites to increase the damage. Clone 1 threw a shot to the alien's wound, causing him to scream in pain. Clones 2 and 3 shot dual punches into the alien's gut, while Clone 4 used the original as a springboard and launched into the air. The clone aimed carefully with his HUD and dropped down, using the kinetic tether to pull himself down hard, slamming a brutal axe kick to the Tetra Man's neck. At the same time, clones 1 through 3, and the original all drew back and slammed their fists into his head, one on the bottom of his jaw, two to the sides of his face, and a final one to the forehead. 
Four arms clenched his teeth as he felt pain course through his head and being launched backwards by the combined assault. Naruto cracked his knuckles and said, Wow, to be honest, I thought this would last longer. Gwen and Kevin were shocked. This guy was this guy loaded with weapons, but he was powerful and very skilled. This guy was like a Sotarajian on steroids. Naruto was about to walk away, and ask Gwen to call the fight, but before he could, four arms, started to stand up. Huh. I have to say this alien foe Yoris is far more durable than I thought, Naruto said, I thought for sure that would knock you out. The alien didn't answer, but he did raise one of his hands and pressed it against the Omni Matrix symbol on his harness. There was another green flash. The transformation, reversed as muscle and bones shrank, though his form was still taller than his normal body. His clothes vanished as muscles, bones, and skin were replaced with dark green plants like substance, with roots forming on his feet, elongated buds on his arms, and red buds sprouting on his shoulders. His head turned into an oval shape as oval shaped eyes formed on his face in place of his eyes, now reduced to two, and red petals bloomed on the sides of his head, and one yellow one on top of his head. The newly transformed Swampfire stood up with a growl. He could already feel the headache receding and the wound on his shoulder regenerating. Naruto whistled and said, And people say I heal fast. Swampfire said, Really? Let's test that. The methanosian ignited the methane in his hands, launching fire at the boy. Naruto jumped up and started performing flips through the flames. Naruto jumped up and prepared to fire the heck again, only for Swampfire to ignite his hands ire and grapple with him over the gun. Naruto's sensors picked up on the heat, and the two stared at each other. Under his helmet, Naruto winced as he got a whiff of the methane coming off of the alien's body. Clones, that log, Swampfire said, what are you, a ninja? Naruto answered, yes, and a damn good one. Swampfire nodded and said, really? Space ninja? Cool. As the Methanosian said this, Naruto's danger sense went off and he jumped back, leaving the heck, just as a small wave of thorny vines shot out of the ground. After seven vines shot out the ground, they shot towards the boy. Thinking quickly, Naruto drew an arm back and focused his wind chakra, before swinging his arm horizontally. A wave of sharpened wind shot out and sliced through the vines, reducing them to mulch. Timber, Naruto quipped. Swampfire snarled as he threw away the heck, and using his powers, wrapped it up in thorny vines. Swampfire smirked and then got into a stance, one that Naruto mimicked. Meanwhile, Kevin and Gwen were just watching in shock as they saw the fight continue. Apparently, this was going to go one for a while. However, Gwen felt that odd energy again. It felt like mana, but different. Kevin had to admit this guy had some serious fighting skills. It made him wonder what his life was like, and who trained him. At that moment, Gwen's phone rang. She pulled it out and saw that it was Grandpa Max. Hey, Grandpa. Gwen said as she answered. Gwen, Max said, I've tried calling Ben, but he won't answer. Did you figure out what the Tachadan factory? Gwen stumbled, wondering what to say, and answered, Um. Ben can't come to a phone right now, he's fighting a ninja Sotarajian on steroids and magic. Oh, Max said, before Gwen's answer registered in his mind, then said, wait, what? Swampfire charged forward unleashing a brutal haymaker that Naruto caught and countered with a powerful shot the jaw. The Methanosian's body rocked to the side, and nearly exploded from the force of the blow. Naruto kept a grip as he pulled out one of the apps and firing point blank. Swampfire laughed a bit at the shots and said, Tickles. Swampfire then grabbed the pistol and released some weird mud from his hand. Naruto jumped back, but he didn't get far as Swampfire lashed out with another methane blast. Naruto responded quickly by stomping the ground, unleashing a blast of wind in the process, thanks to wind chakra, blasted the flames way. Gwen reacted quickly forming a dome of energy around her and Kevin, blocking the blast. The cars were rocked and flipped over and a few trees shook in the wind, with leaves being flown off. Grass burned, and trees were scorched black where the flames licked them. Kevin looked at his car and said, Oh, that better not have scratched the paint. Gwen said, I've seen you fix that thing after being thrown and blasted. A paint job should only take you a couple of minutes. Kevin blinked and said, Point, by the way nice save. Back in the fight Swampfire threw up his hands unleashing seeds everywhere. With a flash of concentration, the seeds erupted into large flowers, which then began emitting a strange gas. 
Naruto looked around as the flowers with a surprised expression, wonder what this was, until he had a familiar smell go through his nose. Oh crap. The masked blonde spun on his heel and started to run. Swampire unleashed a small burst of methane. The gas ignited causing a chain reaction that sent flames soaring toward the boy. Crap. 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 Naruto then put on the speed and managed to outrace the flames, his enhanced perception allowing him to dodge through the trees. After outracing the flames, Naruto came to a stop at a tree and hid behind it. Hiding behind a tree from a plant controlling alien, Naruto said, Not a good idea. That alien is versatile, especially in this environment. I got think. How can I get him to change? Think Naruto think. Naruto took out his remaining app and focused water chakra into it, firing a blast of water that softened the mud. After ripping out the gun, Naruto got his idea. He then held his hands up and performed a familiar sign. Meanwhile, Ben looked out at the field of flowers that had unleashed such destruction. Since when could you do that? Gwen asked. Swampfire answered, to be honest, that was kind of a guess. The Methanosian then turned when he saw Naruto charging through the trees his HF shuriken. Before the Methanosian was prepared to fire again, only for Naruto to launch his smart disc, shuriken as hard as he could. However, Naruto's target wasn't the alien, his HUD had targets all on the plants, and finally Swampfire. The ninja threw the weapon as hard as he could. To Swampfire's shock, the projectile began moving in a zigzag pattern, slicing through the plants and sending them to the ground. Swampfire prepared to unleash more seeds, but go smashed in the stomach, by something he didn't expect. Two more Naruto's. Okay. This trick is starting to get annoying. The two had slammed him in the stomach, knocking the air from his lungs, and then held him in place, keeping enough distance to keep from getting cut. The smart shuriken charged forward, however, before it could hit, Swampfire manipulated his body, warping it, so that his body moved to side, just avoiding the blades. Missed. Ben said mockingly. However, as he did his eyes widened at the sight of a second smart shuriken that had been hidden in the shadow of the first. This time, however, Swampfire aimed his hands down and unleashed a burst of methane. The two clones were blasted back, enhancing their armor at just the right time to avoid bursting. The blast had enough force to launch the methanosian upwards. Swampfire smirked, but it fell when the shuriken burst into smoke, revealing it had been a transformed Naruto. One of the clones, ran over to the thorny vines that wrapped around the heck and started cutting through it with a kunai. The remaining two shot up after Swampfire, pulling their smart shuriken, spinning then like buzzsaws. Swampfire reacted quickly, extending his arms hard and grabbing the two in the face. He then fired a blast of methane point blank which, combined with the damage from his propulsion earlier, caused the to burst into smoke, something that he made note of. However, a loud buzzing got his attention and he turned just in time to see the original, or what he thought was the original, swinging a smart shuriken in his hand. The HF blade cut through his shoulder, sending the body part to the ground below. Naruto then fell backwards and fired his kinetic tether, pulling the methanosian with him. Once landing, Naruto gripped his wrist and started swinging in the plant like alien around before slamming him into the ground with enough force to form a crater. The one-arm methanosian stayed still in the crater for a moment before his body began to heal, his arm bursting out of his body in a spray of green-tinted liquid. Swampfire grunted as stood up and said, Okay, this is a lot harder than I thought it would be. Naruto's remaining clone then cut through the last of the vines, and then turned towards his original, tossing him the heck. The original caught it and the clone dispelled. Naruto smirked under his mask and said, Well, that was interesting to say the least. That fancy wristwatch of yours has a lot more firepower to it, than I thought. Swampfire nodded and said, And you hit a lot harder than I thought you could, ninja boy. Naruto smirked and reached for one of his pouches and in a flash of light, brought out the plasma sword. With a smirk on his face, Naruto crouched with his sword briefly scraping the ground, leaving a burn mark in the dirt. But I think it is time that we took off the kitty gloves. Swampfire in turn reached for his Omnitrix symbol and pressed it with a smirk on his face. In a flash of light, he changed again. Plant turned to stone as the boy's skeleton began to turn to rock making his body angular in shpae his skin became purple with black lines and spots his hands turned into magenta crystal as magenta spikes erupted from his body six on his back two on his chest and one on his head 
his face turned magenta with his eyes merging into a singular green orb. The new transformed chromostone cracked his knuckles. Kevin said, Oh man, now I really wished that we had some popcorn. Gwen said, I hate to admit it, but yeah, so do I. The sound of a loud engine roaring got the pair's attention as they turned to see large, heavily armored vehicles shoot through the trees, tearing them down, and moving towards the duo. The vehicle pulled over, and the back door opened. Out of it jumped a few plumbers, wearing their signature armor. Following them was Max, who was wearing his own version. His looked more like a jumpsuit that was predominantly gray, with black gloves, boots, and a belt. His right arm was covered in specialized armor, meant for hand-to-hand -hand combat, and a special mic on the right side of his head. In his hands was a powerful-looking weapon. Grandpa Max, Gwen said, surprised, what are you doing here? Max answered, well, your call left us a little confused, sweetie. Plus, we could see the explosions from town, so we decided to bring some backup. A large energy blast then slammed into a tree behind them, breaking the conversation and bringing everyone's attention back to the fight. Naruto swung his plasma sword which Chromastone blocked with ease, his body absorbing the energy, transferring it to his other arm, and then swinging it down hard. Naruto jumped back to avoid the punch, which was successful, and Chromastone's fist was stuck in the ground. Naruto took advantage, taking out the heck, and pressed a button on the side of the handle, changing it from single shot to semi-automatic, the gun clicked, and then proceeded to unleash a barrage of shots, nearly point-blank. The crystal sapine was pushed backwards, and felt his body strain under the force of the blasts. Before he could recover, Naruto shot out another blast of from his kinetic tether pulling the alien forward, right into a blast of another barrage. The alien rolled across the ground and stood up, his natural durability keeping the damage relatively low. Naruto then shot forward, putting away his weapons, cupping his hands as an all-too-familiar spiraling ball of energy formed in his hands. Chromastone stood up just in time for Naruto to slam the Rasengan right into his stomach. The crystal sapping grunted in pain as he felt the attack steadily grind away at the center of his stomach. He tried to absorb the energy, but it was too much for him as the orb expanded, encompassing his body and sending him flying backwards through a few trees, and kicking up a lot of smoke. Naruto turned on his infrared mode on his helmet and put away his weapons before taking out the Sybaris Prime. He aimed it at the smoke and, to his shock, there was nothing there. Where did you go, Tennyson? Naruto looked around, scanning for any chance of finding him. Back with the spectators, a space ninja on steroids with magic, Max said, that suddenly sounds a lot less ridiculous. How has he done so far? Kevin answered, he made four arms bleed, and he managed to counter Ben when he was going all out with swamp fire. Now we just saw him hurt a being that can absorb energy with a ball of spiraling energy. Max nodded and said, so we aren't dealing with your normal Sotarajian. Gwen said, actually, he's not Sotarajian, he's human. Max looked at his granddaughter in shock and asked, what? Gwen sighed and said, he is human, but an alien human. He said he came from the planet Gaia. Max rubbed his chin in thought and said, you know, I don't think I've heard of that planet. Might be from a part of space the plumbers haven't been to yet. So what does he want from Ben? Kevin chuckled and said, that's the funny part. He's after bragging rights. Max was silent for a moment. In that moment, multiple thoughts were running through his head. If this were an old cartoon you would x-ray him to see the gears in his head turning. What? Was his intelligent response. Gwen said, he's not after fame, power, the Omnimatrix, or any of that stuff. He just wanted to fight Ben for the fun of it, it seems. Max blinked and said, that's a first. Back in the fight. Naruto continued to look around for Ben before getting bored. Ali Ali oxen free, Naruto called out, don't tell me you've turned coward, Tennyson. As Naruto was looking on the surface for his enemy, he didn't think to look down below. Underground, a tiny figure was moving through the earth. Ben had used the cover of the smoke and the falling trees to change into Ney of his more recent aliens. This Owen was small, covered in orange fur and had a bit of pot belly, with a blonde mustache, beaver-like teeth, and wore a black and green jumpsuit with its ears sticking out, and white gloves. That was cutting it a bit close, Tennyson, Molestash said, it seems this fellow isn't just powerful, but creative, a truly dangerous combination to anyone he fights against. Well, if he must use his powers in tandem with his weapons, so too must I. With that in mind, 
The rodent-like alien began digging as fast as his tiny gloved hands would allow him. Back on the surface, Naruto was glancing around to see what was going on. He slowly approached where Ben had last been. His eyes widened behind his helmet as he realized there was a hole in the ground, a very small hole indicating a smaller transformation. Suddenly the ground beneath him began to rumble and crack. Naruto's eyes widened before he fired up his jetpack and shot into the air with a roar. Just as he did, the ground caved in, revealing it had been made unstable by something tunneling underground. There was a green flash visible through the cracks in the ground, and then something shot out of the ground, a bright green slime, being led by a small UFO-like object that had a familiar symbol on it. The spectators immediately recognized Goop, Ben's polymorph form. Naruto aimed his Sybaris downward and started shooting. He immediately saw that the bullets wouldn't affect Ben's form, so he started aiming at the gravity device. The device dodged left and right before a slimy hand shot from the goo and slapped the Omnitrix symbol on it. In a bright green flash, Goop's body regained solid form and twisted into a bug-like form, creating two pointy, bug legs a pair of arms, both of which had a green coloration and had three-fingered hands. His body became elongated and white, with black stripes on his belly, and solid black on his back, with a large black stinger forming on his tailbone, and a black head, with four stalks, ending with yellow eyes. The newly transformed stinkfly, shot forward flying to avoid the bullets. The bug then fired a blast of slime from his bottom two eyes, splattering the S.Y. Paris with slime. Gross, Naruto shouted, and threw away the gun. Naruto then pulled out the dual raptors. He unleashed a barrage of blasts that the bug alien flew away from to avoid, completely changing his flight path. Naruto continued to aim, using his enhanced brain to predict where the Lepidoteran was going to go, and then aiming there, as well as aiming at his wings. Stinkfly flew down and into some trees, temporarily blocking Naruto's sight. There was a right flash of light from within the trees, indicating he'd transformed again. Naruto aimed his weapons at the spot. Suddenly, a trio of bright green blasts shot out of the woodwork, slamming into Naruto, knocking him ass over tea kettle and causing him to lose his grip on his raptors. Immediately, Jetray shot out of the woods, aiming directly at Naruto. Naruto shook his head to clear his head, however, it wasn't enough. Jetray flew up behind the boy, and then fired another Nura shock, blasting Naruto's jetpack, reducing it to broken pieces of junk. Naruto began falling fast, heading straight for the ground. Crap, crap, crap. Naruto's enhanced brain was going through what he had left. He doubted the bubble shield worked with falling, but, while he was tough, he doubted he could survive this fall. Thinking quickly, Naruto spun in midair, aiming at the humanoid manta ray. He pulled back his arm and unleashed his kinetic tether. The bright blue beam struck the aerophibian, and pulled Naruto back up. Once he was at the right height, Naruto grabbed onto the alien's neck and punched him. Naruto added more damage, aiming at the temples, and a final strike to the throat. With that, the two began to fall, drawing cries of alarm from the spectators. Meanwhile, Naruto is continuing to fight, hitting hard and fast, however, Jetray caught one punch and HTEN headbutted the ninja's armored face. This proved to be a bad idea as it only made the alien's head hurt more. Did you really think that would work? Naruto asked. Jetray shrugged and said, no, but this should. Jetray pressed the symbol on his chest, which brought on a bright flash that temporarily blinded his opponent. Naruto was then wrapped up in darkness and something, surprisingly soft. He tried to move, but the pressure on him prevented him from doing so. He still had his weapons, but he couldn't move enough or reach them. Oh man. Did I get eaten again? Outside, Ben had transformed into Cannonbolt, and was now falling towards the ground like big yellow and black meteor. He slammed into the ground with a loud boom and explosion of smoke, dust, and debris. Now on solid ground, the Arbarian Pelorota began spinning in place before shooting forward. The edge of the crater acting like a ramp, launching the alien and his captive, into the air. Cannonbolt unfurled, releasing the dizzy and disoriented Naruto. Ben then pressed the symbol on his forehead, transforming back into four arms. Naruto rolled across the ground, dizzy, disoriented, and shaken up. He was completely unprepared for four arms to land in a roll, shoot forward, and unleash a brutal double punch, one to the chest and one to the stomach. The added speed from the launch added an incredible amount of force to the punch, which sent Naruto flying backwards smashing through a tree, adding even more damage to his armor and the remains of his jetpack. 
Naruto groaned in pain, feeling all that through his armor. Naruto stood up with a grunt of pain. He could hear four arms coming, and activated the stealth mode on his suit. He then quietly crept away. As four arms searched for his target, Naruto panted. Okay. Naruto think, Naruto thought, I've lost the Sybaris and the Raptors. I'm almost out of ammo on the heck. I still have the bubble shield, the plasma claws, plasma sword, the plasma caster, the railgun, and the app. Naruto then displayed his armor on his HUD. Armor damaged almost critically in chest area, slight damage to the helmet. My jetpack is completely totaled. Now on his side, the Omnitrix must be running low on power with all the transformations I've made him do. Time to open up the old ninja handbook. Four Arms was glancing around looking for his opponent. The transformed boy was now on guard, as he hadn't seen this guy for a few minutes. The Tetra Man knew that this guy wasn't aiming to kill him, but he was doing some serious damage to him. His head was still sore, and his body ached from all the attacks he had taken so far. On top of that, with all the transformation he knew that the Omnimatrix was starting to run low on power. If he didn't transform, he believed that he had about 10 minutes of power left. He didn't dare use the life form lock because he would be stuck in that form, which would put him at a disadvantage. If he made another transformation, it would have to be something he could use very effectively, especially in this terrain, because it would be his last in this fight. He briefly considered going way big, but decided that would be overkill. Four arms then let out a cry of pain, as a fist connected with his stomach. Another one connected with his jaw, and a third slammed into his nose, making him stumble backwards slightly. Four arms stumbled backwards, pain surging through his body as he tried to understand where Naruto was coming from. He noticed some depressions in the grass that resembled footprints. With a grunt, he got up and clapped his arms together in his sonic clap. Naruto saw the technique coming and leapt into the air releasing his invisibility. Naruto formed a series of clones again, and began spinning in the air, propelling himself with wind chakra. Four arms brought up his arms to block the attack from the three Naruto's which had enough force to crater the ground. Four arms looks up to see his opponent, and gasped when he saw that Naruto's hands were in his cross formation and more clones had formed in the air above, each one of them holding a Rasengan. Each clone let out a battle cry as they began to descend. Four arms reacted as quick as he could, deflecting the original and the clones attack him with a flex of his muscles. He then pressed his hand to the symbol on his chest and performed was what most likely going to be his last transformation of the battle. His became shorter and smaller, and flesh was replaced with rock again. His body became indigo colored with black lines and dots. His arms and face were the exception becoming pale green crystal. Six spiked of the same color shot out of his back, with two more on his chest and one on his head. Finally, the Omnitrix symbol appeared on his chest. With a loud roar, Diamond Head flexed and pushed out his arms, a barrage of sharp, pale green crystals shooting out in all directions, punching each clone with just enough force to hit it. Naruto crossed his arms over his chest, and hardened his armor, the Diamond Shard striking his armor, forming nicks and piercing his shoulder. Diamond Head then started looking around for him, immediately believing that Naruto had performed a substitution, but was caught off guard when blood dropped down onto his face. The Petrosapien turned up just in time for Naruto to reach him, holding out his arm and allowing the cricket to pop out. With a pull of the trigger, the small gun unleashed a powerful shockwave that knocking both combatants back. The sound left a large crack in Diamond Head's chest. The Petrosapien drove his leg into the ground to stop himself, he winced from the pain, but didn't stop, as he slammed his hands on the ground, sending a wave of crystal shards at the still airborne fighter. Naruto saw this coming, hardening his gauntlet and glove mentally, and sending so much chakra into his arm that it began to glow bright blue. The man slammed down on the ground, shattering the rising crystal. Naruto then shoot forward, pulling out the railgun. Naruto unleashed a barrage of shots, the explosive round slamming into the alien, knocking him backwards, and worsening the still healing crack in his chest. The crack spread across Diamond Head's chest to his hip and shoulder. Naruto then finished it by firing another shot at his shoulder, exploding the Diamond Alien's arm off in a shower of pale green crystal. Diamond Head fell to his knees, extreme pain flaring through his body as cracks spread through his body. He could barely move, and his body was on fire. He looked down and whispered, Active Life Form Lock. Emergency Code 1001. The Omnitrix symbol beeped and proceeded to turn orange, 
showing that it was going into its locked mode. If he changed back now, he didn't want to risk not having an arm, especially since that form would probably bleed out. It was at this point that, he was glad that he convinced Azmuth to give him the codes for certain functions. He didn't give him the one for the master control, but he was glad for this one. Meanwhile, Max, Gwen, Kevin, and the other plumbers were all shocked at the sight of the brutal fight. They had only seen him truly go crazy like that when he fought Vilgax, or someone like that, the only difference was Ben came out on top. Now, Ben had lost. It was surprising, but Max could only realize just how human Ben was. Even with one of the most powerful objects in the universe on his wrist, he could still be beaten. Naruto sighed as he stood up, reaching for the diamond shard in his shoulder and pulled it out, blood dripping down to the ground. He threw it away with his flesh healing, and the armor slowly repairing itself. With this moment, he double-checked the diagnostics. The armor was messed up and Merlin would probably have to replace the jetpack, but he was okay. Naruto then approached the downed human turned alien, and stood above the kneeling form. The plumbers and Team 10 prepared to intervene. Do you yield? He asked. Diamond Head looked up at Naruto and with a shaky voice said, I yield. Naruto nodded behind his helmet. Naruto then walked over towards Diamond Head's severed arm and picked it up. He then approached the still kneeling alien, and pressed the shoulder joint up to shoulder. Diamond Head looked surprised, but he then proceeded focus, feeling his arm reattach at the shoulder. Diamond Head then stood up on shaky legs, with help from Naruto, who then proceeded to head for the plumbers. Max reacted immediately, sending some of the plumbers out to help his grandson. A few of the plumbers grabbed Ben and brought him back to their truck, while others took the safety off their weapons, just in case. As Diamond Head changed back to Ben, and got some medical attention, showing that he was somewhat injured from the fight. Max then approached Naruto as Ben was being looked over. Max, deciding not to dance around things said, Who are you? What planet are you from, and what are you doing here? Naruto said, Hey, shouldn't I get a drink or something before you start interrogating me, or at least get me a lawyer? Max didn't back down and simply repeated his questions. Naruto sighed as he retracted his mask, exposing his face. Max and the other plumbers looked shocked at the sight of Naruto's face, and how human he seemed to be. As I said, Naruto spoke, My name is Naruto Uzumaki. I come from the planet Gaia, and I came to fight that guy. Mission accomplished, basically. Max raised an eyebrow and said, I know that, just double checking. However, there's something that doesn't smell right. He gave a suspicious look at him, and said, You came here to fight my son for bragging rights? I seriously doubt it. You just don't come down here to fight someone just for that, especially when it is someone as famous as my grandson. Naruto cocked his head to the side and said, So you're his grandfather, I see the resemblance. Naruto was somewhat annoyed that he was being interrogated, but he kind of understood it since he beat the tar out of his grandson. In hindsight, he probably should have seen the interrogation coming given that he was an unknown. Well, I may have been a little misleading with my reason, Naruto explained. Several of the plumbers, including Ben and his team, looked at him with surprise. The plumbers put their hands on their weapons, ready to quick draw and fire. Max subtly prepared his gauntlet ready to charge the weapon for a sucker punch as he asked, Why did you fight my grandson? Naruto smiled and said, in a few words, sibling rivalry. This completely caught everyone by surprise. Sibling rivalry? As they thought this, there was a flash of light. Everyone immediately turned towards the source. In a flash of light was a familiar figure. Naruto immediately recognized the alien as a Galvan. A smile came across his face. Azmuth, I presume, Naruto said, greeting the recently arrived scientist. The diminutive alien looked up at the taller being and said, I am. He then turned to Ben and hopped up to him, jumping on a machine right next to Ben. The earthling raised his arm, showing off the Omni Matrix to the smaller alien, almost on instinct. The small alien said, I told you ease up on the constant transformations, you'll overload the systems. As he spoke, he popped up the object selector and began twisting it, mumbling about the system and checking to see if there was anything wrong with it. Ben shrugged and said, Hey, I just did what I needed to do to survive against this guy. He was pretty tough. Azmuth looked up at Ben and then turned towards Naruto, who simply raised an arm and waved. The alien asked, Really? After he finished up the diagnostics, he then approached Naruto and hopped up next to him. He looked over him for a few moments. 
hum, special metallic polymer, sotorigian based judging by the design, kinetic tether system, secret weapon compartment on one arm, and a jetpack, for flair, obviously. He then looked up at Naruto's face, he rubbed his chin in thought and said, you look like an earthling, but I highly doubt it as you seem to be much stronger than the species, what planet do you come from? Naruto shrugged and answered, Gaia. Merlin looked surprised as he said, Gaia? I've never heard of that planet before. I've seen over a million planets and creatures, but nothing like you. Why did you come here? And where did you get that armor? Naruto answered, for the third time, I mainly fought your friend for bragging rights, and for fun. As for where I got it from, well, I think he wants to tell you yourself, provided he ever comes out of the factory. Everybody was surprised at the sudden raising of his voice. However, the door to the factory opened, releasing smoke. After a moment, a hovering platform came out and floated towards them. It was just high enough so no one would be able to see the top of it. Everyone looked at it, some of them expecting a hologram to be formed. However, it suddenly dropped. As it came to the ground, kicking up dust. In a moment, Merlin smiled at the dust cleared. Another Galvin? Gwen asked surprised at the sight. Kevin said, oh, if we are dealing with another albedo, someone is going to get squished. However, everyone stopped their thoughts when they saw Azmuth's face. His eyes were wide with shock and his jaw wide open. M.M. Merlin? Azmuth asked, slowly approaching the blue garb Galvin. Merlin stepped off his platform and said, hello, little brother. Ben yelled, little brother. Azmuth simply looked shocked as he said, yes, my brother. Where have you been? I searched for you for years. Merlin said, I had a feeling I would have some people breathing down my neck after my banishment, so I decided to head into the outer rim. Nice and quiet, and no nosy neighbors. I can also see that you did some good work with my old notes. Ben asked, The outer rim? Max answered, The outer rim is an area of space that isn't considered part of the plumber jurisdiction. That includes planets like Xenon or Inkarskon. Ben asked, Azmuth's old planet and the prison world. Max nodded and said, Both aren't considered part of the jurisdiction, which is why there aren't any guards around in Karskon, or any patrols near Xenon. Gwen then said, Moving on from that, what do you mean your old notes? Merlin answered, If it weren't for an unfortunate set of circumstance, it is possible that I would have been the inventor of the Omnitrix instead of Azmuth. What? Everyone asked in shock. Azmuth sighed and said, Yes. You see, years ago my brother and I had a bit of a rivalry. When he decided to do a grand contest. One to build a device to bring the beings of the universe together, in this case the device that sits on your wrist, young Ben. Merlin continued, Unfortunately, I was found with the blood samples of several different species, and experimenting on sentient creatures is considered forbidden on my planet. Azmuth interjected, It still is. Merlin nodded, After this, I was charged with crimes against the Galvin race for breaking one of our most solemn vows. As a result, I was banished from Galvin Prime, and set adrift across the universe. Everyone was surprised at this, looking shocked at the change in what they knew. Just one incident and Azmuth probably wouldn't have invented the Omnitrix, or there would be two versions of it going around. They idly wondered what would have happened if there had been two of them at the same time. Kevin then added, Question. Why did you defend your brother? Azmuth sighed and said, I was more interested in my experiment at the time, and was off planet. By the time I learned of my brother's supposed breaking of our code, it was too late. Ben then asked, Wait, doesn't that mean that he's technically a criminal? Azmuth sighed and said, Yes, he is technically a wanted man. Naruto then shot up and said, Hey, wait a minute, you never mentioned that you were still wanted by the law. Merlin shrugged and said, would have agreed to work with me if I was an intergalactic fugitive? Naruto slumped his shoulders and said, Good point. Merlin then turned to Max and said, Do not worry. I do intend to turn myself in. If only just to clear my name so I can go back home. I've been wondering how the world has changed in the past couple of years. Azmuth said, You've missed a lot. Don't worry, I know a good lawyer. Ben had a feeling he knew who the inventor was referring to and said, Oh, great him. Max nodded and said, You all, completely quarantine the area. I don't want anyone without proper authorization coming through here. Pick up all alien technology and you find and bring it back to base, to be logged. Sorry kid, but your weapons and armor may have to go into evidence. Naruto nodded and said, Understandable. 
Max then said, Now, I'm taking Merlin back to base to be processed. The kid too. You have your orders, now move. All the plumber agents declared, Sir yes sir. With that, the plumbers got ready to move, heading out to do their work. Meanwhile, Merlin, Naruto, Ben, Kevin, Gwen, and Azmuth all got into the back of the truck that the plumbers arrived in, and Max got in the driver's seat. With that, they set off, driving towards the plumber base. As they drove, Azmuth and Merlin began to talk, catching up on old times and asking how things had gone in their years separated. Ben then looked at the man who defeated him and asked, So, what's your story? To be continue we will see you in the next video.